Chapter One of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Heusinger. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter One Childhood and Early Youth, 1466 to 1488. The Low Countries in the 15th Century the Burgundian power, connections with the German Empire and with France, the Northern Netherlands, outskirts in every sense, movement of Devotio Moderna, Brethren of the Common Life, and Widdesheim Monasteries, Erasmus' birth, 1466, his relations and name, at school at Gouda, Deventer, and Boile Duke. He takes the vows probably in 1488. When Erasmus was born, Holland had, for about twenty years, formed part of the territory which the Dukes of Burgundy had succeeded in uniting under their dominion. That complexity of lands, half French in population, like Burgundy, Artois, Hainault, Nemours, half Dutch, like Flanders, Brabant, Zeeland, Holland. The appellation Holland was, as yet, strictly limited to the county of that name, the present provinces of North and South Holland with which Zealand, too, had long since been united. The remaining territories which, together with those last mentioned, make up the present kingdom of the Netherlands, had not yet been brought under Burgundian dominion, although the dukes had cast their eyes on them. In the bishopric of Utrecht, whose power extended to the regions on the far side of the river Esel, Burgundian influence had already begun to make itself manifest. The projected conquest of Friesland was a political inheritance of the Counts of Holland, who preceded the Burgundians. The Duchy of Goulders, alone, still preserved its independence inviolate, being more closely connected with the neighboring German territories, and consequently with the empire itself. All these lands, about this time they began to be regarded collectively under the name of Low Countries by the Sea, had in most respects the character of outskirts. The authority of the German emperors had for some centuries been little more than imaginary. Holland and Zealand hardly shared the dawning sense of a national German Union. They had too long looked to France in matters political. Since 1299, a French-speaking dynasty, that of Hainault, had ruled Holland. Even the House of Bavaria that succeeded it about the middle of the 14th century had not restored closer contact with the empire, but had itself, on the contrary, early become gallicized, attracted, as it was, by Paris and soon twined about by the tentacles of Burgundy, to which it became linked by means of a double marriage. The northern half of the Low Countries were outskirts, also, in ecclesiastical and cultural matters. Brought over rather late to the cause of Christianity, towards the end of the eighth century, they had, as borderlands, remained united under a single bishop, the Bishop of Utrecht. The meshes of ecclesiastical organization were wider here than elsewhere. They had no university. Paris remained, even after the designing policy of the Burgundian dukes had founded the University of Louvain in 1425, the center of doctrine and science for the northern Netherlands. From the point of view of the wealthy towns of Flanders and Brabant, now the heart of Burgundian possessions, Holland and Zeeland formed a wretched little country of boatmen and peasants. Chivalry, which the dukes of Burgundy attempted to invest with new splendor, had but moderately thrived among the nobles of Holland. The Dutch had not enriched courtly literature, in which Flanders and Brabant zealously strove to follow the French example by any contribution worth mentioning. Whatever was coming up in Holland flowered unseen. It was not of a sort to attract the attention of Christendom. It was a brisk navigation and trade, mostly transit trade, by which the Hollanders already began to emulate the German Hansa, and which brought them into continual contact with France and Spain, England and Scotland, Scandinavia, North Germany and the Rhine from Cologne upward. It was herring fishery, a humble trade, but a source of great prosperity, a rising industry shared by a number of small towns. Not one of those towns in Holland and Zeeland, neither Dordrecht or Leyden, Harlem, Middelburg, Amsterdam, could compare with Ghent, Bruges, Lille, Antwerp, or Brussels in the south. It is true that in the towns of Holland also the highest products of the human mind germinated, but those towns themselves were still too small or too poor to be centers of art and science. The most eminent men were irresistibly drawn to one of the great foci of secular and ecclesiastical culture. Sluta, the great sculptor, went to Burgundy, 
took service with the dukes, and bequeathed no specimen of his art to the land of his birth. Dirk Boots, the artist of Harlem, moved to Levant, where his best work is preserved, what was left at Harlem has perished. At Harlem, too, and earlier, perhaps, than anywhere else, obscure experiments were being made in that great art, craving to be brought forth, which was to change the world, the art of printing. There was yet another characteristic spiritual phenomenon, which originated here and gave its peculiar stamp to life in these countries. It was a movement designed to give depth and fervor to religious life, started by a burgher of Deventer, Gert Groot, toward the end of the fourteenth century. It had embodied itself in two closely connected forms, the freighter houses, where the brethren of the common life lived together without altogether separating from the world, and the congregation of the monastery at Weidesheim, of the order of the regular Augustinian canons. Originating in the regions on the banks of the Isel, between the two small towns of Deventer and Zwolle, and so on the outskirts of the diocese of Utrecht, this movement soon spread, eastward to Westphalia, northward to Groningen and the Frisian country, westward to Holland proper. Freighter houses were erected everywhere, and monasteries of the Windesheim congregation were established or affiliated. The movement was spoken of as modern devotion, devotio moderna. It was rather a matter of sentiment and practice than of definite doctrine. The truly Catholic character of the movement had early been acknowledged by the church authorities. Sincerity and modesty, simplicity and industry, and, above all, constant ardor of religious emotion and thought were its objects. Its energies were devoted to tending the sick and other works of charity, but especially to instruction and the art of writing. It is in this that it especially differed from the revival of the Franciscan and Dominican orders of about the same time, which turned to preaching. The Vindisheimians and Heronimians, as the brethren of the common life were also called, exerted their crowning activities in the seclusion of the schoolroom and the silence of the writing cell. The schools of the brethren soon drew pupils from a wide area. In this way the foundations were laid, both here in the northern Netherlands and in lower Germany, for a generally diffused culture among the middle classes, a culture of a very narrow, strictly ecclesiastical nature indeed, but which for that very reason was fit to permeate broad layers of the people. What the Vindisheimians themselves produced in the way of devotional literature is chiefly limited to edifying booklets and biographies of their own members, writings which were distinguished rather by their pious tenor and sincerity than by daring or novel thoughts. But of them all, the greatest was that immortal work of Thomas Akempis, canon of St. Agnetenburg, near Zwolle, the Imitatio Christi. Foreigners visiting these regions, north of the Scheldt, and the Mois, laughed at the rude manners and the deep drinking of the inhabitants, but they also mentioned their sincere piety. These countries were already, what they have ever remained, somewhat contemplative and self-contained, better adapted for speculating on the world, and for reproving it, than for astonishing it with dazzling wit. Rotterdam and Gouda, situated upward of twelve miles apart in the lowest region of Holland, an extremely watery region, were not among the first towns of the county. They were small country towns, ranking after Dordrecht, Harlem, Leiden, and rapidly rising Amsterdam. They were not centers of culture. Erasmus was born at Rotterdam on 27th October, most probably in the year 1466. The illegitimacy of his birth has thrown a veil of mystery over his descent and kinship. It is possible that Erasmus himself learned the circumstances of his coming into the world only in his later years. Acutely sensitive to the taint in his origin, he did more to veil the secret than to reveal it. The picture which he painted of it in his ripe age was romantic and pathetic. He imagined that his father, when a young man, made love to a girl, a physician's daughter, in the hope of marrying her. The parents and brothers of the young fellow, indignant, tried to persuade him to take holy orders. The young man fled before the child was born. He went to Rome and made a living by copying. His relations sent him false tidings that his beloved had died. Out of grief he became a priest and devoted himself to religion altogether. Returned to his native country, he discovered the deceit. He abstained from all contact with her, whom he now could no longer marry, but took great pains to give his son a liberal education. The mother continued to care for the child, till an early death took her from him. The father soon followed her to the grave. To Erasmus' recollection, he was only twelve or thirteen years old when his mother died. 
it seems to be practically certain that her death did not occur before 1483, when, therefore, he was already seventeen years old. His sense of chronology was always remarkably ill-developed. Unfortunately, it is beyond doubt that Erasmus himself knew, or had known, that not all particulars of this version were correct. In all probability his father was already a priest at the time of the relationship to which he owed his life. In any case, it was not the impatience of a betrothed couple, but an irregular alliance of long standing, of which a brother, Peter, had been born three years before. We can only vaguely discern the outlines of a numerous and commonplace middle-class family. The father had nine brothers, who were all married. The grandparents on his father's side and the uncles on his mother's side attained to a very great age. It is strange that a host of cousins, their progeny, has not boasted of a family connection with the great Erasmus. Their descendants have not even been traced. What were their names? The fact that in burgher circles family names had, as yet, become anything but fixed, makes it difficult to trace Erasmus' kinsmen. Usually people were called by their own and their father's name, but it also happened that the father's name became fixed and adhered to in the following generation. Erasmus calls his father Gerard, his brother Peter Gerard, while a papal letter styles Erasmus himself Erasmus Rogeri. Possibly the father was called Roger Gerard, or Gerards. Although Erasmus and his brother were born at Rotterdam, there is much that points to the fact that his father's kin did not belong there, but at Gouda. At any rate, they had near relatives at Gouda. Erasmus was his Christian name. There is nothing strange in the choice, though it was rather unusual. St. Erasmus was one of the fourteen holy martyrs, whose worship so much engrossed the attention of the multitude in the fifteenth century. Perhaps the popular belief that the intercession of St. Erasmus conferred wealth had some weight in choosing the name. Up to the time when he became better acquainted with Greek, he used the form Erasmus. Later on he regretted that he had not also given the name the more correct and melodious form Erasmus. On a few occasions he half-jocularly called himself so, and his godchild, Johannes Froben's son, always used this form. It was probably for similar ascetic considerations that he soon altered the barbaric Rhododomensis to Rhododomus, later to Rhodoodomus, later Rhodoodomus, which he perhaps accentuated as a properoxytone. Desiderius was an addition selected by himself, which he first used in 1496. It is possible that the study of his favorite author, Jerome, among whose correspondence there is a Desiderius, suggested the name to him. When, therefore, the full form Desiderius Erasmus Rhodoodomus first appears in the second edition of the Adagia, published by Josi Badius at Paris in 1506, it is an indication that Erasmus, then forty years of age, had found himself. Circumstances had not made it easy for him to find his way. Almost in his infancy, when hardly four years old, he thinks, he had been put to school at Gouda, together with his brother. He was nine years old when his father sent him to Deventer to continue his studies in the famous school of the chapter of St. Laban. His mother accompanied him. His stay at Deventer must have lasted, with an interval during which he was a choir boy in the Minster at Utrecht, from 1475 to 1484. Erasmus' explicit declaration that he was fourteen years old when he left Deventer may be explained by assuming that in later years he confused his temporary absence from Deventer, when at Utrecht, with the definite end of his stay at Deventer. Reminiscences of his life there repeatedly crop up in Erasmus' writings. Those concerning the teaching he got inspired him with little gratitude. The school was still barbaric then, he said. Ancient medieval textbooks were used there, of whose silliness and cumbrousness we can hardly conceive. Some of the masters were of the brotherhood of the common life. One of them, Johannes Synthen, brought to his task a certain degree of understanding of classical antiquity in its purer form. Toward the end of Erasmus' residence, Alexander Hegius was placed at the head of the school, a friend of the Frisian humanist Rudolf Agricola, who on his return from Italy was gaped at by his compatriots as a prodigy. On festal days, when the rector made his oration before all the pupils, Erasmus heard Hegius. On one single occasion he listened to the celebrated Agricola himself, which left a deep impression on his mind. 
His mother's death of the plague that ravaged the town brought Erasmus' school time at Deventer to a sudden close. His father called him and his brother back to Gouda, only to die himself soon afterwards. He must have been a man of culture, for he knew Greek, had heard the famous humanists in Italy, had copied classic authors, and left a library of some value. Erasmus and his brother were now under the protection of three guardians, whose care and intentions he afterwards placed in an unfavorable light. How far he exaggerated their treatment of him, it is difficult to decide. That the guardians, among whom one Peter Winkel, schoolmaster at Gouda, occupied the principal place, had little sympathy with the new classicism, about which their ward already felt enthusiastic, need not be doubted. Quote, if you should write again so elegantly, please add a commentary. End quote. The schoolmaster replied grumblingly to an epistle on which Erasmus, then fourteen years old, had expended much care. That the guardians sincerely considered it a work pleasing to God to persuade the youths to enter a monastery can no more be doubted than that this was for them the easiest way to get rid of their task. For Erasmus, this pitiful business assumes the color of a grossly selfish attempt to cloak dishonest administration, an altogether reprehensible abuse of power and authority. More than this, in later years it obscured for him the image of his own brother, with whom he had been on terms of cordial intimacy. Winkel sent the two young fellows, twenty-one and eighteen years old, to school again, this time at bois le duc There they lived in the freighter house itself, to which the school was attached. There was nothing here, of the glory that had shown about De Venter. The brethren, says Erasmus, knew of no other purpose than that of destroying all natural gifts, with blows, reprimands, and severity, in order to fit the soul for the monastery. This, he thought, was just what his guardians were aiming at. Although ripe for the university, they were deliberately kept away from it. In this way more than two years were wasted. One of his two masters, one Rombaud, who liked young Erasmus, tried hard to prevail on him to join the brethren of the common life. In later years Erasmus occasionally regretted that he had not yielded, for the brethren took no such irrevocable vows as were now in store for him. An epidemic of the plague became the occasion for the brothers to leave bois le duc and return to Gouda. Erasmus was attacked by a fever that sapped his power of resistance, of which he now stood in such need. The guardians, one of the three had died in the meantime, now did their utmost to make the two young men enter a monastery. They had good cause for it, as they had ill-administered the slender fortune of their wards, and, says Erasmus, refused to render an account. Later he saw everything connected with this dark period of his life in the most gloomy colors, except himself. Himself he sees as a boy of not yet sixteen years. It is nearly certain that he must have been twenty already weakened by fever, but nevertheless resolute and sensible in refusing. He has persuaded his brother to fly with him and go to a university. The one guardian is a narrow-minded tyrant, the other, Finkel's brother, a merchant, a frivolous coaxer. Peter, the elder of the youths, yields first and enters the monastery of Zion, near Delft, of the order of the regular Augustinian canons, where the guardian had found a place for him. Erasmus resisted longer. Only after a visit to the monastery of Stein or Emmaus near Gouda, belonging to the same order, where he found a schoolfellow from Deventer, who pointed out the bright side of monastic life, did Erasmus yield and enter Stein, where, soon after, probably in 1488, he took the vows. End of chapter 1 Read by Olivia Chapter 2 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trenton. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by John Fusinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hoffman. Chapter 2 In the Monastery. 1488 to 1495. Erasmus as an Augustinian canon at Stain, his friends, letters to Servatius, humanism in the monastery, Latin poetry, aversion to cloister life. He leaves Stain to enter the service of the Bishop of Cambrai. 1493, 
James Bost, Antibabarian. He gets leave to study at Paris, 1495. In his later life, under the influence of the gnawing regret which his monkhood and all the trouble he took to escape from it caused him, the picture of all the events leading up to his entering the convent became distorted in his mind. Brother Peter, to whom he still wrote in a cordial vein from Spain, became a worthless fellow, even his evil spirit, a Judas. A schoolfellow whose advice had been decisive now appeared a traitor, prompted by self-interest, who himself had chosen convent life merely out of laziness and the love of good cheer. The letters that Erasmus wrote from Spain betray no vestige of his deep-seated aversion to monastic life, which afterwards he asks us to believe he had felt from the outset. We may, of course, assume that the supervision of his superiors prevented him from writing all that was in his heart, and that in the depths of his being there had always existed the craving for freedom and for more civilized intercourse than Spain could offer. Still, he must have found in the monastery some of the good things that his schoolfellow had led him to expect. That at this period he should have written a praise of monastic life, quote, to please a friend who wanted to be called a cousin, unquote, as he himself says, is one of those naive assertions invented afterwards of which Erasmus never saw the unreasonable quality. He found at Spain a fair degree of freedom, some food for an intellect craving for classic antiquity, and friendships with men of the same turn of mind. There were three who especially attracted him. Of the schoolfellow who had induced him to become a monk, we hear no more. His friends are Servatius Roger of Rotterdam and William Hermans of Gouda, both his companions at Spain, and the older Cornelius Gerard of Gouda, usually called Aurelius a quasi-Latinization of Godanus, who'd spent most of his time in the monastery at Lopsen, near Leiden. With them he read and conversed, sociably and jestingly. With them he exchanged letters when they were not together. Out of the letters to Servatius there arises the picture of an Erasmus whom we shall never find again, a young man of more than feminine sensitiveness, of a languishing need for sentimental friendship. In writing Servatius, Erasmus runs the whole gamut of an ardent lover. As often as the image of his friend presents itself to his mind, tears break from his eyes. Weeping, he rereads his friend's letter every hour. But he is mortally dejected and anxious, for the friend proves averse to this excessive attachment. Quote, what do you want from me? Unquote, he asks. Quote, what is wrong with you? Unquote. The other replies. Erasmus cannot bear to find that this friendship is not fully returned. Do not be so reserved. Do tell me what is wrong. I repose my hope in you alone. I become yours so completely that you have left me not of myself. You know my pusillanimity, which, when it has no one on whom to lean and rest, makes me so desperate that life becomes a burden. Let us remember this. Erasmus never again expresses himself so passionately. He has given us here the clue by which we may understand much of what he becomes in his later years. These letters have sometimes been taken as mere literary exercises. The weakness they betray and the complete absence of all reticence seem to tally ill with his habit of cloaking his most intimate feeling, which afterwards Erasmus never quite relinquishes. Dr. Allen, who leaves this question undecided, nevertheless inclines to regard the letters as sincere effusions, and to me they seem so incontestably. This exuberant friendship accords quite well with the times and the person. Sentimental friendships were much in vogue in secular circles during the 15th century as towards the end of the 18th century. Each court had its pair of friends who dressed alike and shared room, bed, and heart. Nor was this cult of fervent friendship restricted to the spheres of aristocratic life. It was among the specific characteristics of the devotio moderna, as, for the rest, it seems from its very nature to be inseparably bound up with pietism. To observe one another with sympathy, to watch and note each other's inner life, was a customary and approved occupation among the brethren of common life and the Windesheim monks. 
And though Stein and Sion were not of the Windesheim congregation, the spirit of Devotio Moderna was prevalent there. As for Erasmus himself, he has rarely revealed the foundation of his character more completely than when he declared to Servatius, quote, My mind is such that I think nothing can rank higher than friendship in this life. Nothing should be desired more ardently. Nothing should be treasured more jealously, unquote. A violent affection of a similar nature troubled him even at a later date when the purity of his motives was questioned. Afterward, he speaks of youth as being used to conceive a fervent affection for certain comrades. Moreover, the classic examples of friends, Orestes and Pelades, Damon and Pythias, Theseus and Pubitus, as also David and Jonathan, were ever present before his mind's eye. A young and very tender heart, marked by many feminine traits, replete with all the sentiment and with all the imaginings of classic literature, who was debarred from love and found himself placed against his wish in a coarse and frigid environment, was likely to become somewhat excessive in his affections. He was obliged to moderate them. Savatius would have none of so jealous and exacting a friendship, and probably at the cost of more humiliation and shame than appears in his letters, young Erasmus resigns himself to be more guarded in expressing his feelings in the future. The sentimental Erasmus disappears for good and presently makes room for the witty Latinist who surpasses his older friends and chats with them about poetry and literature, advises them about their Latin style and lectures them if necessary. The opportunities for acquiring a new taste for classic antiquity cannot have been so scanty at Deventer and in the monastery itself as Erasmus afterwards would have us believe, considering the authors he already knew at this time. We may conjecture also that the books left by his father, possibly brought by him from Italy, contributed to Erasmus's culture, though it would be strange that, prone as he was to disparage his schools and his monastery, he should not have mentioned the fact. Moreover, we know that the humanistic knowledge of his youth was not exclusively his own, in spite of all he afterwards said about Dutch ignorance and obscurantism, Cornelius Aurelius and William Hermans likewise possessed it. In a letter to Cornelius, he mentions the following authors as his poetic models, Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Juvenal, Statius, Marshall, Claudian, Perseus, Lucan, Tibullus, and Propertius. In prose, he imitates Cicero, Quintilian, Sallust, and Terence, whose metrical character had not yet been recognized. Among Italian humanists, he was especially acquainted with Lorenzo Valla, who on account of his elegantiae passed with him for the pioneer of Bonae Literae, but Filelfio, Aeneas Silvius, Guarino, Poggio, and others were also not unknown to him. In ecclesiastical literature, he was particularly well-read in Jerome, it remains remarkable that the education which Erasmus received in the schools of the Devotio Moderna, with their ultra-puritanical object, their rigid discipline intent on breaking the personality, could produce such a mind as he manifests in his monastic period, the mind of an accomplished humanist. He is only interested in writing Latin verses and in the purity of his Latin style. We look almost in vain for piety in the correspondence with Cornelius of Gouda and William Hermans, they manipulate with ease the most difficult Latin meters and the rarest terms of mythology. Their subject matter is bucolic or amatory, and if devotional, their classicism deprives it of the accent of piety. The prior of the neighboring monastery of Hem, at whose request Erasmus sang the archangel Michael, did not dare to paste up his sapphic ode. It was so poetic, he thought, as to seem almost Greek. In those days, poetic meant classic. Erasmus himself thought he made it so bald that it was merely prose. That, quote, the times were so barren then, unquote, he afterwards sighed. These young poets felt themselves the guardians of a new light amidst the dullness and barbarism which oppressed them. They readily believed each other's productions to be immortal, as every band of youthful poets does, and dreamt of a future of poetic glory for Stain by which it would vie with Mantua. Their environment of clownish, narrow-minded, conventional divines, 
for as such they saw them, neither acknowledged nor encouraged them. Erasmus's strong propensity to fancy himself menaced and injured tinged his position with the martyrdom of oppressed talent. To Cornelius he complained in fine Horatian measure of the contempt in which poetry was held. His fellow monk orders him to let his pen, accustomed to writing poetry, rest. Consuming envy forces him to give up making verses. A horrid barbarism prevails. The country laughs at the laurel-bringing art of high-seated Apollo. The coarse peasant orders the learned poet to write verses. Though I had mouths as many as the stars that twinkle in the silent firmament on quiet nights, or as many as the roses that the mild gale of spring strews on the ground, I could not complain of all the evils by which the sacred art of poetry is oppressed in these days. I am tired of writing poetry. Of this effusion, Cornelius makes a dialogue which highly pleased Erasmus. Though in this art nine-tenths may be rhetorical fiction and sedulous imitation, we not ought, on that account, to undervalue the enthusiasm inspiring the young poets. Let us, who have mostly grown blunt to the charms of Latin, not think too lightly of the elation felt by one who, after learning this language out of the most absurd primers and according to the most ridiculous methods, nevertheless discovered it in its purity and afterwards came to handle it in the charming rhythm of some artful meter, in the glorious precision of its structure, and in all the melodiousness of its sound. Next he called Placidis Ignea Noctibus Scintillant Tacito Sidera Culmine. Next he quote Tepidum Plante Favonio Vera Sufundit Humorosas Tot Cintora Mihi. Was it strange that the youth who could say this felt himself a poet, or who, together with his friend, could sing of spring in their Meliboean song of fifty distichs? Pendantic work, if you like, labored literary exercises, and yet full of the freshness and the vigor which spring from the Latin itself. Out of these moods was to come the first comprehensive work that Erasmus was to undertake, the manuscript which he was afterwards to lose, to recover in part, and to publish only after many years, the Antibabari, which he commenced at Stain, according to Dr. Allen. In the version in which eventually the first book of the Antibabari appeared, it reflects, it is true, a somewhat later phase of Erasmus's life, that which began after he had left the monastery. Neither is the comfortable tone of his witty defense of profane literature any longer than that of the poet at Stain. But the ideal of a free and noble life of friendly intercourse and the uninterrupted study of the ancients had already occurred to him within the convent walls. In the course of years, those walls probably hemmed him in more and more closely. Neither learned nor poetic correspondence nor the art of painting with which he occupied himself, together with one sasbode, could sweeten the oppression of monastic life and a narrow-minded and friendly environment. Of the later period in his life in the monastery, no letters at all have been preserved, according to Dr. Allen's carefully considered dating. Had he dropped his correspondence out of spleen, or had his superiors forbidden him to keep it up, or are we merely left in the dark because of accidental loss? We know nothing about the circumstances and the frame of mind in which Erasmus was ordained on the 25th of April, 1492, by the Bishop of Utrecht, David of Burgundy. Perhaps his taking holy orders was connected with his design to leave the monastery. He himself afterwards declares he had but rarely read Mass. He got his chance to leave the monastery when offered the post of secretary to the Bishop of Cambrai, Henry of Bergen. Erasmus owed this preferment to his fame as a Latinist and a man of letters, for it was with a view to a journey to Rome, where the bishop hoped to obtain a cardinal's hat, that Erasmus entered his service. The authorization of the Bishop of Utrecht had been obtained, and also that of the prior and the general of the order. Of course, there was no question yet of taking leave for good, since, as the bishop's servant, Erasmus continued to wear his canon's dress. 
he had prepared for his departure in the deepest secrecy. There is something touching in the glimpse we get of his friend and fellow poet, William Hermans, waiting in vain outside of Gouda to see his friend just for a moment, when on his way south he would pass the town. It seems there had been consultations between them as to leaving Stain together, and Erasmus, on his part, had left him ignorant of his plans. William had to console himself with the literature that might be had at Stain. Erasmus, then twenty-five years old, for in all probability the year when he left the monastery was 1493, now set foot on the path of a career that was very common and much coveted at that time, that of an intellectual in the shadow of the great. His patron belonged to one of the numerous Belgian noble families which had risen in the service of the Burgundians and were interestedly devoted to the prosperity of that house. The Glins were lords of the important town of bergen op Zoom, which, situated between the river Schlet and the Meuse Delta, was one of the links between northern and the southern Netherlands. Henry, the Bishop of Cambrai, had just been appointed Chancellor of the Order of the Golden Fleece, the most distinguished spiritual dignity of court, which, although now Habsburg in fact, was still named after Burgundy. The service of such an important personage is promised an almost unbounded honor and profit. Many a man would, under the circumstances, at the cost of some patience, some humiliation, and a certain laxity of principle, have arisen even to be a bishop. But Erasmus was never a man to make the most of his situation. Serving the bishop proved to be rather a disappointment. Erasmus had to accompany him on his frequent migrations from one residence to another in Bergen, Brussels, or Mechelen. He was very busy, but the exact nature of his duties is unknown. The journey to Rome, the acme of things desirable to every divine or student, did not come off. The bishop, although taking a cordial interest in him for some months, was less accommodating than he had expected, and so we shortly find Erasmus once more in anything but a cheerful frame of mind. Quote, the hardest fate, unquote, he calls his own which robs him of all his old sprightliness. Opportunities to study he had none. He now envies his friend William, who at Stain, in the little cell, can write beautiful poetry, favored by his lucky stars. It benefits him, Erasmus, only to weep and sigh. It has already so dulled his mind and withered his heart that his former studies no longer appeal to him. There is rhetorical exaggeration in this, and we shall not take his pining for the monastery too seriously. But still it is clear that deep dejection had mastered him. Contact with the world of politics and ambition had probably unsettled Erasmus. He never had any aptitude for it. The hard realities of life frightened and distressed him. When forced to occupy himself with them, he saw nothing but bitterness and confusion about him. Where is Gladness or repose, wherever I turn my eyes, I only see disaster and harshness, and in such a bustle and clamor about me, you wish me to find leisure for the work of the muses? Real leisure, Erasmus, was never to find during his life. All his reading, all his writing, he did hastily, to mutare, as he called it repeatedly. Yet he must nevertheless have worked with intensest concentration and an incredible power of assimilation. While staying with the bishop, he visited the monastery of Gronendal, near Brussels, where in former times Roisbrook wrote. Possibly Erasmus did not hear the inmates speak of Roisbrook, and he would certainly have taken little pleasure in the writings of the great mystic. But in the library he found the works of St. Augustine, and these he devoured. The monks of Gronendal were surprised at his diligence, he took the volumes with him, even to his bedroom. He occasionally found time to compose at this period. At Halsturen, near bergen op Zoom, where the bishop had a country house, he revised the anti Bavaria, begun at Stain, and elaborated it in the form of a dialogue. It would seem as if he sought compensation for the agitation of his existence in an atmosphere of idyllic repose and cultured conversation. He conveys to us the scene, he will afterwards use it repeatedly, which ever remained the ideal pleasure of life to him, a garden or a garden house outside the town, 
where in the gladness of the fine day a small number of friends meet to talk during a simple meal or a quiet walk in platonic serenity about the things of the mind. These personages, whom he introduces, besides himself, are his best friends. They are the valued and faithful friend whom he got to know at Bergen, James Botts, schoolmaster and afterwards also clerk of that town, and his old friend, William Hermans of Stain, whose literary future he continued somewhat to promote. William, arriving unexpectedly from Holland, meets the others, who are later joined by the Burgomaster of Bergen and the town physician. In a lightly jesting, placid tone, they engage in a discussion about the appreciation of poetry and literature, or Latin literature. These are not incompatible with true devotion, as barbarous dullness wants us to believe. A cloud of witnesses is there to prove it, among them and above all St. Augustine, whom Erasmus had studied recently, and St. Jerome, with whom Erasmus had been longer acquainted, and whose mind was, indeed, more congenial to him. Solemnly, in ancient Roman guise, war is declared on the enemies of classic culture. O ye Goths, by what right do you occupy not only the Latin provinces, the discipline liberales are meant, but the capital, that is, Latinity itself. It was Bot who, when his prospects with the Bishop of Cambrai ended in disappointment, helped to find a way out for Erasmus. He himself had studied at Paris, and thither Erasmus also hoped to go, now that Rome was denied him. The Bishop's consent and the promise of a stipend were obtained, and Erasmus departed for the most famous of all universities, that of Paris, probably in the late summer of 1495. Bat's influence and efforts had procured him this lucky chance. End of chapter 2. Recording by Trenton. Chapter 3 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trenton. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Husinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 3 The University of Paris, 1495 to 1499. The University of Paris, Traditions and Schools of Philosophy and Theology, the College of Montaigu. Erasmus's Dislike of Scholasticism, Relations with the Humanist Robert Gauguin. 1495. How to Earn a Living. First Drafts of Several of His Educational Works. Traveling to Holland and Back. Bat and the Lady of Veray. To England with Lord Montjoy. 1499. The University of Paris was, more than any other place in Christendom, the scene of the collision and struggle of opinions and parties. University life in the Middle Ages was in general tumultuous and agitated. The forms of scientific intercourse themselves entailed an element of irritability, never-ending disputations, frequent elections, and rowdyism of the students. To those were added old and new quarrels of all sorts of orders, schools, and groups. The different colleges contended among themselves. The secular clergy were at variance with the regular. The Thomists and the Scotists together called the ancients, had been disputing at Paris for half a century with the Terminists, or moderns, the followers of Occam and Buridan. In 1482, some sort of peace was concluded between those two groups. Both schools were on their last legs, stuck fast in sterile technical disputes, in systematizing and subdividing, a method of terms and words by which science and philosophy benefited no longer. The theological colleges of the Dominicans and Franciscans at Paris were declining. Theological teaching was taken over by the secular colleges of Navarre and Sorbonne, but in the old style. The general traditionalism had not prevented humanism from penetrating Paris also during the last quarter of the 15th century. Refinement of the Latin style and the taste for classic poetry here, too, had their fervent champions, just as revived Platonism, which had sprung up in Italy. The Parisian humanists were partly Italians, as Girolamo Balbi and Fausto Andrellini 
but at that time a Frenchman was considered to be their leader, Robert Gauguin, general of the order of Mathurians or Trinitarians, diplomatist, French poet, and humanist. Side by side with the new Platonism, a clearer understanding of Aristotle penetrated, which had also come from Italy. Shortly before Erasmus's arrival, Jacques Lefebvre de Taple had returned from Italy, where he had visited the Platonists, such as Marsilio Vicino, Pico della Mirandola, and Ermolo la o Barbaro, the reviver of Aristotle. Though theoretical theology and philosophy generally were conservative at Paris, yet here as well as elsewhere movements to reform the Church were not wanting. The authority of Jean Gerson, the university's great chancellor, about 1400, had not yet been forgotten, but reform by no means meant inclination to depart from the doctrine of the Church. It aimed, in the first place, at restoration and purification of the monastic orders, and afterwards at the extermination of abuses which the Church acknowledged and lamented as existing within its fold. In that spirit of reformation of spiritual life, the Dutch movement of Devotio Moderna had recently begun to make itself felt also at Paris. The chief of its promoters was Jan Standenok of Mechelen, educated by the brethren of the common life at Gouda and imbued with their spirit in its most rigorous form. He was an aesthetic, more austere than the spirit of the Windes Hemians, strict indeed, but yet moderate, required. Far beyond ecclesiastical circles, his name was proverbial on account of his abstinence. He had definitely denied himself the use of meat. As provisor of the College of Montagu, he had instituted the most stringent rules there, enforced by chastisement for the slightest of faults. To the college he had annexed a home for poor scholars, where they lived in a semi-monastic community. To this man Erasmus had been commended by the Bishop of Cambrai. Though he did not join the community of poor students, he was nearly thirty years old, he came to know all the privations of the system. They embittered the earlier part of his stay at Paris, and instilled in him a deep, permanent aversion to abstinence and austerity. Had he come to Paris for this, to experience the dismal and depressing influences of his youth anew in a more stringent form? The purpose for which Erasmus went to Paris was chiefly to obtain the degree of Doctor of Theology. This was not too difficult for him, as a regular he was exempt from previous study in the Faculty of Arts and his learning and astonishing intelligence and energy enabled him to prepare in a short time for the examinations and disputations required. Yet he did not attain this object at Paris. His stay, with interruptions, lasted first till 1499, to be continued later, became to him a period of difficulties and exasperations, a struggle to make his way by all the humiliating means which at the time were indispensable to that end of dawning success, too, which, however, failed to gratify him. The first cause of his reverses was a physical one. He could not endure the hard life in the College of Montaigu, the addled eggs and squalid bedrooms stuck in his memory all his life. There he thinks he contracted the beginnings of his later infirmity. In the colloquia he has commemorated with abhorrence Standock's system of abstinence, privation, and chastisement. For the rest, his stay there lasted only until the spring of 1496. Meanwhile, he had begun his theological studies. He attended lectures on the Bible and on the Book of the Sentences, the medieval handbook of theology and still one of the most frequently used. He was even allowed to give some lessons in, in the college on Holy Scripture. He preached a few sermons in honor of the saints, probably in the neighboring abbey of St. Genevieve. But his heart was not in all this. The subtleties of the schools could not please him. That aversion to all scholasticism, which he rejected in one sweeping condemnation, struck root in his mind, which, however broad, always judged unjustly that for which it had no room. Quote, These studies can make a man opinionated and contentious. Can they make him wise? They exhaust the mind by a certain jejun and barren subtlety, without fertilizing or inspiring it, by their stammering, and by the stains of their impure style, they disfigure theology which had been enriched and adorned by the eloquence of the ancients. They involve everything whilst trying to resolve everything. 
The Scotist, with Erasmus, became a handy epithet for all schoolmen, nay, for everything superannuated and antiquated. He would rather lose the whole of Scotus than Cicero's or Plutarch's works. These he feels the better for reading, whereas he rises from the study of scholasticism frigidly disposed towards true virtue, but irritated into a disputatious mood. It would no doubt have been difficult for Erasmus to find in the arid traditionalism which prevailed in the University of Paris the heyday of scholastic philosophy and theology. From the disputations which he heard in the Sorbonne, he brought back nothing but the habit of scoffing at doctors of theology, or as he always ironically calls them by their title of honor, Magistri Nostri. Yawning, he sat among those holy Scotists, with their wrinkled brows, staring eyes, and puzzled faces. And on his return home he writes a disrespectful fantasy to his young friend Thomas Gray, telling him how he sleeps the sleep of Epimenides with the divines of the Sorbonne. Epimenides awoke after his forty-seven years of slumber, but the majority of our present theologians will never wake up. What may Epimenides have dreamt? What but subtleties of the Scotists, quiddities, formalities, etc.? Epimenides himself was reborn in Scotus, or rather Epimenides was Scotus's prototype. For did he not, too, write theological books in which he tied such syllogistic knots as he would never have been able to loosen? The Sorbonne preserves Epimenides' skin, written over with mysterious letters, as an oracle which men may only see after having borne the title of Magister Noster for fifteen years. It is not a far cry from caricatures like these to the Sorbonistre and the Barbulamenta Scotti of Rabelais. It is said, thus Erasmus concludes, his boutade, that no one can understand the mysteries of this science who has had the least intercourse with the muses or the graces. All that you have learned of the Bonae Literae has to be unlearned first. If you have drunk of Helicon, you must first vomit the draught. I do my utmost to say nothing according to the Latin taste, and nothing graceful or witty, and I am already making progress, and there is hope that one day they will acknowledge Erasmus. It was not only the dryness of the method and barrenness of the system which revolted Erasmus. It was also the qualities of his own mind which, in spite of all its breadth and acuteness, did not tend to penetrate deeply into philosophical or dogmatic speculations. For it was not only scholasticism that repelled him. The youthful Platonism and the rejuvenated Aristotelianism taught by Lefebvre de Table also failed to attract him. For the present he remained a humanist of aesthetic bias, with the substratum of a biblical and moral disposition resting mainly on the study of his favorite Jerome. For a long time to come, Erasmus considered himself and also introduced himself as a poet and an orator, by which latter term he meant what we call a man of letters. Immediately on arriving in Paris, he must have sought contact with the headquarters of literary humanism. The obscure Dutch regular introduced himself in a long letter, not preserved, full of eulogy accompanied by a much-labored poem to the general, not only of the Trinitarians, but at the same time of Parisian humanists, Robert Gauguin. The great man answered very obligingly, quote, From your lyrical specimen I conclude that you are a scholar. My friendship is at your disposal. Do not be so profuse in your praise. That looks like flattery. Unquote. The correspondence had hardly begun when Erasmus found a splendid opportunity to render this illustrious personage a service and, at the same time, in the shadow of his name, make himself known to the reading public. The matter is also of importance because it affords us an opportunity, for the first time, to notice the connection that is always found between Erasmus's career as a man of letters and a scholar, and the technical conditions of the youthful art of printing. Gauguin was an all-round man, and his Latin textbook of the history of France, the Origine Gestis Francorum Compendium, was just being printed. It was the first specimen of humanistic historiography in France. The printer had finished his work on 30 September 1495, but of the 136 leaves, two remained blank. This was not permissible according to the notions of the time. 
Gogon was ill and could not help matters. By judicious spacing, the compositor managed to fill up folio 135 with a poem by Gogon, a colophon, and two panegyrics by Faustus Angelinus and another humanist. Even then there was need of matter, and Erasmus dashed into the breach and furnished a long commendatory letter, completely filling the superfluous blank space of folio 136. In this way his name and style suddenly became known to the numerous public, which was interested in Gauguin's historical work, and at the same time he acquired another title to Gauguin's protection, on whom the exceptional qualities of Erasmus's diction had evidently not been lost. That his history would remain known chiefly because it had been a stepping-stone to Erasmus, Gauguin could hardly have anticipated. Although Erasmus had now, as a follower of Gauguin, been introduced into the world of Parisian humanists, the road to fame, which had latterly begun to lead through the printing press, was not yet easy for him. He showed the anti bavard to Gauguin, who praised them, but no suggestion of publication resulted. A slender volume of Latin poems by Erasmus was published in Paris in 1496, dedicated to Hector Goys, a Scotchman with whom he had become acquainted at Montaigu. But the more important writings at which he worked during his stay in Paris all appeared in print much later. While intercourse with men like Robert Gauguin and Faustus André Linus might be honorable, it was not directly profitable. The support of the Bishop of Cambrai was scantier than he wished. In the spring of 1496 he fell ill and left Paris. Going first to Bergen, he had a kind welcome from his patron, the bishop, and then, having recovered his health, he went on to Holland to his friends. It was his intention to stay there, he says. The friends themselves, however, urged him to return to Paris, which he did in the autumn of 1496. He carried poetry by William Hermans and a letter from this poet to Gauguin. A printer was found for the poems, and Erasmus also brought his friend and fellow poet into contact with Faustus Andrelinus. The position of a man who wished to live by intellectual labor was far from easy at that time, and not always dignified. He had either to live on church prebends, or on distinguished patrons, or on both. But such a prebend was difficult to get, and patrons were often uncertain and disappointing. The publishers paid considerable copy fees only to famous authors. As a rule, the writer received a number of copies of his work, and that was all. His chief advantage came from a dedication to some distinguished personage who could compliment him for it with a handsome gift. There were authors who made it a practice to dedicate the same work repeatedly to different persons. Erasmus has afterwards defended himself explicitly from that suspicion, and carefully noted how many of those whom he honored with a dedication gave nothing or very little. The first need, therefore, to a man in Erasmus's circumstances was to find a Mecenas. Mecenas, with the humanist, was almost synonymous with paymaster. Under the adage, nebos quidem perat, Erasmus has given a description of the decent way of obtaining a Mecenas. Consequently, when his conduct in these years appears to us to be actuated more than once by an undignified pushing spirit, we should not gauge it by our present standards. These were his years of weakness. On his return to Paris, he did not again lodge in Montaigu. He tried to make a living by giving lessons to young men of fortune. A merchant's son of Lubeck, Christian and Henry Northoff, who lodged with one Augustin and Vincent, were his pupils. He composed beautiful letters for them, witty, fluent, and a trifle scented. At the same time, he taught two young Englishmen, Thomas Gray and Robert Fisher, and conceived such a doting affection for Gray as to lead to trouble with the youth's guardian, a Scotsman by whom Erasmus was excessively vexed. Paris did not fail to exercise its refining influence on Erasmus. It made his style affectedly refined and sparkling. He pretends to disdain the rustic products of his youth in Holland. In the meantime, the works through which afterwards his influence was to spread over the whole world began to grow, but only to the benefit of a few readers. They remained unprinted as yet. For the Norfolks was composed the little compendium of polite conversation in Latin, familiarium colloquiorum formulae, 
the nucleus of the world-famous colloquia. For Robert Fisher, he wrote the first draft of the Conscribendis Epistolis, the great dissertation on the art of letter-writing, Latin letters. Probably also the paraphrase of Valla's Elegantiae, a treatise on pure Latin which had been a beacon light of culture to Erasmus in his youth. The copia verborum macererum was also such a help for beginners to provide them with a vocabulary and abundance of terms and expressions, and also the germs of a larger work. The Ratione Studii, a manual for arranging courses of study, lay in the same line. It was a life of uncertainty and unrest. The bishop gave but little support. Erasmus was not in good health and felt continually depressed. He made plans for a journey to Italy, but did not see much chance of effecting them. In the summer of 1498, he again traveled to Holland and to the bishop. In Holland, his friends were little pleased with his studies. It was feared that he was contracting debts in Paris. Current reports about him were not favorable. He found the bishop, in the commotion of his departure for England on a mission, irritable and full of complaints. It became more and more evident that he would have to look out for another patron. Perhaps he might turn to the Lady of Verey, Anna of Borsalin, with whom his faithful and helpful friend Bott had taken service as a tutor to her son in the castle of Tournehem between Calais and Saint-Omer. Upon his return to Paris, Erasmus resumed his old life, but it was hateful slavery to him. Bott had an invitation for him to come to Turnham, but he could not yet bear to leave Paris. Here he had now, as a pupil, the young Lord Montjoy, William Blunt. That meant two strings to his bow. Bott is incited to prepare the ground for him with Anna of Array. William Hermans is charged with writing letters to Montjoy, in which he is to praise the latter's love of literature. You should display an erudite integrity. Commend me, and proffer your services kindly. Believe me, William, your reputation, too, will benefit by it. He is a young man of great authority with his own folk. You will have someone to distribute your writings in England. I pray you again and again. If you love me, take this to heart. The visit to Turnham took place at the beginning of 1499, followed by another journey to Holland. Henceforth, Anna of Array passed for his patroness. In Holland, he saw his friend, William Hermans, and told him that he thought of leaving for Bologna after Easter. The Dutch journey was one of unrest and bustle. He was in a hurry to return to Paris, not to miss any opportunity which Montjoy's affection might offer him. He worked hard at the various writings on which he was engaged, as hard as his health permitted after the difficult journey in winter. He was busily occupied in collecting the money for traveling to Italy, now postponed until August. But evidently Bott could not obtain as much for him as he had hoped, and in May Erasmus suddenly gave up the Italian plan and left for England with Montjoy at the latter's request. End of chapter 3 Recorded by Trenton Chapter 4 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trenton. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Husinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hoffman. Chapter 4. First Day in England, 1499-1500. Oxford, John Collette, Erasmus's aspirations directed towards divinity. He is, as yet, mainly a literate. Fisher and Moore, mishap at Dover when leaving England, 1500, back in France, he composes the Adagio, years of trouble and penury. Erasmus's first stay in England, which lasted from early summer 1499, till the beginning of 1500, was to become for him a period of inward ripening. He came there as an erudite poet, the protégé of a nobleman of rank, on the road to closer contact with the great world which knew how to appreciate and reward literary merit. He left the country with the fervent desire in future to employ his gifts, in so far as circumstances would permit, in more serious tasks. 
This change was brought about by two new friends he found in England, whose personalities were far above those who had hitherto crossed his path, John Collette and Thomas Moore. During all the time of his sojourn in England, Erasmus is in high spirits for him. At first it is still the man of the world who speaks, the refined man of letters, who must need show his brilliant genius. Aristocratic life, of which he evidently had seen but little at the Bishop of Cambrai's and the Lady of Arrays at Turnahem, pleased him fairly well, it seems. Quote, Here in England we have indeed progressed somewhat. The Erasmus, whom you know, is almost a good hunter, already not too bad a horseman, a not unpractised courtier. He salutes a little more courteously, he smiles more kindly. If you are wise, you will also alight here. And he teases the volatile poet by telling him about the charming girls and the laudable custom, which he found in England, of accompanying all compliments by kisses. It even fell to his lot to make the acquaintance of royalty. For Mountjoy's estate at Greenwich, Moore, in the course of a walk, took him to Eltham Palace, where the royal children were educated. There he saw, surrounded by the whole royal household, the youthful Henry, who was to be Henry the Eighth, a boy of nine years, together with two little sisters, and a young prince, who was still an infant in arms. Erasmus was ashamed he had nothing to offer, and on returning home he composed, not without exertion, for he had not written poetry at all for some time, a panegyric on England, which he presented to the prince with a graceful dedication. In October Erasmus was at Oxford, which at first did not please him, but whither Montjoy was to follow him. He had been recommended to John Collette, who declared that he required no recommendations. He already knew Erasmus from the letter to Gauguin in the latter's historical work, and thought very highly of his learning. There followed, during the remainder of Erasmus's stay at Oxford, a lively intercourse. In conversation and in correspondence, which definitely decided the bent of Erasmus's many-sided mind. John Collette, who did not differ much from Erasmus in point of age, had found his intellectual path earlier and more easily. Born of well-to-do parents, his father was a London magistrate and twice Lord Mayor, he had been able leisurely to prosecute his studies, not seduced by quite such a brilliant genius as Erasmus possessed into literary digressions. He had from the beginning fixed his attention on theology. He knew Plato and Plotinus, though not in Greek, was very well read in the older fathers, and also respectably acquainted with scholasticism, not to mention his knowledge of mathematics, law, history, and the English poets. In 1496 he had established himself at Oxford. Without possessing a degree in divinity, he expounded St. Paul's epistles. Although, owing to his ignorance of Greek, he was restricted to the Vulgate, he tried to penetrate to the original meaning of the sacred text, discarding the later commentaries. Colette had a deeply serious nature, and always warring against the tendencies of his vigorous being, and he kept within bounds his pride and love of pleasure. He had a keen sense of humor, which without doubt endeared him to Erasmus. He was an enthusiast. When defending a point in theology, his ardor changed, the sound of his voice, the look in his eyes, and a lofty spirit permeated his whole person. Out of his intercourse with Colette came the first of Erasmus's theological writings. At the end of a discussion regarding Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, in which Erasmus had defended the usual view that Christ's fear of suffering proceeded from his human nature, Colette had exhorted him to think further about the matter. They exchanged letters about it, and finally Erasmus committed both their opinions to paper in the form of a, quote, little disputation concerning the anguish, fear, and sadness of Jesus. Dispututati in cula de tedio, pavore tristitia, Jesu, etc., being an elaboration of these letters. While the tone of this pamphlet is earnest and pious, it is not truly fervent. The man of letters is not at once and completely superseded. Quote, See Colette, thus Erasmus ends his first letter, referring half ironically to himself, 
How can I observe the rules of propriety in concluding such a theologic disputation with poetic fables? He had made use of a few mythologic metaphors. But as Horace says, Naturum expelles furca, tamen usque recurrit. This ambiguous position, which Erasmus still occupied also in things of the mind, appears still more clearly from the report which he sent to his new friend, the Frisian John Sixten, a Latin poet like himself of another disputation with Colette, at a repast, probably in the Hall of Magdalen College, where Wolsey, too, was perhaps present. To his fellow poet, Erasmus writes as a poet, loosely and with some affectation, it was a meal such as he liked, and afterwards frequently pictured in his colloquies. Cultured company, good food, moderate drinking, noble conversation. Colette presided. On his right hand sat the prior Charnock of St. Mary's College, where Erasmus resided. He had also been present at a disputation about Christ's agony. On his left was a divine whose name is not mentioned, an advocate of scholasticism. Next to him came Erasmus, quote, that the poet should not be wanting at the banquet." Unquote. The discussion was about Cain's guilt, by which he displeased the Lord. Colette defended the opinion that Cain had injured God by doubting the Creator's goodness, and in reliance on his own industry, tilling the earth, whereas Abel tended the sheep, and was content with what grew of itself. The divine contended with syllogisms, Erasmus with arguments of rhetoric, but Colette kindled and got the better of both. After a while, when the dispute had lasted long enough and had become more serious than was suitable for table talk, quote, Then I said, in order to play my part, the part of the poet, that is, to abate the contention and at the same time cheer the meal with a pleasant tale, quote, It is a very old story. It has to be unearthed from the very oldest authors. I will tell you what I found about it in literature. If you promise me first that, you will not look upon it as a fable." Unquote. And now he relates a witty story of some very ancient codex in which he had read how Cain, who had often heard his parents speak of the glorious vegetation of paradise, where the ears of corn were as high as the alders with us, had prevailed upon the angel who guarded it to give him some paradisal grains. God would not mind it if only he left the apples alone. The speech by which the angel is incited to disobey the Almighty is a masterpiece of Erasmian wit. Quote, Do you find it pleasant to stand here by the gate with a big sword? We have just begun to use dogs for that sort of work. It is not so bad on earth, and it will be better still. We shall learn, no doubt, to cure diseases. What that forbidden knowledge matters, I do not see very clearly, though in that matter, too, unwearied industry surmounts all obstacles." Unquote. In this way the guardian is seduced, but when God beholds the miraculous effect of Cain's agricultural management, punishment does not fail to ensue. A more delicate way of combining Genesis and the Prometheus myth no humanist had yet invented. But still, though Erasmus went on conducting himself as a man of letters among his fellow poets, his heart was no longer in those literary exercises. It is one of the peculiarities of Erasmus's mental growth that it records no violent crises. We never find him engaged in those bitter inward struggles which are in the experience of so many great minds. His transition from interest in literary matters to interest in religious matters is not in the nature of a process of conversion. There is no Tarsus in Erasmus's life. The transition takes place gradually and is never complete. For many years to come, Erasmus can, without suspicion of hypocrisy, at pleasure, as his interests or moods require, play the man of letters or the theologian. He is a man with whom the deeper currents of the soul gradually rise to the surface, who raises himself to the height of his ethical consciousness under the stress of circumstances rather than at the spur of some irresistible impulse. The desire to turn only to matters of faith he shows early. Quote, I have resolved, he writes in his monastic period to Cornelius of Gouda, to write no more poems in the future, 
except such as savor of praise of the saints or of sanctity itself. Unquote. But that was the youthful, pious resolve of a moment. During all the years previous to the first voyage to England, Erasmus's writings, especially his letters, betray a worldly disposition. It only leaves him in moments of illness and weariness. Then the world displeases him, and he despises his own ambition. He desires to live in holy quiet, musing on scripture and shedding tears over his old errors. But these are utterances inspired by the occasion, which one should not take too seriously. It was Colette's word and example which first changed Erasmus's desultory occupation with theological studies into a firm and lasting resolve to make their pursuit the object of his life. Colette urged him to expound the Pentateuch or the prophet Isaiah at Oxford, just as he himself treated of Paul's epistles. Erasmus declined. He could not do it. This bespoke insight and self-knowledge by which he surpassed Colette. The latter's intuitive scripture interpretation without the knowledge of the original language failed to satisfy Erasmus. Quote, you are acting imprudently, my dear Colette, in trying to obtain water from a pumice stone, in the words of Plautus. How shall I be so impudent as to teach that which I have not learned myself? How shall I warm others while shivering and trembling with cold? You complain that you find yourself deceived in your expectations regarding me. But I have never promised you such a thing. You have deceived yourself by refusing to believe me when I was telling you the truth regarding myself. Neither did I come here to teach poetics or rhetoric. Colette had hinted at that. These have ceased to be sweet to me since they ceased to be necessary to me. I decline the one task because it does not come up to my aim in life the other because it is beyond my strength. But when one day I shall be conscious that the necessary power is in me, I too shall choose your part and devote to the assertion of divinity, if no excellent, yet sincere labor. The inference which Erasmus drew first of all was that he should know Greek better than he had thus far been able to learn it. His stay in England was rapidly drawing to a close. He had to return to Paris. Towards the end of his sojourn, he wrote to his former pupil, Robert Fisher, who was in Italy, in a high-pitched tone about the satisfaction which he experienced in England. A most pleasant and wholesome climate, he was most sensitive to it. So much humanity and erudition, not of the worn-out and trivial sort, but of the recondite, genuine, ancient Latin and Greek stamp, that he need hardly any more long to go to Italy. In Colette he thought he heard Plato himself, Grossin, the Grecian scholar, Linacre, the learned physician, who would not admire them, and whose spirit was ever softer, sweeter, or happier than that of Thomas More. A disagreeable incident occurred as Erasmus was leaving English soil in January 1500. Unfortunately, it not only obscured his pleasant memories of the happy island, but also placed another obstacle in the path of his career, and left in his super-sensitive soul a sting which vexed him for years afterwards. The livelihood which he had been gaining at Paris of late years was precarious. The support from the bishop had probably been withdrawn. That of Anna of Array had trickled but languidly. He could not too firmly rely on Montjoy. Under these circumstances, a modest fund some provision against a rainy day was of highest consequence. Such savings he brought from England, twenty pounds. An act of Edward III, reenacted by Henry VII not long before, prohibited the export of gold and silver, but Moore and Montjoy had assured Erasmus that he could safely take his money with him, if only it was not an English coin. At Dover he learned that the customs house officers were of a different opinion. He might only keep six angels. The rest was left behind in the hands of the officials and was evidently confiscated. The shock which this incident gave him perhaps contributed to his fancying himself threatened by robbers and murderers on the road from Calais to Paris. The loss of his money plunged him afresh into perplexity as to his support from day to day. It forced him to resume the profession of a bel esprit which he had already begun to loathe, and to take all the humiliating steps to get what was due to it from patrons. 
and above all that affected his mental balance and his dignity. Yet this mishap had its great advantage for the world, and for Erasmus too, after all. To it the world owes the adagia, and he the fame which began with this work. The feelings with which his misfortune at Dover inspired Erasmus were bitter anger and thirst for revenge. A few months later he writes to Bott, quote, Things with me are as they are wont to be in such cases. The wound received in England begins to smart only now that it has become inveterate, and that the more as I cannot have my revenge in any way. And six months later, quote, I shall swallow it. An occasion may offer itself, no doubt, to be even with them. Unquote. Yet meanwhile, true insight told this man, whose strength had not always attained to his ideals, that the English, whom he had just seen in such a favorable light, let alone his special friends among them, were not accessories to the misfortune. He never reproached Moore and Montjoy, whose inaccurate information, he tells us, had done the harm. At the same time, his interest, which he always saw in the garb of virtue, told him that now especially it would be essential not to break off his relations with England, and this gave him a splendid chance of strengthening them. Afterwards, he explained this with a naivete which often causes his writings, especially when he tries to suppress or cloak matters, to read like confessions. Quote, Returning to Paris a poor man, I understood that many would expect I should take revenge with my pen for this mishap, after the fashion of men of letters, by writing something venomous against the king or against England. But at the same time I was afraid that William Montjoy, having indirectly caused my loss of money, would be apprehensive of losing my affection. In order, therefore, to put the expectations of those people to shame, and to make known I was not so unfair as to blame the country for a private wrong, or so inconsiderate as, because of a small loss, to risk making the king displeased with myself, or with my friends in England, and at the same time to give my friend Montjoy a proof I was no less kindly disposed towards him than before, I resolved to publish something as quickly as possible. As I had nothing ready, I hastily brought together, by a few days' reading, a collection of adagia, in the supposition that such a booklet, however it might turn out, by its mere usefulness would get into the hands of the students. In this way I demonstrated that my friendship had not cooled off at all. Next, in a poem I subjoined, I protested that I was not angry with the king or with the country at being deprived of my money, and my scheme was not ill-received. That moderation and candor procured me a good many friends in England at the time, erudite, upright, and influential men." Unquote. This is a characteristic specimen of semi-ethical conduct. In this way Erasmus succeeded in dealing with his indignation, so that later on he could declare, when the recollection came up occasionally, quote, At one blow I had lost all my fortune, but I was so unconcerned that I returned to my books all the more, cheerfully and ardently." Unquote. But his friends knew how deep the wound had been. Quote, now, on hearing that Henry VIII had ascended to the throne, surely all bitterness must have suddenly left your soul. Unquote. Montroy writes to him in 1509, possibly through the pen of Ammonius. The years after his return to France were difficult ones. He was in great need of money and was forced to do what he could as a man of letters, with his talents and knowledge. He had again to be homo poeticus or rhetoricus. He writes polished letters full of mythology and modest mendicity. As a poet he had a reputation. As a poet he could expect support. Meanwhile, the elevating picture of his theological activities remained present before his mind's eye. It nerves him to energy and perseverance. Quote, it is incredible, he writes to Bott. How my soul yearns to finish all my works, at the same time becoming somewhat proficient in Greek, and afterwards to devote myself entirely to the sacred learning, after which my soul has been hankering for a long time. I am in fairly good health, so I shall have to strain every nerve this year, 1501, to get the work we gave the printer published, and by dealing with the theological problems, to expose our cavillers, 
who are very numerous, as they deserve. If three more years of life are granted me, I shall be beyond the reach of envy. Unquote. Here we see him in a frame of mind to accomplish great things, though not merely near the impulse of true devotion. Already he sees the restoration of genuine divinity as his task. Unfortunately, the effusion is contained in a letter in which he instructs the faithful bot as to how he should handle the late of Array in order to wheedle money out of her. For years to come, the efforts to make a living were to cause him almost constant tribulations and petty cares. He had had more than enough of France, and desired nothing better than to leave it. Part of the year 1500 he spent at Orléans. Adversity made him narrow. There is the story of his relations with Augustin Vincent Caminade, a humanist of lesser rank. He ended as syndic of Middelburg, who took young men as lodgers. It is too long to detail here, but remarkable enough as revealing Erasmus's psychology for it shows how deeply he mistrusted his friends. There are also his relations with Jacobus Vohecht, in whose house he evidently lived gratuitously, and for whom he managed to procure a rich lodger in the person of an illegitimate brother of the Bishop of Cambrai. At this time, Erasmus asserts, the Bishop, Antimacenus, he now calls him, set Standenach to dog him in Paris. Much bitterness there is in the letters of this period. Erasmus is suspicious, irritable, exacting, sometimes rude in writing to his friends. He cannot bear William Hermans any longer because of his Epicureanism, his lack of energy, to which he, Erasmus, certainly was a stranger. But what grieves us most is the way he speaks to Honest Bot. He is highly praised, certainly. Erasmus promises to make him immortal, too. But how offended he is when Bot cannot at once comply with his imperious demands! How almost shameless are his instructions as to what Bot is to tell the Lady of Vere, in order to solicit her favor for Erasmus! And how meager the expressions of his sorrow when the faithful Bot is taken from him by death in the first half of 1502! It is as if Erasmus had revenged himself on Bot for having been obliged to reveal himself to his true friend in need more completely than he cared to appear to anyone, or for having disavowed to Anna of Borsalin his fundamental convictions, his most refined taste, for the sake of a meager gratuity. He has paid homage to her in that ponderous Burgundian style with which dynasties in the Netherlands were familiar, and which must have been hateful to him. He has flattered her formal piety. Quote, I send you a few prayers, by means of which you could, as by incantations, call down, even against her will, from heaven, so to say, not the moon, but her who gave birth to the Son of Justice. Unquote. Did you smile your delicate smile, O author of the colloquies, while writing this? So much the worse for you. End of chapter four. Recorded by Trenton. Chapter five of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. O R G Recording by Trenton Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Husinga Translated by Frederick Jan Hoffmann Chapter five Erasmus as a Humanist Significance of the Adagia and similar works of later years Erasmus as a Divulger of Classical Culture Latin Estrangement from Holland Erasmus as a Netherlander. Meanwhile, renown came to Erasmus as the fruit of those literary studies which, he, as he said, had ceased to be dear to him. In 1500 that work appeared which Erasmus had written after his misfortune at Dover, and had dedicated to Montjoy, the Adiagorum Collectiana. It was a collection of about 800 proverbial sayings drawn from Latin authors of antiquity and elucidated for the use of those who aspired to write an elegant Latin style. 
In the dedication, Erasmus pointed out the profit an author may derive, both in ornamenting his style and in strengthening his argumentation, from having at his disposal a good supply of sentences hallowed by their antiquity. He proposes to offer such a help to his readers. What he actually gave was much more. He familiarized a much wider circle than the earlier humanists had reached with the spirit of antiquity. Until this time, the humanists had, to some extent, monopolized the treasures of classic culture in order to parade their knowledge of which the multitude remained destitute, and so to become strange prodigies of learning and elegance. With his irresistible need of teaching and his sincere love for humanity and its general culture, Erasmus introduced the classic spirit, insofar as it could be reflected in the soul of a 16th century Christian, among the people. Not he alone, but none more extensively and more effectively. Not among all the people, it is true, for by writing in Latin he limited his direct influence to the educated classes, which in those days were the upper classes. Erasmus made current the classic spirit. Humanism ceased to be the exclusive privilege of a few. According to Beatus Ricanus, he had been reproached by some humanists when, about to publish the Adagia, for divulging the mysteries of their craft. But he desired that the book of antiquity should be open to all. The literary and educational works of Erasmus, the chief of which were begun in his Parisian period, though most of them appeared much later, have, in truth, brought about a transformation of the general modes of expression and of argumentation. It should be repeated over and over again that this was not achieved by him single-handed. Countless others at the time were similarly engaged, but we only have to cast an eye on the broad current of editions of the Adagia, of the Colloquia, etc., to realize how much greater consequence he was in this respect than all the others. Erasmus is the only name in all the host of humanists which has remained a household word all over the globe. Here we will anticipate the course of Erasmus's life for a moment to enumerate the principal works of this sort. Some years later the Adagia increased from hundreds to thousands, through which not only Latin, but also Greek, wisdom spoke. In 1514 he published in the same manner a collection of similitudes, parabole. It was a partial realization of what he had conceived to supplement the Adagia. Metaphors, saws, allusions, poetical and scriptural allegories, all to be dealt with in a similar way. Towards the end of his life, he published a similar thesaurus of the witty antidotes and the striking words and deeds of wisdom of antiquity, the Apothegmata. In addition to these collections, we find manuals of a more grammatical nature, also piled up treasury-like. On the stock of expressions, De copia viborum ererum, on letter writing, De conscribendis epistolis, not to mention works of less importance. By a number of Latin translations of Greek authors, Erasmus had rendered a point of prospect accessible to those who did not wish to climb the whole mountain, and finally as inimitable models of the manner in which to apply all that knowledge that were the colloquia, and that almost countless multitude of letters which have flowed from Erasmus's pen. All this collectively made up antiquity in such quantity and quality as it was obtainable in the 16th century, exhibited in an emporium where it might be had at retail. Each student could get what was to his taste. Everything was to be had there in a great variety of designs. You may read my adagia in such a manner, says Erasmus, of the later augmented edition, that as soon as you have finished one, you may imagine you have finished the whole book. He made himself indices to facilitate its use. In the world of scholasticism, he alone had, up to now, been considered an authority who had mastered the technicalities of its system of thought and its mode of expression in all its details, and was versed in biblical knowledge, logic, and philosophy. Between scholastic parlance and the spontaneously written popular languages, there yawned a wide gulf. Humanism since Petrarch had substituted for the rigidly syllogistic structure of an argument the loose style of the antique, free, suggestive phrase. 
In this way, the language of the learned approached the natural manner of expression of daily life and raised the popular languages, even where it continued to use Latin, to its own level. The wealth of subject matter was found with no one in greater abundance than with Erasmus. What knowledge of life, what ethics, all supported by the indisputable authority of the ancients, all expressed in that fine, airy form for which he was admired, and such knowledge of the antiquities in addition to all this. Illimitable was the craving for, and illimitable the power to absorb what is extraordinary in real life. This was one of the principal characteristics of the spirit of the Renaissance. These minds never had their desired share of striking incidents, curious details, rarities, and anomalies. There was as yet no symptom of that mental dyspepsia of later periods, which can no longer digest reality and relishes it no more. Men reveled in plenty. And yet, were not Erasmus and his fellow workers as leaders of civilization on a wrong track? Was it true reality they were aiming at? Was their proud Latinity not a fatal error? There is one of the crucial points of history. A present-day reader who should take up the Adagio or the Apothegmata with a view to enriching his own life, for they were meant for this purpose, and it is what gave them value, would soon ask himself, what matter to us, apart from strictly philological and historical considerations, those endless details concerning obscure personages of antique society, of Phrygians, of Thessalians, they are nothing to me. And, he will continue, they really mattered nothing to Erasmus's contemporaries, either. The stupendous history of the 16th century was not enacted in classic phrases or turns. It was not based on classic interests or views of life. There are no Phrygians or Thessalians, no Agislaususes, no Dionysiuses. The humanists created out of all this a mental realm emancipated from the limitations of time. And did their own times pass without being influenced by them? That is the question, and we shall not attempt to answer it. To what extent did humanism influence the course of events? In any case, Erasmus and his coadjutors greatly heightened the international character of civilization which had existed throughout the Middle Ages because of Latin and of the Church. If they thought they were really making a Latin a vehicle for daily international use, they overrated their power. It was, no doubt, an amusing fancy and a witty exercise to plan, in such an international milieu as the Parisian student world, such models of sports and games in Latin as the Coricorium Formule offered. But can Erasmus have seriously thought that the next generation would play at marbles in Latin? Still, intellectual intercourse undoubtedly became very easy in so wide a circle as had not been within reach in Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire. Henceforth, it was no longer the clergy alone, and an occasional literate, but a numerous multitude of sons of burghers and nobles, qualifying for some magisterial office, who passed through a grammar school and found Erasmus in their path. Erasmus could not have obtained his worldwide celebrity if it had not been for Latin. To make his native tongue a universal language was beyond him. It may well puzzle a fellow countryman of Erasmus to guess what a talent like his, with his power of observation, his delicacy of expression, his gusto and wealth, might have meant to Dutch literature. Just imagine the colloquia written in the racy Dutch of the 16th century. What could he have not produced if, instead of gleaning and commenting upon classic adagia, he had, for his themes, availed himself of the proverbs of the vernacular. To us, such a proverb is perhaps even more sapid than the sometimes slightly finical turns praised by Erasmus. This, however, is to reason unhistorically. This was not what the times required and what Erasmus could give. It is quite clear why Erasmus could only write in Latin. Moreover, in the vernacular, everything would have appeared too direct, too personal, too real for his taste. He could not do without that thin veil of vagueness, of remoteness, in which everything is wrapped when expressed in Latin. His fastidious mind would have shrunk from the pithy coarseness of a Rabelais or the rustic violence of Luther's German. 
Estrangement from his native tongue had begun for Erasmus as early as the days when he learned reading and writing. Estrangement from the land of his birth set in when he left the monastery of Stain. It was furthered not a little by the ease with which he handled Latin. Erasmus, who could express himself as well in Latin as in his mother tongue, and even better, consequently lacked the experience of, after all, feeling thoroughly at home and of being able to express himself fully only among his compatriots. After he had seen at Paris the perspective of his own capacities, he became confirmed in the conviction that Holland failed to appreciate him, that it distrusted and slandered him. Perhaps there was indeed some ground for this conviction, but partly it was also a reaction of injured self-love. In Holland people knew too much about him, they had seen him in his smallnesses and feebleness. There he had been obliged to obey others, he who, above all things, wanted to be free. Distaste of the narrow-mindedness, the coarseness and intemperance, which he knew to prevail there, were summed up within him in a general condemnatory judgment of the Dutch character. Henceforth he spoke, as a rule, about Holland with a sort of apologetic contempt, I see that you are content with Dutch fame, he writes to his old friend William Hermans, who, like Cornelius Aurelius, had begun to devote his best forces to the history of his native country. In Holland the air is good for me, he writes elsewhere, but the extravagant carousels annoy me. Add to this the vulgar, uncultured character of the people, the violent contempt of study, no fruit of learning, the most egregious envy. And, excusing the imperfection of his juvenilia, he says, At that time I wrote not for Italians, but for Hollanders, that is to say, for the dullest ears. And in another place, Eloquence is demanded from a Dutchman, that is, from a more hopeless person, than a Boeotian. And again, If the story is not very witty, remember it is a Dutch story. No doubt false modesty had a share in such sayings. After 1496 he visited Holland only on hasty journeys. There is no evidence that after 1501 he ever set foot on Dutch soil. He dissuaded his own compatriots abroad from returning to Holland. Still, now and again, a cordial feeling of sympathy for his native country stirred within him just where he would have had an opportunity in explaining Marshall's Wurtis Batava in the Adagio, preventing his spleen, he availed himself of the chance of writing an eloquent panegyric on what was dearest to him in Holland. A country that I am always bound to honor and revere, as that which gave me birth. Would I might be a credit to it, just as on the other hand I need not be ashamed of it. Their reputed boorishness redounds to their honor. If a Batavian ear means a horror of Marshall's obscene jokes, I could wish that all Christians might have Dutch ears. When we consider their morals, no nation is more inclined to humanity and benevolence, less savage or cruel. Their mind is upright and void of cunning and all humbug. If they are somewhat sensual and excessive at meals, it results partly from their plentiful supply. Nowhere is import so easy and fertility so great what an extent of lush meadows, how many navigable rivers! Nowhere are so many towns crowded together within so small an area, not large towns indeed, but excellently governed. Their cleanliness is praised by everybody. Nowhere are such large numbers of moderately learned persons found, though extraordinary and exquisite erudition is rather rare. They were Erasmus's own most cherished ideals, which he here ascribes to his compatriots gentleness, sincerity, simplicity, purity. He sounds that note of love for Holland on other occasions. When speaking of lazy women, he adds, In France there are large numbers of them, but in Holland we find countless wives who by their industries support their idling and reveling husbands. And in the colloquy entitled The Shipwreck, the people who charitably take in the castaways are Hollanders. There is no more humane people than this, though surrounded by violent nations. In addressing English readers, it is perhaps not superfluous to point out once again that Erasmus, when speaking of Holland or using the epithet Batavian, refers to the county of Holland, 
which at present forms the provinces of North and South Holland, of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and stretches from the Vaden Islands to the estuaries of the Meuse. Even the nearest neighbors, such as Zealanders and Frisians, are not included in this appellation. But it is a different matter when Erasmus speaks of Patria, the fatherland, or of Nostras, a compatriot. In those days the national consciousness was just budding all over the Netherlands. A man still felt himself a Hollander, a Frisian, a Fleming, a Brabantine, in the first place, but the community of language and customs, and still more the strong political influence which, for nearly a century, had been exercised by the Burgundian dynasty, which had united most of these low countries under its sway, had cemented a feeling of solidarity which did not even halt at the linguistic frontier in Belgium. It was still a rather strong Burgundian patriotism, even after Habsburg had de facto occupied the place of Burgundy, than a strictly Netherlandish feeling of nationality. People liked, by using a heraldic symbol, to designate the Netherlander as the Lions. Erasmus, too, employs the term. In his works, we gradually see the narrower Hollandish patriotism gliding into the Burgundian Netherlandish. In the beginning, Patria with him still means Holland proper, but it soon meant the Netherlands. It is curious to trace how, by degrees, his feelings regarding Holland, made up of disgust and attachment, are transferred to the Low Countries in general. In my youth, he says in 1535, repeating himself, I did not write for Italians, but for Hollanders, the people of Brabant and Flemings. So they now all share the reputation of bluntness. To Levant is applied what formerly was said of Holland. There are too many compotations. Nothing can be done without a drinking bout. Nowhere, he repeatedly complains, is there so little sense of the bonnet literati. Nowhere is study so despised as in the Netherlands. And nowhere are there more cavaliers and slanderers. But also his affection has expanded. When Langolius of Brabant plays the Frenchman, Erasmus is vexed. I devoted nearly three days to Langolius. He was uncommonly pleasing, except only that he is too French, whereas it is well known that he is one of us. When Charles V has obtained the crown of Spain, Erasmus notes, A singular stroke of luck, but I pray it may also prove a blessing to the fatherland, and not only to the prince. When his strength was beginning to fail, he began to think more and more of returning to his native country. King Ferdinand invites me with large promises to come to Vienna, he writes from Baza, 1 October 1528. But nowhere would it please me better than to rest in Brabant. End of chapter 5. Recording by Trenton. Chapter 6 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huizinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 6 Theological Aspirations, 1501. At Tornham, 1501. The restoration of theology, now the aim of his life. He learns Greek. John Vitrier. In Chiridon Militis Christiani. The lean years continued with Erasmus. His livelihood remained uncertain, and he had no fixed abode. It is remarkable that, in spite of his precarious means of support, his movements were ever guided rather by the care for his health than for his sustenance, and his studies, rather by his burning desire to penetrate to the purest sources of knowledge than by his advantage. Repeatedly, the fear of the plague drives him on. In 1500, from Paris to Orleans, where he first lodges with Augustine Caminata, but when one of the latter's boarders falls ill, Erasmus moves. Perhaps it was the impressions dating from his youth at Deventer that made him so excessively afraid of the plague, which in those days raged practically without intermission. Faustus Anderlinus sent a servant to upbraid him in his name with cowardice. That would be an intolerable insult, Erasmus answers, if I were a Swiss soldier. But a poet's soul, loving peace and shady places, is proof against it. 
in the spring of fifteen o one he leaves paris once more for fear of the plague the frequent burials frighten me he writes to augustine he travelled first to holland where at stein he obtained leave to spend another year outside the monastery for the sake of study his friends would be ashamed if he returned after so many years of study without having acquired some authority at harlem he visited his friend william hermans then turned to the south once again to pay his respects to the bishop of cambrai probably at brussels thence he went to vere but found no opportunity to talk to his patroness in july fifteen o one he subsided into quietness at the castle of tornheim with his faithful friend bott in all his comings and goings he does not for a moment lose sight of his ideals of study since his return from england he is mastered by two desires to edit jerome the great father of the church and especially to learn greek thoroughly you understand how much this all matters to my fame nay to my preservation he writes from orleans toward the end of fifteen hundred to bot but indeed had erasmus been an ordinary fame and success hunter he might have had recourse to plenty of other expedients it was the ardent desire to penetrate to the source and to make others understand that impelled him even when he availed himself of these projects of study to raise a little money listen he writes to bot to what more i desire from you you must wrest a gift from the abbot of saint bertin you know the man's disposition invent some modest and plausible reason for begging tell him that i propose something grand namely to restore the whole of jerome however comprehensive he may be and spoiled mutilated entangled by the ignorance of divines and to reinsert the greek passages i venture to say i shall be able to lay open the antiquities and the style of jerome understood by no one as yet tell him that i shall want not a few books for the purpose and moreover the help of greeks and that therefore i require support in saying this Bottas, you will be telling no lies for i really mean to do all this he was indeed in a serious mood on this point as he was soon to prove to the world his conquest of greek was a veritable feat of heroism he had learned the simplest rudiments at deventer but these evidently amounted to very little in march fifteen hundred he writes to bot greek is nearly killing me but i have no time and i have no money to buy books or to take a master when augustine caminata wants his homer back which he had lent to him erasmus complains you deprive me of my sole consolation in my tedium for i so burn with love for this author though i cannot understand him that i feast my eyes and recreate my mind by looking at him was erasmus aware that in saying this he almost literally reproduced feelings which petrarch had expressed a hundred and fifty years before but he had already begun to study whether he had a master is not quite clear but it is probable he finds the language difficult at first then gradually he ventures to call himself a candidate in this language and he begins with more confidence to scatter greek quotations through his letters it occupies him night and day and he urges all his friends to procure greek books for him in the autumn of fifteen o two he declares that he can properly write all he wants in greek and that extempore he was not deceived in his expectation that greek would open his eyes to the right understanding of holy scripture three years of nearly uninterrupted study amply rewarded him for his trouble hebrew which he had also taken up he abandoned at that time in fifteen o four he made translations from the greek he employed it critically in his theological studies he taught it amongst others to william cop the french physician humanist a few years later he was to find little in italy to improve his proficiency in greek he was afterwards inclined to believe that he carried more of the two ancient languages to that country than he brought back nothing testifies more to the enthusiasm with which erasmus applied himself to greek than his zeal to make his best friends share in its blessings bot he decided should learn greek but bot had no time and latin appealed more to him when erasmus goes to harlem to visit william hermans it is to make him a greek scholar too he has brought a handbag full of books but he had only his trouble for his pains william did not take it all kindly to this study and erasmus was so disappointed that he not only considered his money and trouble thrown away but also thought he had lost a friend meanwhile he was still undecided where he should go in the near future to england to italy or back to paris 
in the end he made a fairly long stay as a guest from the autumn of fifteen o one until the following summer first at st omer with the prior of saint bertin and afterwards at the castle of courtebon not far off at st omer erasmus became acquainted with a man whose image he was afterwards to place beside that of colette as that of a true divine and of a good monk at the same time jean vetrier the warden of the franciscan monastery at st omer erasmus must have felt attracted to a man who was burdened with a condemnation pronounced by the sorbonne on account of his too frank expressions regarding the abuses of monastic life vitrier had not given up the life on that account but he devoted himself to reforming monasteries and convents having progressed from scholasticism to st paul he had formed a very liberal conception of christian life strongly opposed to practices and ceremonies this man without doubt considerably influenced the origin of one of erasmus's most celebrated and influential works the enchiridon militis christiani erasmus himself afterwards confessed that the enchiridon was born by chance he did not reflect that some outward circumstance is often made to serve an inward impulse the outward circumstance was that the castle of tornheim was frequented by a soldier a friend of bott a man of very dissolute conduct who behaved very badly towards his pious wife and who was moreover an uncultured and violent hater of priests for the rest he was of a kindly disposition and accepted erasmus from his hatred of divines the wife used her influence with bott to get erasmus to write something which might bring her husband to take an interest in religion erasmus complied with the request and jean vitrier concurred so cordially with the views expressed in these notes that erasmus afterwards elaborated them at louvain in 1504 they were published at antwerp by dirk mertens this was the outward genesis of the enchiridon but the inward cause was that sooner or later erasmus was bound to formulate his attitude toward the religious conduct of the life of his day and toward ceremonial and soulless conceptions of christian duty which were an eyesore to him in point of form the enchiridon is a manual for an illiterate soldier to attain to an attitude of mind worthy of christ as with a finger he will point out to him the shortest path of christ he assumes the friend to be weary of life at court a common theme of contemporary literature only for a few days does erasmus interrupt the work of his life the purification of theology to comply with his friend's request for instruction to keep up a soldierly style he chooses the title in chiridon the greek word that even in antiquity meant both a poignard and a manual the poignard of the militant christian he reminds him of the duty of watchfulness and enumerates the weapons of christ's militia self-knowledge is the beginning of wisdom the general rules of the christian conduct of life are followed by a number of remedies for particular sins and faults such is the outward frame but within this scope erasmus finds an opportunity for the first time to develop his theological program this program calls upon us to return to scripture it should be the endeavor of every christian to understand scripture in its purity and original meaning to that end he should prepare himself by the study of the ancients orators poets philosophers plato especially also the great fathers of the church jerome ambrose augustine will be found useful but not the large crowd of subsequent exegists the argument chiefly aims at subverting the conception of religion as a continual observance of ceremonies this is judaic ritualism and of no value it is better to understand a single verse of the psalms well by this means to deepen one's understanding of god and of oneself and to draw a moral and line of conduct from it than to read the whole psalter without attention if the ceremonies do not renew the soul they are valueless and hurtful many are wont to count how many masses they have heard every day and referring to them as something very important as though they owed christ nothing else they return to their former habits after leaving the church perhaps you sacrifice every day and yet you live for yourself you worship the saints you like to touch their relics do you want to earn peter and paul then copy the faith of the one and the charity of the other and you will have done more than if you had walked to rome ten times he does not reject formula and practices he does not want to shake the faith of the humble but he cannot suffer that christ is offered a cult made up of practices only and why is it the monks above all who contribute to the deterioration of faith i am ashamed to tell how superstitiously most of them observe certain petty ceremonies invented by puny human minds 
and not even for this purpose. How hatefully they want to force others to conform to them, how implicitly they trust them, how boldly they condemn others. Let Paul teach them true Christianity. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This word to the Galatians contains the doctrine of Christian liberty, which soon at the Reformation was to resound so loudly. Erasmus did not apply it here in a sense derogatory to the dogmatics of the Catholic Church, but still it is a fact that the Enchiridon prepared many minds to give up much that he still wanted to keep. The note of the Enchiridon is already what was to remain the note of Erasmus' life work. How revolting it is that in this world the substance and the shadow differ so, and that the world reverences those whom it should not reverence, that a hedge of infatuation, routine, and thoughtlessness prevents mankind from seeing things in their true proportions. He expresses it later in the phrase of folly and in the colloquies. It is not merely religious feeling, it is equally social feeling that inspired him. Under the heading, Opinions Worthy of a Christian, he laments the extremes of pride of class, national hostility, professional envy, and rivalry between religious orders, which keep men apart. Let everybody sincerely concern himself about his brother. Throwing dice cost you a thousand gold pieces in one night, and meanwhile some wretched girl, compelled by poverty, sold her modesty, and a soul is lost for which Christ gave his own. You say, What is that to me? I mind my own business according to my lights and yet you, holding such opinions, consider yourself a Christian who are not even a man. In the Enchiridon of the Militant Christian, Erasmus had, for the first time, said the things which he had most at heart, with fervor and indignation, with sincerity and courage. And yet one would hardly say that this booklet was born of an irresistible impulse of ardent piety. Erasmus treats it, as we have seen, as a trifle, composed at the request of a friend in a couple of days stolen from his studies though, strictly speaking, this only holds good of the first draft, which he elaborated afterwards. The chief object of his studies he had already conceived to be the restoration of theology. One day he will expound Paul, that the slanderers who consider it the height of piety to know nothing of bona litera may understand that we and our youth embraced the cultured literature of the ancients, and that we acquired a correct knowledge of the two languages, Greek and Latin, not without many vigils, not for the purpose of vainglory or childish satisfaction, but because, long before, we premeditated adorning the temple of the Lord, which some have too much desecrated by their ignorance and barbarism, according to our strength, with help from foreign parts, so that in noble minds the love of Holy Scripture may be kindled. Is this not still the humanist who speaks? We hear, moreover, the note of personal justification. It is sounded also in a letter to Colette, written towards the close of 1504, accompanying the edition of the Lubricationes, in which the Enchiridon was first published. I did not write the Enchiridon to parade my invention or eloquence, but only that I might correct the error of those whose religion is usually composed of more than Judaic ceremonies and observances of a material sort, and who neglect the things that conduce to piety. He adds, and this is typically humanistic, I have tried to give the reader a sort of art of piety, as others have written the theory of certain sciences. The art of piety. Erasmus might have been surprised had he known that another treatise, written more than sixty years before, by another canon of the Low Countries, would continue to appeal much longer and much more urgently to the world than his manual, the Imitatio Christi, by Thomas Akempis. The Enchiridon, collected with some other pieces into a volume of Lubricationes, did not meet with such a great and speedy success as had been bestowed upon the adagia. That Erasmus's speculations on true piety were considered too bold was certainly not the cause. They contained nothing antagonistic to the teachings of the Church, so that even at the time of the Counter-Reformation, when the Church had become highly suspicious of everything that Erasmus had written, the divines who drew up the Index Expurgatorius of his work found only a few passages in the Enchiridon to expunge. Moreover, Erasmus had inserted in the volume some writings of unsuspected Catholic tenor. For a long time it was in great repute, especially with theologians and monks. A famous preacher at Antwerp used to say that a sermon might be found in every page of the Enchiridon. But the book only obtained its great influence in wide cultured circles when, upheld by Erasmus' worldwide reputation, it was available in a number of translations English, Czech, German, Dutch, Spanish, and French. But then it began to fall under suspicion, 
for that was the time when Luther had unchained the great struggle. Now they have begun to nibble at the Enchiridon also, that used to be so popular with divines, Erasmus writes in 1526. For the rest, it was only two passages to which the Orthodox critics objected. End of chapter 6. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 7 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Wiesinger. Translated by Frederick Jan Hoffmann. Chapter 7. Years of Trouble, Louvain, Paris, England, 1502-1506, Death of Butt, 1502, First Day at Louvain, 1502-1504, Translations from the Greek, at Paris again, Vala's Annotations on the New Testament, Second Stay in England, 1505-1506, more patrons and friends, departure for Italy, 1506, Carmen Alpestri. Circumstances continued to remain unfavorable for Erasmus. This year, fortune has truly been raging violently against me, he writes in autumn of 1502. In the spring, his good friend, Bart, had died. It is a pity that no letters written by Erasmus directly after his bereavement have come down to us. We should be glad to have, for that faithful helper, a monument, in addition to that which Erasmus erected to his memory in the Antibarbari. Anna of Vere had remarried and, as a patroness, might henceforth be left out of account. In October 1502, Henry of Bergen passed away. I have commemorated the Bishop of Cambrai in three Latin epitaphs and a Greek one. They sent me but six guilders, that also in death he should remain true to himself. In Francis of Bersleden, Archbishop of Besançon, he lost at about the same time a prospective new patron. He still felt shut out from Paris, Cologne, and England by the danger of the plague. In the late summer of 1502, he went to Louvain, flung thither by the plague, he says. The University of Louvain, established in 1425 to wean the Netherlands in spiritual matters from Paris, was, at the beginning of the 16th century, one of the strongholds of theological tradition, which, however, did not prevent the progress of classical studies. How else should Adrian of Utrecht, later Pope but at that time Dean of St. Peter's and Professor of Theology, have forthwith undertaken to get him a professorship? Erasmus declined the offer, however, for certain reasons, he says. Considering his great distress, the reasons must have been cogent indeed. One of them which he mentioned is not very clear to us. I am here so near to Dutch tongues, which know how to hurt much, it is true, but have not learned to profit any one. His spirit of liberty and his ardent love of the studies to which he wanted to devote himself entirely were, no doubt, his chief reasons for declining. But he had to make a living. Life at Louvain was expensive and he had no regular earnings. He wrote some prefaces and dedicated to the Bishop of Arras, Chancellor of the University, the first translation from the Greek, some declamations by Libanius. When in the autumn of 1503, Philip Le Beau was expected back in the Netherlands from his journey to Spain, Erasmus wrote, with sighs of distaste, a panegyric to celebrate the safe return of the prince. It cost him much trouble. It occupies me day and night, says the man who composed with such incredible facility when his heart was in the work. What is harder than to write with aversion? What is more useless than to write something by which we unlearn good writing? 
it must be acknowledged that he really flattered as sparingly as possible. The practice was so repulsive to him that in his preface he roundly owned that, to tell the truth, this whole class of composition was not to his taste. At the end of 1504, Erasmus was back at Paris at last. Probably he had always meant to return and looked upon his stay at Louvain as a temporary exile. The circumstances under which he left Louvain are unknown to us, because of the almost total lack of letters of the year 1504. In any case, he hoped that at Paris he would sooner be able to attain his great end of devoting himself entirely to the study of theology. I cannot tell you, dear Collet, he writes towards the end of 1504, how I hurry on, with all sails set, to holy literature, how I dislike everything that keeps me back or retards me. But the disfavour of fortune, who always looks at me with the same face, has been the reason why I have not been able to get clear of those vexations. So I returned to France with the purpose, if I cannot solve them, at any rate of ridding myself of them in one way or another. After that, I shall devote myself, with all my heart, to the divine literary, to give up the remainder of my life to them." If only he can find the means to work for some months entirely for himself and disentangle himself from profane literature. Can Collet not find out for him how matters stand with regard to the proceeds of the hundred copies of the Adagia, which at one time he sent to England at his own expense? The liberty of a few months may be bought for little money. There is something heroic in Erasmus scorning to make money out of his facile talents and enviable knowledge of the humanities, daring indigence so as to be able to realize his shining ideal of restoring theology. It is remarkable that the same Italian humanist, who in his youth had been his guide and example on the road to pure Latinity and classic antiquity, Lorenzo Valla, by chance became his leader and an outpost in the field of critical theology. In the summer of 1504, hunting in the old library of the Premonstratensian Monastery or Park near Louvain, in no preserves is hunting a greater delight. He found a manuscript of Vala's annotations on the New Testament. It was a collection of critical notes on the text of the Gospels, the Epistles and Revelation that the text of the Vulgate was not stainless had been acknowledged by Rome itself as early as the 13th century. Monastic orders and individual divines had set themselves to correct it, but that purification had not amounted to much, in spite of Nicholas of Lyra's work in the 14th century. It was probably the falling in with Vala's annotations which led Erasmus, who was formerly more inspired with the resolution to edit Jerome and to comment upon Paul, he was to do both at a later date, to turn to the task of taking up the New Testament as a whole, in order to restore it in its purity. In March 1505 already, Josie Badius at Paris printed Vala's annotations for Erasmus as a sort of advertisement of what he himself one day hoped to achieve. It was a feat of courage. Erasmus did not conceal from himself that Vala, the humanist, had an ill name with divine, and that there should and that there would be an outcry about the intolerable temerity of the Homo Grammaticus, who, after having harassed all the discipline, did not scruple to assail holy literature with his petulant pen. It was another program much more explicit and defiant than the Enchiridion had been. Once more, it is not clear why and how Erasmus left Paris again for England in the autumn of 1505. He speaks of serious reasons and the advice of sensible people. He mentions one reason, lack of money. The reprint of the other year, published by John Philippi at Paris in 1505, had probably helped him through for the time being. The addition cannot have been to his taste, for he had been dissatisfied with his work and wanted to extend it by weaving his new Greek knowledge into it. From Holland, a warning voice had sounded, the voice of his superior and friend, Servatius, 
demanding an account of his departure from Paris. Evidently, his Dutch friends had still no confidence in Erasmus, his work, and his future. In many respects, that future appeared more favorable to him in England than it had seemed anywhere thus far. There he found the old friends, men of consideration and importance, Mountjoy, with whom on his arrival he stayed some months, Collet, and more. There he found some excellent Greek scholars, whose conversation promised to be profitable and amusing. Not Collet, who knew little Greek, but more Linacre, Grossin, Letmer, and Tunstall. He soon came in contact with some high ecclesiastics who were to be his friends and patrons. Richard Fox, Bishop of Winchester, John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, and William Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury. Soon, he would also find a friend whose congenial spirit and interests, to some extent, made up for the loss of but the Italian Andrew Ammonius of Lucca, and lastly, the king promised him an ecclesiastical benefice. It was not long before Erasmus was armed with a dispensation from Pope Julius II, dated 4th January 1506, cancelling the obstacles in the way of accepting an English benefice. Translations from Greek into Latin were for him an easy and speedy means to obtain favour and support, a dialogue by Lucian, followed by others, for Fox, the Hecuba, and the Iphigenia of Euripides for Warham. He now also thought of publishing his letters. Clearly, his relations with Holland were not yet satisfactory. Servatius did not reply to his letters. Erasmus ever felt hanging over him a menace to his career and his liberty embodied in the figure of that friend, to whom he was linked by so many silken ties, yonder in the monastery of Steyn, where his return was looked forward to, sooner or later, as a beacon light of Christendom. Did the prior know of the papal dispensation exempting Erasmus from the statutes and customs of the monastery of Stein in Holland, of the order of St. Augustine? Probably he did. On 1st April 1506, Erasmus writes to him, Here in London I am, it seems, greatly esteemed by the most eminent and erudite men of all England. The king has promised me a curacy. The visit of the prince necessitated the postponement of this business. He immediately adds, I am deliberating again how best to devote the remainder of my life. How much that will be, I do not know. Entirely to piety, to Christ. I see life, even when it is long, as evanescent and dwindling. I know that I am of a delicate constitution and that my strength has been encroached upon not a little, by study and also somewhat by misfortune. I see that no deliverance can be hoped from study, and that it seems as if we had to begin over again day after day. Therefore I have resolved, content with my mediocrity, especially now that I have learned as much Greek as suffices me, to apply myself to meditation about death and the training of my soul. I should have done so before and have husbanded the precious years when they were at their best. But though it is a tardy husbandry that people practice when only little remains at the bottom, we should be the most economical accordingly as the quantity and quality of what is left diminishes. Was it a fit of melancholy which made Erasmus write those words of repentance and renunciation? Was he surprised in the middle of the pursuit of his life's aim by the consciousness of the vanity of his endeavours, the consciousness, too, of a great fatigue? Is this the deepest foundation of Erasmus's being, which he reveals for a moment to his old and intimate friend? It may be doubted. The passage tallies very ill with the first sentences of the letter, which are altogether concerned with success and prospects. In the letter he wrote the next day also to Gouda and to a trusted friend, there is no trace of the mood. He is again thinking of his future. We do not notice that the tremendous zeal with which he continues his studies is relaxed for a moment, and there are other indications that towards Servatius, who knew him better than he could wish, and who, moreover, as prior of Stein, had a threatening power over him. 
he purposely demeaned himself as though he despised the world. Meanwhile, nothing came of the English prebend, but suddenly the occasion offered to which Erasmus had so often looked forward. The journey to Italy. The court physician of Henry the Seventh, Giovanni Battista Boerio of Genoa, was looking for a master to accompany his sons in their journey to the universities of Italy. Erasmus accepted the post, which charged him neither with the duties of tuition nor with attending to the young fellows, but only with supervising and guiding their studies. In the beginning of June 1506, he found himself on French soil once more. The party of travellers stayed at Paris, and Erasmus availed himself of the opportunity to have several of his works, which he had brought from England, printed at Paris. He was by now a well-known and favourite author, gladly welcomed by the old friends. He had been reputed dead, and made much of. Josie Badius printed all Erasmus offered him, the translations of Euripides and Lucian, a collection of epigrammata, a new but still unaltered edition of the Adagia. In August, the journey was continued. As he rode on horseback along the Alpine roads, the most important poem Erasmus has written, the echo of an abandoned pursuit, originated. He had been vexed about his travelling company, had abstained from conversing with them, and sought consolation in composing poetry. The result was the ode which he called Carmen Equestre Vel Boches Alpestre, about the inconveniences of old age, dedicated to his friend William Cobb. Erasmus was one of those who early feel old. He was not forty, and yet fancied himself across the threshold of old age. How quickly it had come! He looks back on the course of his life. He sees himself playing with nuts as a child, as a boy eager for study, as a youth engrossed in poetry and scholasticism, also in painting. He surveys his enormous erudition, his study of Greek, his aspiration to scholarly fame. In the midst of all this, old age has suddenly come. What remains to him? And again we hear the note of renunciation of the world and of devotion to Christ. Farewell jests and trifles, farewell philosophy and poetry. A pure heart full of Christ is all he desires henceforward. Here, in the stillness of the alpine landscape, there arose something more of Erasmus's deepest aspirations than in the lament to Servatius. But in this case, too, it is a stray element of his soul, not the strong impulse that gave direction and fullness to his life and with irresistible pressure urged him on to ever new studies. Footnotes 8. A. 189. Philip Le Beau who had unexpectedly come to England because of a storm, which obliged Mountjoy to do count service. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huizinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 8. In Italy, 1506-1509. At Turin, Erasmus received directly upon his arrival on 4 September 1506 the degree of Doctor of Theology. That he did not attach much value to the degree is easy to understand. He regarded it, however, as an official warrant of his competence as a writer on theological subjects, which would strengthen his position when assailed by the suspicion of his critics. He writes disdainfully about the title, even to his Dutch friends, who in former days had helped him on in his studies for the express purpose of obtaining the doctor's degree. As early as 1501, to Anna of Borselin he writes, Go to Italy and obtain the doctor's degree? Foolish projects, both of them. 
but one should conform to the customs of the times. Again to Servatius and Johannes Obrecht, half apologetically, he says, I have obtained the doctor's degree in theology, and that quite contrary to my intention, only because I was overcome by the prayers of friends. Bologna was now the destination of his journey, but when Erasmus arrived there, a war was in progress which forced him to retire to Florence for a time. Pope Julius II, allied with the French, at the head of an army, marched on Bologna to conquer it from the Bentivogli. This purpose was soon attained, and Bologna was a safe place to return to. On 11 November 1506, Erasmus witnessed the triumphal entry of the martial Pope. Of these days nothing but short, hasty letters of his have come down to us. They speak of unrest and rumors of war. There is nothing to show that he was impressed by the beauty of the Italy of the Renaissance. The scanty correspondence dating from his stay in Italy mentions neither architecture nor sculpture nor pictures. When much later he happened to remember his visit to the Chartreuse of Pavia, it is only to give an instance of useless waste and magnificence. Books alone seem to occupy and attract Erasmus in Italy. At Bologna, Erasmus served as a mentor to the young Boerius to the end of the year for which he had bound himself. It seemed a very long time to him. He could not stand any encroachment upon his liberty. He felt caught in the contract as in a net. The boys, it seems, were intelligent enough, if not so brilliant as Erasmus had seen them in his first joy. But with their private tutor, Clifton, whom he at first extolled to the sky, he was soon at loggerheads. At Bologna he experienced many vexations, for which his new relations with Paul Bombasius could only in part indemnify him. He worked there at an enlarged edition of his Adagia, which now, by the addition of the Greek ones, increased from eight hundred to some thousands of items. From Bologna, in October 1507, Erasmus addressed a letter to the famous Venetian printer Aldus Manutius, in which he requested him to publish anew the two translated dramas of Euripides, as the edition of Badius was out of print and too defective for his taste. What made Aldus attractive in his eyes was, no doubt, besides the fame of the business, though it was languishing at the time, the printer's beautiful type, those most magnificent letters, especially those very small ones. Erasmus was one of those true book lovers who pledge their heart to a type or a size of a book, not because of any artistic preference, but because of readableness and handiness, which to them are of the very greatest importance. What he asked of Aldous was a small book at a low price. Towards the end of the year their relations had gone so far that Erasmus gave up his projected journey to Rome for the time to remove to Venice, there personally to superintend the publication of his works. Now there was no longer merely the question of a little book of translations, but Aldous had declared himself willing to print the enormously increased collection of the Adagia. Beatus Renanus tells a story which, no doubt, he had heard from Erasmus himself. How Erasmus, on his arrival at Venice, had gone straight to the printing office and was kept waiting there for a long time. Aldus was correcting proofs and thought his visitor was one of those inquisitive people by whom he used to be pestered. When he turned out to be Erasmus, he welcomed him cordially and procured him board and lodging in the house of his father-in-law, Andrea Asolani. Fully eight months did Erasmus live there, in the environment which, in future, was to be his true element, the printing office. 
he was in a fever of hurried work about which he would often sigh but which after all was congenial to him the augmented collection of the adagia had not yet been made ready for the press at bologna with great temerity on my part erasmus himself testifies we began to work at the same time i to write aldus to print meanwhile the literary friends of the new academy whom he got to know at venice johannes lascaris baptista ignatius marcus musurus and the young jerome aleander with whom at asolani's he shared room and bed brought him new greek authors unprinted as yet furnishing fresh material for augmenting the adagia these were no inconsiderable additions plato in the original plutarch's lives and moralia pindar pausanias and others even people whom he did not know and who took an interest in his work brought new material to him amid the noise of the press-room erasmus to the surprise of his publisher sat and wrote usually from memory so busily occupied that as he picturesquely expressed it he had no time to scratch his ears he was lord and master of the printing office a special corrector had been assigned to him he made his textual changes in the last impression aldus also read the proofs why asked erasmus because i am studying at the same time was the reply meanwhile erasmus suffered from the first attack of his tormenting nephrolithic malady he ascribed it to the food he got at asolani's and later took refuge by painting that boarding-house and its landlord in very spiteful colors in the colloquies when in september fifteen o eight the edition of the adagia was ready aldus wanted erasmus to remain in order to write more for him till december he continued to work at venice on editions of plautus terence and seneca's tragedies visions of joint labor to publish all that classic antiquity still held in the way of hidden treasures together with hebrew and chaldean stores floated before his mind erasmus belonged to the generation which had grown up together with the youthful art of printing to the world of those days it was still like a newly acquired organ people felt rich powerful happy in the possession of this almost divine implement the figure of erasmus and his oeuvre were only rendered possible by the art of printing he was its glorious triumph and equally in a sense its victim what would erasmus have been without the printing press to broadcast the ancient documents to purify and restore them was his life's passion the certainty that the printed book places exactly the same text in the hands of thousands of readers was to him a consolation that former generations had lacked erasmus is one of the first who after his name as an author was established worked directly and continually for the press it was his strength but also his weakness it enabled him to exercise an immediate influence on the reading public of europe such as had emanated from none before him to become a focus of culture in the full sense of the word an intellectual central station a touchstone of the spirit of the time imagine for a moment what it would have meant if a still greater mind than his say cardinal nicholas of cousin that universal spirit who had helped in nursing the art of printing in its earliest infancy could have availed himself of the art as it was placed at the disposal of erasmus the dangerous aspect of this situation was that printing enabled erasmus having once become a centre and an authority to address the world at large immediately about all that occurred to him 
much of his later mental labor is after all really but repetition ruminating digression unnecessary vindication from assaults to which his greatness alone would have been a sufficient answer futilities which he might have better left alone much of this work written directly for the press is journalism at bottom and we do erasmus an injustice by applying to it the tests of lasting excellence the consciousness that we can reach the whole world at once with our writings is a stimulant which unwittingly influences our mode of expression a luxury that only the highest spirits can bear with impunity the link between Erasmus and book printing was Latin. Without his incomparable Latinity, his position as an author would have been impossible. The art of printing undoubtedly furthered the use of Latin. It was the Latin publications which, in those days, promised success and a large sale for a publisher, and established his reputation, for they were broadcast all over the world. The leading publishers were themselves scholars, filled with enthusiasm for humanism. Cultured and well-to-do people acted as proofreaders to printers, such as Peter Gillis, the friend of Erasmus and Moore, the town clerk of Antwerp, who corrected proof sheets for Dirk Mertens. The great printing offices were, in a local sense, too, the foci of intellectual intercourse. The fact that England had lagged behind thus far in the evolution of the art of printing contributed not a little, no doubt, to prevent Erasmus from settling there, where so many ties held and so many advantages allured him. To find a permanent place of residence was, indeed, and apart from this fact, very hard for him. Towards the end of 1508, he accepted the post of tutor in rhetorics to the young Alexander Stuart, a natural son of James IV of Scotland, and already, in spite of his youth, Archbishop of St. Andrews, now a student at Padua. The danger of war soon drove them from Upper Italy to Siena. Here Erasmus obtained leave to visit Rome. He arrived there early in 1509, no longer an unknown canon from the northern regions, but a celebrated and honored author. All the charms of the Eternal City lay open to him, and he must have felt keenly gratified by the consideration and courtesy with which cardinals and prelates, such as Giovanni de' Medici, afterwards Leo X, Domenico Grimani, Riario, and others, treated him. It seems that he was even offered some post in the Curia but he had to return to his youthful archbishop with whom he thereupon visited rome again incognito and afterwards travelled in the neighbourhood of naples he inspected the cave of the sibylla of cume but what it meant to him we do not know this entire period following his departure from padua and all that follows till the spring of fifteen eleven in certain respects, the most important part of his life remains unrecorded in a single letter that has come down to us. Here and there he has occasionally, and at a much later date, touched upon some impressions of Rome, but the whole remains vague and dim. It is the incubation period of the praise of folly that is thus obscured from view. On 21 April 1509, King Henry the Seventh of England died. His successor was the young prince whom Erasmus had saluted at Eltham in 1499, to whom he had dedicated his poem in praise of Great Britain, and who, during his stay at Bologna, had distinguished him by a Latin letter as creditable to Erasmus as to the fifteen-year-old royal Latinist. 
if ever the chance of obtaining a patron seemed favourable it was now when this promising lover of letters ascended the throne as henry the eighth lord mountjoy erasmus's most faithful mycenas thought so too and pointed out the fact to him in a letter of twenty seven may fifteen o nine it was a pleasure to see he wrote how vigorous how upright and just how zealous in the cause of literature and men of letters was the conduct of the youthful prince mountjoy or ammonius who probably drew up the flowery document for him was exultant a laughing sky and tears of joy are the themes of the letter evidently however erasmus himself had on his side already sounded mountjoy as to his chances as soon as the tidings of henry the seventh's death became known at rome not without lamentations about cares and weakened health the archbishop of canterbury mountjoy was able to apprise erasmus is not only continually engrossed in your adagia and praises you to the skies but he also promises you a benefice on your return and sends you five pounds for travelling expenses which sum was doubled by mountjoy we do not know whether erasmus really hesitated before he reached his decision cardinal grimani he asserts tried to hold him back but in vain for in july fifteen o nine he left rome and italy never to return as he crossed the alps for the second time not on the french side now but across the splugen through switzerland his genius touched him again as had happened in those high regions three years before on the road to italy but this time it was not in the guise of the latin muse who then drew from him such artful and pathetic poetical meditations about his past life and pious vows for the future it was something much more subtle and grand the praise of folly end of chapter eight chapter nine of erasmus and the age of reformation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita boutros erasmus and the age of reformation by johann wisinga translated by frederick jan hopman chapter nine the praise of folly while he rode over the mountain passes erasmus's restless spirit now unfettered for some days by set tasks occupied itself with everything he had studied and read in the last few years and with everything he had seen what ambition what self-deception what pride and conceit filled the world he thought of thomas more whom he was now to see again that most witty and wise of all his friends with that curious name moros the greek word for a fool which so ill became his personality anticipating the gay jests which moore's conversation promised there grew in his mind that masterpiece of humour and wise irony morii enconium the praise of folly the world as the scene of universal folly folly as the indispensable element making life and society possible and all this put into the mouth of stultitia folly itself true antitype of minerva who in a panegyric on her own power and usefulness praises herself as to form it is a declamatio such as he had translated from the greek of libanius as to the spirit a revival of lucian whose gallus translated by him three years before may have suggested the theme it must have been in the incomparably lucid moments of that brilliant intellect 
all the particulars of classic reading which the year before he worked up in the new edition of the adagia were still at his immediate disposal in that retentive and capacious memory reflecting at his ease on all that wisdom of the ancients he secreted the juices required for his expostulation he arrived in london took up his abode in moore's house in bucklesbury and there tortured by nephritic pains he wrote down in a few days without having his books with him the perfect work of art that must have been ready in his mind stultitia was truly born in the manner of her serious sister pallas as to form and imagery the moria is faultless the product of the inspired moments of creative impulse the figure of an orator confronting her public is sustained to the last in a masterly way we see the faces of the auditors light up with glee when folly appears in the pulpit we hear the applause interrupting her words there is a wealth of fancy coupled with so much soberness of line and color such reserve that the whole presents a perfect instance of that harmony which is the essence of renaissance expression there is no exuberance in spite of the multiplicity of matter and thought but a temperateness a smoothness an airiness and clearness which are as gladdening as they are relaxing in order perfectly to realize the artistic perfection of erasmus's book we should compare it with rabelais without me says folly the world cannot exist for a moment for is not all that is done at all among mortals full of folly is it not performed by fools and for fools no society no cohabitation can be pleasant or lasting without folly so much so that a people could not stand its prince nor the master his man nor the maid her mistress nor the tutor his pupil nor the friend his friend nor the wife her husband for a moment longer if they did not now and then err together now flatter each other now sensibly conniving at things now smearing themselves with some honey of folly in that sentence the summary of the loss is contained folly here is worldly wisdom resignation and lenient judgment he who pulls off the masks in the comedy of life is ejected what is the whole life of mortals but a sort of play in which each actor appears on the boards in his specific mask and acts his part till the stage manager calls him off he acts wrongly who does not adapt himself to existing conditions and demands that the game shall be a game no longer it is the part of the truly sensible to mix with all people either conniving readily at their folly or affably erring like themselves and the necessary driving power of all human action is folotia folly's own sister self-love he who does not please himself effects little take away that condiment of life and the word of the orator cools the poet is laughed at the artist perishes with his art folly in the garb of pride of vanity of vain glory is the hidden spring of all that is considered high and great in this world the state with its posts of honor patriotism and national pride the stateliness of ceremonies the delusion of caste and nobility what is it but folly war the most foolish thing of all is the origin of all heroism what prompted the deciuses what courteous to sacrifice themselves vainglory it is this folly which produces states through her empires religion law courts exist this is bolder and more chilling than machiavelli more detached than montaigne but erasmus will not have it credited to him 
it is folly who speaks he purposely makes us tread the round of the circulus vitiosus as in the old saw a cretan said all cretans are liars wisdom is to folly as reason is to passion and there is much more passion than reason in the world that which keeps the world going the fount of life is folly for what else is love why do people marry if not out of folly which sees no objections all enjoyment and amusement is only a condiment of folly when a wise man wishes to become a father he has first to play the fool for what is more foolish than the game of procreation unperceived the orator has incorporated here with folly all that is vitality and the courage of life folly is spontaneous energy that no one can do without he who is perfectly sensible and serious cannot live the more people get away from me stultitia the less they live why do we kiss and cuddle little children if not because they are still so delightfully foolish and what else makes youth so elegant now look at the truly serious and sensible they are awkward at everything at meal-time at a dance in playing in social intercourse if they have to buy or to contract things are sure to go wrong quintilian says that stage fright bespeaks the intelligent orator who knows his faults right but does not then quintilian confess openly that wisdom is an impediment to good execution and has not stultitia the right to claim prudence for herself if the wise out of shame out of bashfulness undertake nothing in circumstances where fools pluckily set to work here erasmus goes to the root of the matter in a psychological sense indeed the consciousness of falling short in achievement is the brake-clogging action is the great inertia retarding the progress of the world did he know himself for one who is awkward when not bending over his books but confronting men and affairs folly is gaiety and light-heartedness indispensable to happiness the man of mere reason without passion is a stone image blunt and without any human feeling a spectre or monster from whom all fly deaf to all natural emotions susceptible neither to love nor compassion nothing escapes him in nothing he errs he sees through everything he weighs everything accurately he forgives nothing he is only satisfied with himself he alone is healthy he alone is king he alone is free it is the hideous figure of the doctrinaire which erasmus is thinking of which state he exclaims would desire such an absolutely wise man for a magistrate he who devotes himself to tasting all the bitterness of life with wise insight would forthwith deprive himself of life only folly is a remedy to err to be mistaken to be ignorant is to be human how much better it is in marriage to be blind to a wife's shortcomings than to make away with oneself out of jealousy and to fill the world with tragedy adulation is virtue there is no cordial devotion without a little adulation it is the soul of eloquence of medicine and poetry it is the honey and the sweetness of all human customs again a series of valuable social qualities is slyly incorporated with folly benevolence kindness inclination to approve and to admire but especially to approve of oneself there is no pleasing others without beginning by flattering ourselves a little and approving of ourselves 
what would the world be if every one was not proud of his standing his calling so that no person would change places with another in point of good appearance of fancy of good family of landed property humbug is the right thing why should any one desire true erudition the more incompetent a man the pleasanter his life is and the more he is admired look at professors poets orators man's mind is so made that he is more impressed by lies than by the truth go to church if the priest deals with serious subjects the whole congregation is dozing yawning feeling bored but when he begins to tell some cock-and-bull story they awake sit up and hang on his lips to be deceived philosophers say is a misfortune but not to be deceived is a superlative misfortune if it is human to err why should a man be called unhappy because he errs since he was so born and made and it is the fate of all do we pity a man because he cannot fly or does not walk on four legs we might as well call the horse unhappy because it does not learn grammar or eat cakes no creature is unhappy if it lives according to its nature the sciences were invented to our utmost destruction far from conducing to our happiness they are even in its way though for its sake they are supposed to have been invented by the agency of evil demons they have stolen into human life with the other pests for did not the simple-minded people of the golden age live happily unprovided with any science only led by nature and instinct what did they want grammar for when all spoke the same language why have dialectics when there were no quarrels and no differences of opinion why jurisprudence when there were no bad morals from which good laws sprang they were too religious to investigate with impious curiosity the secrets of nature the size motions influence of the stars the hidden cause of things it is the old idea which germinated in antiquity here lightly touched upon by erasmus afterwards proclaimed by rousseau in bitter earnest civilization is a plague wisdom is misfortune but self-conceit is happiness grammarians who wield the sceptre of wisdom schoolmasters that is would be the most wretched of all people if i folly did not mitigate the discomforts of their miserable calling by a sort of sweet frenzy but what holds good of schoolmasters also holds good of poets orators authors for them too all happiness merely consists in vanity and delusion the lawyers are no better off and after them come the philosophers next there is a numerous procession of clergy divines monks bishops cardinals popes only interrupted by princes and courtiers in the chapters which review these offices and callings satire has shifted its ground a little throughout the work two themes are intertwined that of salutary folly which is true wisdom and that of deluded wisdom which is pure folly as they are both put into the mouth of folly we should have to invert them both to get truth if folly were not wisdom now it is clear that the first is the principal theme erasmus starts from it and he returns to it only in the middle as he reviews human accomplishments and dignities in their universal foolishness the second theme predominates and the book becomes an ordinary satire on human folly of which there are many though few are so delicate but in the other parts it is something far deeper occasionally the satire runs somewhat off the line when stultitia directly censures what erasmus wishes to censure for instance indulgences silly belief in wonders 
selfish worship of the saints or gamblers whom she folly ought to praise or the spirit of systematizing and leveling and the jealousy of the monks for contemporary readers the importance of the laws stultitiae was to a great extent in the direct satire its lasting value is in those passages where we truly grant that folly is wisdom and the reverse erasmus knows the aloofness of the ground of all things all consistent thinking out of the dogmas of faith leads to absurdity only look at the theological quiddities of effete scholasticism the apostles would not have understood them in the eyes of latter-day divines they would have been fools holy scripture itself sides with folly the foolishness of god is wiser than men says st paul but god hath chosen the foolish things of the world it pleased god by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe christ loved the simple-minded and the ignorant children women poor fishermen nay even such animals as are farthest removed from vulpine cunning the ass which he wished to ride the dove the lamb the sheep here there is a great deal behind the seemingly light jest christian religion seems in general to have some affinity with a certain sort of folly was it not thought the apostles were full of new wine and did not the judge say paul thou art beside thyself when are we beside ourselves when the spirit breaks its fetters and tries to escape from its prison and aspires to liberty that is madness but it is also otherworldliness and the highest wisdom true happiness is in selflessness in the furor of lovers whom plato calls happiest of all the more absolute love is the greater and more rapturous is the frenzy heavenly bliss itself is the greatest insanity truly pious people enjoy its shadow on earth already in their meditations here stultitia breaks off her discourse apologizing in a few words in case she may have been too petulant or talkative and leaves the pulpit so farewell applaud live happily and drink moria's illustrious initiates it was an unrivalled feat of art even in these last chapters neither to lose the light comical touch nor to lapse into undisguised profanation it was only feasible by veritable dancing on the tightrope of sophistry in the moria erasmus is all the time hovering on the brink of profound truths but what a boon it was still granted to those times to be able to treat of all this in a vein of pleasantry for this should be impressed upon our minds that the morii enconium is a true gay jest the laugh is more delicate but no less hearty than rabelais Alite, plaudite, vivite, bibite. All common people abound to such a degree, and everywhere, in so many forms of folly, that a thousand democratuses would be insufficient to laugh at them all, and they would require another democratus to laugh at them. How could one take the Moria too seriously, when even Moore's Utopia, which is a true companion piece to it, and makes such a grave impression on us, is treated by its author and Erasmus as a mere jest? There is a place where the loss seems to touch both Moore and Rabelais, the place where Stultitia speaks of her father Plutus, the god of wealth, at whose beck all things are turned topsy-turvy, according to whose will all human affairs are regulated, war and peace, government and council, justice and treaties. He has begotten her on the nymph youth, not a senile, purblind Plutus, but a fresh god, warm with youth and nectar, like another Gargantua. 
the figure of folly of gigantic size looms large in the period of the renaissance she wears a fool's cap and bells people laughed loudly and with unconcern at all that was foolish without discriminating between species of folly it is remarkable that even in the laws delicate as it is the author does not distinguish between the unwise or the silly between fools and lunatics holbein illustrating erasmus knows but of one representation of a fool with a staff and ass's ears erasmus speaks without clear transition now of foolish persons and now of real lunatics they are happiest of all he makes stultitia say they are not frightened by spectres and apparitions they are not tortured by the fear of impending calamities Everywhere they bring mirth, jests, frolic, and laughter. Evidently he here means harmless imbeciles, who indeed were often used as jesters. This identification of denseness and insanity is kept up, however, like the confusion of the comic and the simply ridiculous, and all this is well calculated to make us feel how wide the gap has already become that separates us from Erasmus. In later years he always spoke slightingly of his Moria. He considered it so unimportant, he says, as to be unworthy of publication, yet no work of his had been received with such applause. It was a trifle, and not at all in keeping with his character. Moore had made him write it as if a camel were made to dance. But these disparaging utterances were not without a secondary purpose. The Moria had not brought him only success and pleasure. The exceedingly susceptible age in which he lived had taken the satire in very bad part, where it seemed to glance at offices and orders, although in his preface he had tried to safeguard himself from the reproach of irreverence. His airy play with the texts of Holy Scripture had been too venturesome for many. His friend Martin Van Dorp abraded him with having made a mock of eternal life. Erasmus did what he could to convince evil thinkers that the purpose of the Moria was no other than to exhort people to be virtuous. In affirming this, he did his work injustice. It was much more than that. But in 1515 he was no longer what he had been in 1509. Repeatedly he had been obliged to defend his most witty work, had he known that it would offend he might have kept it back he writes in fifteen seventeen to an acquaintance at louvain even towards the end of his life he warded off the insinuations of alberto pio of carpi in a lengthy expostulation erasmus made no further ventures in the genre of the praise of folly one might consider the treatise lingua which he published in fifteen twenty five as an attempt to make a companion piece to the moria the book is called of the use and abuse of the tongue in the opening pages there is something that reminds us of the style of the laws but it lacks all the charm both of form and of thought should one pity Erasmus because of all his publications, collected in ten folio volumes, only the praise of folly has remained a really popular book? It is, apart from the colloquies, perhaps the only one of his works that is still read for its own sake. The rest is now only studied from a historical point of view, for the sake of becoming acquainted with his person or his times it seems to me that perfect justice has been done in this case the praise of folly is his best work he wrote other books more erudite some more pious some perhaps of equal or greater influence on his time but each has had its day moriae and conium alone was to be immortal 
for only when humour illuminated that mind did it become truly profound in the praise of folly erasmus gave something that no one else could have given to the world End of chapter 9chapter 10 of erasmus and the age of reformation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle eaton erasmus and the age of reformation by johann hutzinger translated by frederick jan hopman Chapter Ten, Third Stay in England, fifteen o nine to fifteen fourteen. Third Stay in England, fifteen o nine to fourteen. No information about two years of Erasmus's life, fifteen o nine summer till fifteen eleven spring. Poverty, Erasmus at Cambridge, relations with Badius, the Paris publisher. A mistake profitable to Johannes Froben at Basel. Erasmus leaves England, 1514. Julius Exclusus, Epistle Against War. From the moment when Erasmus, back from Italy in the early summer of 1509, is hidden from view in the House of Moor, to write the praise of folly, until nearly two years later, when he comes to view again on the road to Paris, to have the book printed by Gilet Gourmand, every trace of his life has been obliterated. Of the letters which during that period he wrote and received, not a single one has been preserved. Perhaps it was the happiest time of his life, for it was partly spent with his tried patron, Mountjoy, and also in the house of Moore, in that noble and witty circle, which to Erasmus appeared ideal. The house was also frequented by the friend whom Erasmus had made during his former sojourn in England, and whose mind was perhaps more congenial to him than any other, Andrew Ammonius. It is not improbable that during these months he was able to work without interruption at the studies to which he was irresistibly attracted. Without cares as to the immediate future, and not yet burdened by excessive renown, which afterwards was to cause him as much trouble and loss as joy. The future was still uncertain. As soon as he no longer enjoys Moore's hospitality, the difficulties and complaints recommence. Continual poverty, uncertainty and dependence were extraordinarily galling to a mind requiring above all things liberty. At Paris he charged Badius with a new revised edition of the Adagia, though the Aldine might still be had there at a moderate price. The Laius, which had just appeared at Gourmands, was reprinted at Strasbourg as early as 1511, with a courteous letter by Jacob Wimp Felling to Erasmus, but evidently without his being consulted in the matter. By the time he was back in England, had been laid up in London with a bad attack of a sweating sickness, and thence had gone to Queen's College, Cambridge, where he had resided before. From Cambridge he writes to Colette, 24th of August, 1511, in a vein of comical despair. The journey from London had been disastrous. A lame horse, no victuals for the road, rain and thunder. But I am almost pleased at this. I see the track of Christian poverty. A chance to make some money he does not see. He will be obliged to spend everything he can wrest from his masonasis. He, born under a wrathful mercury. This may sound somewhat gloomier than it was meant, but a few weeks later he writes again. Oh, this begging, you laugh at me, I know, but I hate myself for it and am fully determined either to obtain some fortune which will relieve me from cringing, or to imitate Diogenes altogether. This refers to a dedication of a translation of Basilius's commentaries on Isaiah to John Fisher, 
the Bishop of Rochester. Colette, who had never known pecuniary cares himself, did not well understand these sallies of Erasmus. He replies to them with delicate irony and covert rebuke, which Erasmus, in his turn, pretends not to understand. He was now in want in the midst of plenty. Simul et in media copia, et in summa in opia. That is to say, he was engaged in preparing for Badius's press, the De Copia Verborum ap Rerum. Formerly begun at Paris, it was dedicated to Colette. I ask you, who can be more impudent or abject than I, who for such a long time already have been openly begging in England? Writing to Ammonius, he bitterly regrets having left Rome and Italy. Our prosperity had smiled upon him there. In the same way, he would afterwards lament that he had not permanently established himself in England. If he had only embraced the opportunity, he thinks, was not Erasmus rather one of those people whom good fortune cannot help? He remained in trouble, and his tone grows more bitter. I am preparing some bait against the 1st of January, though it is pretty sure to be in vain, he writes to Ammonius, referring to new translations of Lucian and Plutarch. At Cambridge, Erasmus lectured on divinity and Greek, but it brought him little success and still less profit. The long wished for prebend, indeed, had at last been given him in the form of the rectory of Aldington in Kent, to which Archbishop William Warham, his patron, appointed him in 1512. Instead of residing, he was allowed to draw a pension of £20 a year. The Archbishop affirms explicitly that, contrary to his custom, he had granted this favour to Erasmus, because he, a light of learning in Latin and Greek literature, had, out of love for England, disdained to live in Italy, France or Germany, in order to pass the rest of his life here with his friends. We see how nations already begin to vie with each other for the honour of sheltering Erasmus. Relief from all cares the post did not bring. Intercourse and correspondence with Colette was a little soured under the light veil of jests and kindness by his constant need of money. Seeking new resources by undertaking new labours, or preparing new editions of his old books, remained a hard necessity for Erasmus. The great works upon which he had set his heart, and to which he had given all his energies at Cambridge, held out no promise of immediate profit. His serious theological labours ranked above all others, and in these hard years, he devoted his best strength to preparation for the great edition of Jerome's works and emendation of the text of the New Testament, a task inspired, encouraged and promoted by Colette. For his living, other books had to serve. He had a sufficient number now, and the printers were eager enough about them, though the profit which the author made by them was not large. After leaving Aldus at Venice, Erasmus had returned to the publisher, who had printed for him as early as 1505. Jos Badius of Brabant, who at Paris had established the Ascension Press, called after his native place, Ash, and who, a scholar himself, rivalled Aldus in point of the accuracy of his editions of the classics. At the time when Erasmus took the Moria to Gourmand at Paris, he had charged Badius with a new edition, still to be revised, of the Adagia. Why the Moria was published by another we cannot tell. Perhaps Badius did not like it at first. From the Adagia he promised himself the more profit, but that was a long work, the alterations and preface of which he was still waiting for Erasmus to send. He felt very sure of his ground, for everyone knew that he, Badius, was preparing the new edition. Yet a rumour reached him that in Germany the Aldine edition was being reprinted, so there was some hurry to finish it. 
he wrote to Erasmus in May 1512. Badius, meanwhile, had much more work of Erasmus in hand or on approval. The Copia, which shortly afterwards was published by him, the Moria, of which at the same time a new edition, the fifth, already had appeared, the dialogues by Lucian, the Euripides and Seneca translations which were to follow. He hoped to add Jerome's letters to these, for the Adagia they had agreed upon a copy fee of fifteen guilders. For Jerome's letters, Badius was willing to give the same sum and as much again for the rest of the consignment. Ah, you will say, what a very small sum. I own that by no remuneration could your genius, industry, knowledge and labour be requited, but the gods will requite you and your own virtue will be the finest reward. You have already deserved exceedingly well of Greek and Roman literature. You will in this same way deserve well of sacred and divine, and you will help your little Badius, who has a numerous family and no earnings besides his daily trade. Erasmus must have smiled ruefully on receiving Badius's letter, but he accepted the proposal readily. He promised to prepare everything for the press, and on the 5th of January 1513, he finished in London the preface to the revised Adagia, for which Badius was waiting. But then something happened. An agent who acted as a mediator with authors for several publishers in Germany and France one Francis Berkman of Cologne, took the revised copy of the Adagia with the preface entrusted to him by Erasmus to hand over to Badius, not to Paris, but to Basel, to Johannes Froben, who had just without Erasmus's leave reprinted the Venetian edition. Erasmus pretended to be indignant at this mistake or perfidy, but it is only too clear that he did not regret it. Six months later he betook himself with bag and baggage to Basel, to enter with that same Froben into those most cordial relations by which their names are united. Beatus Renanus afterwards made no secret of the fact that a connection with the house of Froben, then still called Amabac and Froben, had seemed attractive to Erasmus ever since he had heard of the Adagia being reprinted. Without conclusive proofs of his complicity, we do not like to accuse Erasmus of perfidy towards Badius, though his attitude is curious, to say the least. But we do want to commemorate the dignified tone in which Badius, who held strict notions, as those times went, about copyright, replied when Berkman afterwards had come to offer him a sort of explanation of the case. He declares himself satisfied though Erasmus had, since that time, caused him losses in more ways, amongst others by printing a new edition of the Copia at Strasbourg. If, however, it is agreeable to your interests and honour, I shall suffer it, and that with equanimity. Their relations were not broken off. In all this we should not lose sight of the fact that publishing at that time was yet a quite new commercial phenomenon and that new commercial forms and relations of trade are wont to be characterised by uncertainty, confusion and lack of established business morals. The stay at Cambridge gradually became irksome to Erasmus. For some months already, he writes to Ammonius in November 1513, We have been leading a true snail's life, staying at home and plodding. It is very lonely here. Most people have gone for fear of the plague, but even when they are all here, it is lonely. The cost of sustenance is unbearable, and he makes no money at all. If he does not succeed that winter in making a nest for himself, he is resolved to fly away. He does not know where, if to no other end, to die elsewhere. Added to the stress of circumstances, the plague, reappearing again and again, and attacks of his kidney trouble, there came the state of war, which depressed and alarmed Erasmus. In the spring of 1513, the English raid on France, long prepared, took place. In cooperation with Maximilian's army, 
the English had beaten the French near Guinea Gate and compelled Therouan to surrender and afterwards Tournay. Meanwhile, the Scotch invaded England to be decisively beaten near Flodden. Their king, James IV, perished together with his natural son. Erasmus's pupil and travelling companion in Italy, Alexander, Archbishop of St Andrews. Crowned with martial fame, Henry VIII returned in November to meet his Parliament. Erasmus did not share the universal joy and enthusiastic admiration. We are circumscribed here by the plague, threatened by robbers. We drink wine of the worst, because there is no import from France. But I owe triumphe, we are the conquerors of the world. His deep aversion to the clamour of war and all it represented stimulated Erasmus's satirical faculties. It is true that he flattered the English national pride by an epigram on the route of the French near Guinea Gate, but soon he went deeper. He remembered how war had impeded his movements in Italy, how the entry of the Pope conqueror Julius II into Bologna had outraged his feelings. The high priest Julius wages war, conquers triumphs and truly plays the part of Julius Caesar. He had written then. Pope Julius, he thought, had been the cause of all the wars spreading more and more over Europe. Now the Pope had died in the beginning of the year 1513. And in the deepest secrecy between his work on the New Testament and Jerome, Erasmus took revenge on the martial Pope for the misery of the times by writing the masterly satire entitled Julius Exclusus in which the Pope appears in all his glory before the gate of the heavenly paradise to please his cause and find himself excluded. The theme was not new to him, for had he not made something similar in the witty Cain fable, by which at one time he had cheered a dinner party at Oxford, but that was an innocent jest to which his pious fellow guests had listened with pleasure. To the satire about the defunct Pope, Many would, no doubt, also gladly listen, but Erasmus had to be careful about it. The folly of all the world might be ridiculed, but not the worldly propensities of the recently deceased Pope. Therefore, though he helped in circulating copies of the manuscript, Erasmus did his utmost for the rest of his life to preserve its anonymity, and when it was universally known and had appeared in print, and he was presumed to be the author, he always cautiously denied the fact. Although he was careful to use such terms as to avoid a formal denial. The first edition of the Julius was published at Basel, not by Froben, Erasmus's ordinary publisher, but by Crotander, probably in the year 1518. Erasmus's need of protesting against warfare had not been satisfied by writing the Julius. In March 1514, no longer at Cambridge but in London, he wrote a letter to his former patron, the abbot of St. Burton, Anthony of Bergen, in which he enlarges upon the folly of waging war. Would that a Christian peace were concluded between Christian princes. Perhaps the abbot might contribute to that consummation through his influence with the youthful Charles V, and especially with his grandfather Maximilian. Erasmus states quite frankly that the war has suddenly changed the spirit of England. He would like to return to his native country, if the prince would procure him the means to live there in peace. It is a remarkable fact, and of true Erasmian naivety, that he cannot help mixing up his personal interests with his sincere indignation at the atrocities disgracing a man and a Christian. The war has suddenly altered the spirit of this island. The cost of living rises every day, and generosity decreases. Through lack of wine I nearly perished by gravel, contracted by taking bad stuff. We are confined in this island more than ever, so that even letters are not carried abroad. This was the first of Erasmus's anti-war writings. 
he expanded it into the adage Dulce Bellum in Expertis, which was inserted into the Adagia edition of 1515, published by Froben and afterwards also printed separately. Hereafter we shall follow up this line of Erasmus's ideas as a whole. Though the summer of 1514 was to bring peace between England and France, Erasmus had now definitely made up his mind to leave England. He sent his trunks to Antwerp, to his friend Peter Gilles, and prepared to go to the Netherlands, after a short visit to Mountjoy at the Castle of Hams, near Calais. Shortly before his departure from London, he had a curious interview with a papal diplomat, working in the cause of peace. Count Canossa, at Ammonius's house on the Thames. Ammonius passed him off on Erasmus as a merchant. After the meal, the Italian sounded him as to a possible return to Rome, where he might be the first in place, instead of living alone among a barbarous nation. Erasmus replied that he lived in a land that contained the greatest number of excellent scholars, among whom he would be content with the humblest place. This compliment was his farewell to England, which had favoured him so. Some days later, in the first half of July 1514, he was on the other side of the Channel. On three more occasions, he paid short visits to England, but he lived there no more. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Husinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 11. A Light of Theology. 1514-1516. On the way to success and satisfaction. His prior calls him back to Stein. He refuses to comply. First journey to Basel, 1514 to 1516. Cordial welcome in Germany. Johannes Froben. Editions of Jerome and the New Testament. A counselor to Prince Charles. Institutio Principius Christiani, 1515. Definitive dispensation from monastic vows, 1517. Fame. Erasmus as a spiritual center, his correspondence, letter writing as an art, its dangers, a glorious age at hand. Erasmus had, as was usual with him, enveloped his departure from England with mystery. It was given out that he was going to Rome to redeem a pledge. Probably he had already determined to try his fortune in the Netherlands, not in Holland, but in the neighborhood of the princely court in Brabant. The chief object of his journey, however, was to visit Froben's printing office at Basel, personally to supervise the publication of the numerous works, old and new, which he brought with him, among them the material for his chosen task, the New Testament, and Jerome, by which he hoped to effect the restoration of theology, which he had long felt to be his life work. It is easy thus to imagine his anxiety, when during the crossing he discovered that his handbag, containing the manuscripts, was found to have been taken on board another ship. He felt bereft, having lost the labor of so many years, a sorrow so great, he writes, as only parents can feel at the loss of their children. To his joy, however, he found his manuscript safe on the other side. At the castle of Hamas near Calais, he stayed for some days, the guest of Mountjoy. There, on 7 July, a letter found him, written on the 18th of April by his superior, the prior of Stein, his old friend, Servatius Rogerus, recalling him to the monastery after so many years of absence. The letter had already been in the hands of more than one prying person before it reached him by mere chance. It was a terrific blow, which struck him in the midst of his course to his highest aspirations. Erasmus took counsel for a day, and then sent a refusal. To his old friend, in addressing whom he always found the most serious accents of his being, he wrote a letter which he meant to be a justification, and which was self-contemplation, much deeper and more sincere than the one which, at a momentous turning point of his life, had drawn him from his Carmen Alpestra. 
he calls upon God to be his witness that he would follow the purest inspiration of his life. But to return to the monastery, he reminds Servatius of the circumstances under which he entered it, as they lived in his memory, the pressure of his relations, his false modesty. He points out to him how ill monastic life had suited his constitution, how it outraged his love of freedom, how detrimental it would be to his delicate health, if now resumed. Had he, then, lived a worse life in the world? Literature had kept him away from many vices. His restless life could not redound to his dishonor, though only with diffidence did he dare to appeal to the examples of Solon, Pythagoras, St. Paul, and his favorite, Jerome. Had he not everywhere won recognition from friends and patrons? He enumerates them. Cardinals, archbishops, bishops, Mountjoy, the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and lastly, John Collet. Was there, then, any objection to his works? The Enchiridon? The Adagia? He did not mention the Moriah. The best was still to follow, Jerome and the New Testament. The fact that since his stay in Italy he had laid aside the habit of his order and wore a common clerical dress, he could excuse on a number of grounds. The conclusion was, I shall not return to Holland. Quote, I know that I shall not be able to stand the air and the food there. All eyes will be directed to me. I shall return to the country, an old and gray man, who left it as a youth. I shall return, a valetudinarian. I shall be exposed to the contempt even of the lowest. I, who am accustomed to be honored even by the greatest. It is not possible, he concludes, to speak out frankly in a letter. And thence to Rome, perhaps. But on my return I shall try to visit you. I have heard of the deaths of William, Francis, and Andrew, his old Dutch friends. Remember me to Master Henry and to the others who live with you. I am disposed toward them as befits me. For those old tragedies I ascribe to my errors, or, if you like, to my fate. Do not omit to commend me to Christ in your prayers. If I knew for sure that it would be pleasing to him that I should return to live with you, I should prepare for the journey this very day. Farewell, my former sweetest companion, now my venerable father." End quote. Underlying the immediate motives of his high theological aspirations, this refusal was doubtless actuated by his ancient, inveterate, psychological incentives of disgust and shame. Through the southern Netherlands, where he visited several friends and patrons, and renewed his acquaintance with the University of Lavan, Erasmus turned to the Rhine and reached Basel in the second half of August 1514. There such pleasures of fame awaited him as he had never yet tasted. The German humanists hailed him as the light of the world, in letters, receptions, and banquets. They were more solemn and enthusiastic than Erasmus found the scholars of France, England, and Italy, to say nothing of his compatriots, and they applauded him emphatically as being a German himself, and an ornament of Germany. At his first meeting with Froben, Erasmus permitted himself the pleasure of a jocular deception. He pretended to be a friend and agent of himself, to enjoy to the full the joy of being recognized. The German environment was rather to his mind, quote, my Germany, which to my regret and shame I got to know so late, end quote. Soon the work for which he had come was in full swing. He was in his element once more, as he had been at Venice six years before, working hard in a large printing office, surrounded by scholars who heaped upon him homage and kindnesses in those rare moments of leisure which he permitted himself. Quote, I move in a most agreeable museon, so many men of learning and of such exceptional learning. End quote. Some translations of the lesser works of Plutarch were published by Froben in August. The Adagio was passing through the press again with corrections and additions, and the preface, which was originally destined for Baudius. At the same time, Dirk Mertens, at Levan, was also at work for Erasmus, who had, on passing through the town, entrusted him with a collection of easy Latin texts. Also, Monsieur Schurer, at Strasbourg, who prepared a parabole sive similia for him. For Froben, too, Erasmus was engaged on a Seneca, which appeared in 1515, together with a work on Latin construction. But Jerome and the New Testament remained his chief occupation. Jerome's works had been Erasmus's love in early youth, especially his letters. The plan of preparing a correct edition of the great father of the church was conceived in 1500, if not earlier, and he had worked at it ever since, at intervals. 
In 1513, he writes to Ammonius, quote, My enthusiasm for amending and annotating Jerome is such that I feel as though inspired by some god. I have almost completely amended him already by collating many old manuscripts, and this I do at incredibly great expense. In 1512, he negotiated with Bodius about an edition of the letters. Froben's partner, Johannes Ammerbach, who died before Erasmus's arrival, had been engaged for years on an edition of Jerome. Several scholars, Reuchlin among others, had assisted in the undertaking when Erasmus offered himself and all his material. He became the actual editor. Of the nine volumes in which Froben published the work in 1516, the first four contained Erasmus's edition of Jerome's letters. The others had been corrected by him and provided with forewords. His work upon the New Testament was, if possible, still nearer his heart. By its growth it had gradually changed its nature. Since the time when Valla's Annotationes had directed his attention to textual criticism of the Vulgate, Erasmus had, probably during his second stay in England from 1505 to 1506, at the instance of Calais, made a new translation of the New Testament from the Greek original, which translation differed greatly from the Vulgate. Besides Calais, few had seen it. Later, Erasmus understood it was necessary to publish also a new edition of the Greek text with his notes. As to this, he had made a provisional arrangement with Froben shortly after his arrival at Basel. Afterwards, he considered that it would be better to have it printed in Italy, and was on the point of going there when, possibly persuaded by new offers from Froben, he suddenly changed his plan of travel, and in the spring of 1515 made a short trip to England, probably, among other reasons, for the purpose of securing a copy of his translation of the New Testament, which he had left behind there. In the summer he was back at Basel, and resumed the work of Froben's printing office. In the beginning of 1516, the Novum Instrumentum appeared, containing the purified Greek text, with notes, together with a Latin translation in which Erasmus had altered two great deviations from the Vulgate. From the moment of the appearance of two such important, and, as regards the second, such daring theological works by Erasmus as Jerome and the New Testament, we may say that he had made himself the center of the scientific study of divinity, as he was at the same time the center and touchstone of classic erudition and literary taste. His authority constantly increased in all countries, his correspondence was prodigiously augmented. But while his mental growth was accomplished, his financial position was not assured. The years of 1515 to 1517 are among the most restless of his life. He is still looking out for every chance which presents itself. A canonry at Tournay, a prebend in England, a bishopric in Sicily, always half jocularly regretting the good chances he missed in former times, jesting about his pursuit of fortune, lamenting about his spouse, execrable poverty, which even yet I have not succeeded in shaking off my shoulders. And, after all, ever more the victim of his own restlessness than of the disfavor of fate, he is now fifty years old, and still he is, as he says, sowing without knowing what I shall reap. This, however, only refers to his career, not to his life work. In the course of 1515, a new and promising patron, John Le Sauvage, Chancellor of Brabant, had succeeded in procuring for him the title of Counselor of the Prince, the youthful Charles V. In the beginning of 1516 he was nominated. It was a mere title of honor promising a yearly pension of two hundred florins, which, however, was paid but irregularly. To habilitate himself as a counsellor of the prince, Erasmus wrote the Institutio Principius Christiani, a treatise about the education of a prince, which, in accordance with Erasmus's nature and inclination, deals rather with moral rather than political matters, and is in striking contrast with that other work, written some years earlier, Il Principe, by Machiavelli. When his work at Basel ceased for the time being, in the spring of 1516, Erasmus journeyed to the Netherlands. At Brussels he met the Chancellor, who, in addition to the Prince's pension, procured him a prebend at Courtrai, which, like the English benefice mentioned above, was compounded for by money payments. At Antwerp lived one of the great friends who helped in his support all his life, Peter Giles, the young town clerk, in whose house he stayed as often as he came to Antwerp. Peter Giles is the man who figures in Moore's Utopia as the person in whose garden the sailor tells his experiences. 
it was in these days that giles helped dirk mertens at lovan to pass the first edition of the utopia through the press later quentin metzis was to paint him and erasmus joined in a diptych a present for thomas moore and for us a vivid memorial of one of the best things erasmus ever knew this triple friendship in the summer of fifteen sixteen erasmus made another short trip to england he stayed with moore saw collet again also warham fisher and the other friends but it was not to visit old friends that he went there a pressing and delicate matter impelled him now that prebends and church dignitaries began to be presented to him it was more urgent than ever that the impediments in the way of a free ecclesiastical career should be permanently obviated he was provided with a dispensation of pope julius the second authorizing him to accept english prebends and another exempting him from the obligation of wearing the habit of his order but both were of limited scope and insufficient the fervent impatience with which he conducted this matter of his definite discharge from the order makes it probable that as dr allen presumes the threat of his recall to stein had since his refusal to servatius in fifteen fourteen hung over his head there was nothing he feared and detested so much with his friend ammonius he drew up in london a very elaborate paper addressed to the apostolic chancery in which he recounts the story of his own life as that of one florentius his half-enforced entrance into the monastery the troubles which monastic life had brought him the circumstances which had induced him to lay his monk's dress aside it is a passionate apology pathetic and ornate the letter as we know it does not contain a direct request in an appendix at the end written in cipher of which he sent the key in sympathetic ink in another letter the chancery was requested to obviate the impediments which erasmus's illegitimate birth placed in the way of his promotion the addressee lambertus grunius apostolic secretary was most probably an imaginary personage so much mystery did erasmus use when his vital interests were at stake the bishop of worcester silvestrio gigli who was setting out to the lantern council as the envoy of england took upon himself to deliver the letter and to plead erasmus's case erasmus having meanwhile at the end of august returned to the netherlands awaited the upshot of his kind offices in the greatest suspense the matter was finally settled in january fifteen seventeen in two letters bearing the signature of satellet leo x condoned erasmus's transgressions of ecclesiastical law relieved him of the obligation to wear the dress of his order allowed him to live in the world and authorized him to hold church benefices in spite of any disqualifications arising from illegitimacy of birth so much his great fame had now achieved the pope had moreover accepted the dedication of the edition of the new testament and had through satellet expressed himself in very gracious terms about erasmus's work in general rome itself seemed to further his endeavors in all respects erasmus now thought of establishing himself permanently in the netherlands to which everything pointed the vaughan seemed to be the most suitable abode the center of studies where he had already spent two years in former times but Levan did not attract him it was a stronghold of conservative theology martin van dorp a dutchman like erasmus and professor of divinity at Levan, had in fifteen fourteen in the name of his faculty rebuked erasmus in a letter for the audacity of the praise of folly his derision of divines and also his temerity in correcting the text of the new testament erasmus had defended himself elaborately at present war was being waged in a much wider field for or against rucklin the great hebrew scholar for whom the authors of the epistoli obscurum virorum had so sensationally taken up the cudgels at levan erasmus was regarded with the same suspicion with which he distrusted dorp and the other lovan divines he stayed during the remainder of fifteen sixteen and the first half of fifteen seventeen at antwerp brussels and ghent often in the house of peter giles in february fifteen seventeen there came tempting offers from france budaeus cope etienne poncher bishop of paris wrote to him that the king the youthful francis i would present him with a generous prebend if he would come to paris erasmus always shy of being tied down only wrote polite evasive answers and did not go in the meantime he received the news of the papal absolution 
in connection with this he had once more to visit england little dreaming that it would be the last time he should set foot on british soil in Ammonius's house of St. Stephen's Chapel at Westminster, on 9 April 1517, the ceremony of absolution took place, ridding Erasmus for good of the nightmare which had oppressed him since his youth. At last he was free. Invitations and specious promises now came to him from all sides. Mountjoy and Wolsey spoke of high ecclesiastical honors which awaited him in England. Budaeus kept pressing him to remove to France. Cardinal Ximenes wanted to attach him to the University of Alcala, in Spain. The Duke of Saxony offered him a chair at Leipzig. Perkheimer boasted of the perfections of the free imperial city of Nuremberg. Erasmus, meanwhile, overwhelmed again with the labor of writing and editing, according to his wont, did not definitely decline any of these offers. Neither did he accept any. He always wanted to keep all his strings on his bow at the same time. In the early summer of 1517, he was asked to accompany the court of the youthful Charles, who was on the point of leaving the Netherlands for Spain. But he declined. His departure to Spain would have meant a long interruption of immediate contact with the great publishing centers, Basel, Louvain, Strasbourg, Paris, and that, in turn, would have meant postponement of his life-work. When, in the beginning of July, the prince set out for Middleburg, there to take a ship for Spain, Erasmus started for Louvain. He was thus destined to go to this university environment, although it displeased him in so many respects. There he would have academic duties. Young Latinists would follow him about to get their poems and letters corrected by him, and all those divines, whom he distrusted, would watch him at close quarters. But it was only to be for a few months. I have removed to Lovain, he writes to the Archbishop of Canterbury, till I shall decide which residence is best suited to old age, which is already knocking at the gate importunately. As it turned out, he was to spend four years, 1517 to 1521, at Louvain. His life was now becoming more stationary, but because of outward circumstances rather than of inward quiet. He kept deliberating all those years whether he should go to England, Germany, or France, hoping at last to find the brilliant position which he had always coveted and never had been able, or willing, to grasp. The years 1516 through 1518 may be called the culmination of Erasmus's career. Applauding crowds surrounded him more and more. The minds of men were seemingly prepared for something great to happen, and they looked to Erasmus as the man. At Brussels he was continually bothered with visits from Spaniards, Italians, and Germans, who wanted to boast of their interviews with him. The Spaniards, with their verbose solemnity, particularly bored him. Most exuberant of all, were the eulogies with which the German humanists greeted him in their letters. This had begun already on his first journey to Basel in 1514. Great Rotterdammer, ornament of Germany, ornament of the world, were some of the simplest effusions. Town councils waited upon him, presents of wine and public banquets were of common occurrence. No one expresses himself so hyperbolically as the jurist Ulrich Zasis of Freiburg. I am pointed out in public, he asserts, as the man who has received a letter from Erasmus. Thrice greatest hero, you great Jove, is a moderate apostrophe for him. The Swiss Zwingli writes in 1516, quote, account it a great glory to have seen Erasmus, end quote. I know and I teach nothing but Erasmus now, writes Wolfgang Capito. Ulrich von Houten and Henry Clarianus both imagine themselves placed beside Erasmus as Alcibiades stood beside Socrates, and Beatus Rianus devotes to him a life of earnest admiration and helpfulness that was to prove of much more value than these exuberant panegyrics. There is an element of national exultation in this German enthusiasm for Erasmus. It is the violently stimulated mood into which Luther's word will fall anon. The other nations also chimed in with praise, though a little later and a little more soberly. Collet and Tunstall promise him immortality. Etienne Poncher exalts him above the celebrated Italian humanists. Germain de Brie declares that French scholars have ceased reading any authors but Erasmus, and Bodeus announces that all Western Christendom resounds with his name. This increase of glory manifested itself in different ways. Almost every year the rumor of his death was spread abroad malignantly, as he himself thinks. Again, all sorts of writings were ascribed to him in which he had no share whatever, amongst others the Epistoli Obscurum Virorum. But above all, 
his correspondence increased immensely the time was long since past when he asked moore to procure him more correspondence letters now kept pouring in to him from all sides beseeching him to reply a former pupil laments with tears that he cannot show a single note written by erasmus scholars respectfully sought an introduction from one of his friends before venturing to address him in this respect erasmus was a man of heroic benevolence and tried to answer what he could although so overwhelmed by letters every day that he hardly found time to read them if i do not answer i seem unkind says erasmus and that thought was intolerable we should bear in mind that letter-writing at that time occupied more or less the place of the newspaper at present or rather of the literary monthly which arose fairly directly out of erudite correspondence it was as in antiquity which in this respect was imitated better and more profitably perhaps than in any other sphere an art even before fifteen hundred erasmus had at paris described that art in the treatise de conscribendis epistolis which was to appear in print in fifteen twenty two people wrote as a rule with a view to later publication for a wider circle or at any rate with the certainty that the recipient would show the letter to others a fine latin letter was a gem which a man envied his neighbor erasmus writes to bodeus tunstall has devoured your letter to me and reread it as many as three or four times i literally had to tear it from his hands unfortunately fate did not always take into consideration the author's intentions as to publicity semi-publicity or strict secrecy often letters passed through many hands before reaching their destination as did servatius's letter to erasmus in fifteen fourteen do be careful about letters he writes more than once waylayers are on the lookout to intercept them yet with the curious precipitation that characterizes him erasmus was often very careless as to what he wrote from an early age he preserved and cared for his letters yet nevertheless through his itinerant life many were lost he could not control their publication as early as fifteen o nine a friend sent him a manuscript volume of his own erasmus's letters that he had picked up for sale at rome erasmus had it burnt at once since fifteen fifteen he himself superintended the publication of his letters at first only a few important ones afterwards in fifteen sixteen a selection of letters from friends to him and after that ever larger collections till at the end of his life there appeared a new collection almost every year no article was so much in demand on the book market as letters by erasmus and no wonder they were models of excellent style tasteful latin witty expression and elegant erudition the semi-private semi-public character of the letters often made them compromising what one could say to a friend in confidence might possibly injure when many read it erasmus who never was aware how injuriously he expressed himself repeatedly gave rise to misunderstanding and estrangement manners so to say had not yet adapted themselves to the new art of printing which increased the publicity of the written word a thousandfold only gradually under this new influence was the separation effected between the public word intended for the press and the private communication which remains in writing and is read only by the recipient meanwhile with the growth of erasmus's fame his earlier writings too had risen in the public estimation the great success of the enchiridon militis christiani had begun about fifteen fifteen when the times were much riper for it than eleven years before the moriah is embraced as the highest wisdom writes john watson to him in fifteen sixteen in the same year we find a word used for the first time which expresses better than anything else how much erasmus had become a centre of authority erasmiani so his german friends called themselves according to johannes sapidus more than a year later dr johannes eck employs the word still in a rather friendly sense as a generally current term all scholars in germany are erasmians he says but erasmus did not like the word i find nothing in myself he replies why any one should wish to be an erasmicus and altogether i hate those party names we are all followers of christ and to his glory we should all drudge each for his part but he knows that now the question is for or against him from the brilliant latinist and the man of wit of his prime he had become the international pivot on which the civilization of his age hinged he could not help beginning to feel himself the brain the heart and the conscience of his times 
it might even appear to him that he was called to speak the great redeeming word or perhaps that he had already spoken it the faith in an easy triumph of pure knowledge and christian meekness in a near future speaks from the preface of erasmus's edition of the new testament how clear did the future look in those years in this period erasmus repeatedly reverts to the glad motif of a golden age which is on the point of dawning perennial peace is before the door the highest princes of the world francis i of france charles king of spain henry the eighth of england and the emperor maximilian have ensured peace by the strongest ties uprightness and christian piety will flourish together with the revival of letters and the sciences as at a given signal the mightiest minds conspire to restore a high standard of culture we may congratulate the age it will be a golden one but erasmus does not sound this note long it is heard for the last time in fifteen nineteen after which the dream of universal happiness about to dawn gives place to the usual complaint about the badness of the times everywhere end of chapter eleven recorded by olivia chapter twelve of erasmus and the age of reformation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Hyoshinga Translated by Frederick John Hopman Chapter 12 Erasmus's Mind Erasmus's Mind Ethical and Aesthetic Tendencies Aversion to all that is unreasonable, silly, and cumbers His vision of antiquity pervaded by Christian faith Renaissance of Good Learning the ideal life of serene harmony and happy wisdom. Love of the decorous and smooth. His mind, neither philosophic nor historical, but strongly philological and moralistic. Freedom, clearness, purity, simplicity. Faith in nature. Educational and social ideas. What made Erasmus the man from whom his contemporaries expected their salvation, or whose lips they hung to catch the word of deliverance? He seemed to them the bearer of a new liberty of the mind, a new clearness, purity, and simplicity of knowledge, a new harmony of healthy and right living. He was to them as the possessor of newly discovered, untold wealth which he had only to distribute. What was there in the mind of the great Rotterdamer which promised so much to the world? The negative aspect of Erasmus's mind may be defined as the heartfelt aversion to everything unreasonable, insipid, purely formal with which the undisturbed growth of medieval culture had overburdened and overcrowded the world of thought. As often as he thinks of the ridiculous textbooks out of which Latin was taught in his youth, disgust rises in his mind, and he execrates them, Mametractus, Brachilogus, Ebrardus, and all the rest, as a heap of rubbish which ought to be cleared away. But this aversion to the superannuated which had become useless and soundless extended much farther, he found society, and especially religious life, full of practices, ceremonies, traditions, and conceptions from which the spirit seemed to have departed. He does not reject them offhand and altogether. What revolts him is that they are so often performed without understanding and right feeling. But to his mind, highly susceptible to the foolish and ridiculous things, and with a delicate need of high decorum and inward dignity, all that sphere of ceremony and tradition displays itself as a useless, nay, a hurtful scene of human stupidity and selfishness. And, intellectualist as he is, with his contempt for ignorance, he seems to know where that those religious observances, after all, may contain malleable sentiments of unexpressed and unformulated piety. Through his triatrices, his letters, his colloquies especially, there always passes, as if one was looking at a gallery of Bruegel's pictures, a procession of ignorant and covetous monks who by their sanctimony and humbug impose upon the trustful multitude and fare sumptuously themselves as a fixed motif such motifs are numerous with erasmus there always recurs his gibe about the superstition that a person was safe by dying in the gown of a franciscan or a dominican fasting prescribed prayers the observance of holidays should not be altogether neglected but they become displeasing to god when we repose our trust in them and forget charity the same holds good of confession, indulgence, all sorts of blessings. Pilgrimages are worthless. The veneration of the saints and of their relics is full of superstition and foolishness. 
the people think they will be preserved from disasters during the day if only they have looked at the painted image of saint christopher in the morning we kiss the shoes of the saints and their dirty handkerchiefs and we leave their books their most holy and efficacious relics neglected erasmus's dislike of what seemed antiquated and worn out in his days went farther still it comprised the whole intellectual scheme of medieval theology and philosophy in the syllogistic system he found only subtlety and arid ingenuity all symbolism and allegory went fundamentally alien to him and indifferent though he occasionally tried his hand at an allegory and he never was mystically inclined now here is just as much as the deficiencies of uh, his own mind as the qualities of the system which made him unable to appreciate it while he struck at the abuse of ceremonies and of church practices both with noble indignation and well-aimed mockery a proud irony to which he was not fully entitled preponderates in his condemnation of a scholastic theology which he could not quite understand it was easy always to talk with a sneer of the conservative divines of his time as magistri nostri his uh, noble indignation hurt only those who deserved castigation and strength in what was valuable but his mockery hurt the good as well as the bad in spite of them assailed both the institution and persons and injured without elevating them the individualist erasmus never understood what it meant to offend the honor of an office an order or an establishment especially when that institution is the most sacred of all the church itself erasmus's conception of the church was no longer purely catholic of that glorious structure of medieval christian civilization with its mystic foundation its strict hierarchy construction its splendidly fitting symmetry he saw hardly anything but its lot of outward details and ornament instead of the world which thomas aquinas and dante had described according to their vision erasmus saw another world full of charm and elevated feeling and these he held up before his compatriots it was the world of antiquity but illuminated throughout by christian faith it was a world that had never existed as such for with the historical reality which the times of constantine and the great fathers of the church had manifested that of declining latinity and deteriorating hellenism the oncoming barbarism and the oncoming byzantinism he had nothing in common erasmus's imagined world was an amalgamation of pure classicism this meant for him cicero horace plutarch for to the flourished period of the greek mind he remained after all a stranger and pure biblical christianity could it be a union not really in erasmus's mind the light falls just as we saw in the history of his career alternately on the pagan antique and on the christian but the warp on his mind is christian his classicism only serves him as a form and from antiquity he only chooses those elements which in ethical tendency are in conformity with his christian ideal and because of this erasmus although he appeared after a century of earlier humanism is yet new to his time the union of antiquity and the christian spirit which had haunted the mind of petrarch the father of humanism which was lost sight of by his disciples enchanted as they were by the irresistible brilliance of the antique beauty of form this union was brought about by erasmus what pure latinity and the classic spirit meant to erasmus we cannot feel as he did because its realization does not mean to us as to him a difficult conquest and a glorious triumph to feel it thus one must have acquired in a hard school the hatred of barbarism which already during his first years of authorship had suggested the composition of the anti barbari the abusive term for all that is old and rude is already gothic goths the term barbarism as used by erasmus comprised much of what we value most in the medieval spirit erasmus's conception of the great intellectual crisis of his day was distinctly dualistic he saw it as a struggle between old and new which to him meant evil and good in the advocates of tradition he saw only obscurantism conservatism and ignorant opposition to banal litere that is the good cause for which he and his partisans battled of the rise of that higher culture erasmus had already formed the conception which has since dominated the history of the renaissance it was a revival begun two or three hundred years before his time in which besides literature all the plastic arts shared side by side with the terms restitution and reflorescence the word renaissance crops up repeatedly in his writings the world is coming to its senses as if awaking out of a deep sleep still there are some left who recalcitrate pertinaciously clinging convulsively with hands and feet to their all ignorance they fear that if bonne literae are reborn and the world grows wise it will come to light that they have known nothing they do not know how pious the ancients could be 
what sanctity characterizes socrates virgil and horace or plutarch's moralia how rich the history of antiquity is in examples of forgiveness and true virtue we should call nothing profane that is pious and conduces to good morals no more dignified view of life was ever found than that which cicero propounds in de senectute in order to understand erasmus's mind and the charm which it had for his contemporaries one must begin with the ideal of life that was present before his inward eye as an splendid dream it is not his own in particular the whole renaissance cherished that wish of reposeful life and yet serious intercourse of good and wise friends in the cool shade of a house under trees where serenity and harmony would dwell the age yearned for the realization of simplicity sincerity truth and nature their imagination was always steeped in the ancients of antiquity though at heart it is more nearly connected with medieval ideas that they themselves were aware in the circle of the medici it is the ideal of Careggi. in rabelais it embodies itself in the fancy of the abbey of telim it finds voice in moore's utopia and in the work of montaigne in erasmus's writings that ideal which ever recurs in the shape of a friendly walk followed by a meal in a garden house it is found as an opening scene of the anti barbari in the numerous descriptions of meals with colette and the numerous convivia of the colloquies especially in the convivium religiosum erasmus has elaborately pictured his dream and it would be worthwhile to compare it on the one hand with telim and on the other with the fantastic design of a pleasure garden which bernard policy describes the little dutch eighteenth-century country seats and garden houses in which the national spirit took great delight are the fulfillment of a purely erasmian ideal the host of the convivium religiosum says to me a simple country house a nest is pleasanter than any palace and if he be king who lives in freedom and according to his wishes surely i am king here life's true joy is in virtue and piety if there are epicureans who live pleasantly then none are more truly epicureans than they who live in holiness and piety the ideal joy of life is also perfectly idyllic in so far that it requires an aloofness from earthly concerns and contempt for all that is sordid it is foolish to be interested in all that happens in the world to pride oneself on one's knowledge of the market of the king of england's plans the news from rome conditions in denmark the sensible old man of the colloquium senile has an easy post of honour a safe mediocrity he judges no one and nothing and smiles upon all the world quiet for oneself surrounded by books that is of all things most desirable on the outskirts of this ideal of serenity and harmony numerous flowers of aesthetic value blow such as erasmus's sense of decorum his great need of kindly courtesy his pleasure in gentle and obliging treatment in cultured and easy manners close by are some of his intellectual peculiarities he hates the violent and extravagant therefore the choruses of the great drama displease him the merit of his own poems he sees in the fact that they pass passion by they abstain from pathos altogether there is not a single storm in them no mountain torrent overflowing its banks no exaggeration whatever there is great frugality in words my poetry would rather keep within bounds and exceed them rather hung the shore that cleaved the high seas in another place he says i am always most pleased by a poem that does not differ too much from prose but prose of the best sort be it understood as philoxenus accounted those the most palatable fishes that are no true fishes and the most savoury meat what is no meat the most pleasant voyage that along the shores and the most agreeable walk that along the water's edge so i take a special pleasure in a rhetorical poem and a poetical liberation so that poetry is tasted in prose and the reverse that is the man of half tones of fine shadings of the thought that is never completely expressed but he adds far-fetched conceits may please others to me the chief concern seems to be that we draw our speech from the matter itself and apply ourselves less to showing off our invention than to present the thing that is the realist from this conception results his admirable simple clarity the excellent division and presentations of his argument but it also causes his lack of that and the prolixity by which he is characterized his machine runs too smoothly in the endless apologie of his later years ever new arguments occur to him new passages to point or quotations to support his idea he praises laconism but never practices it erasmus never coins a sentence which rounded off and pithy becomes a proper and in his manner lives 
there are no current quotations from erasmus the collector of the adagia has created no new ones of his own the true occupation for a mind like his was paraphrasing in which indeed he amply indulged soothing down and unfolding was just the work he liked it is characteristic that he paraphrased the whole new testament except the apocalypse erasmus's mind was neither philosophic nor historic his was neither the work of exact logical discrimination nor of grasping the deep sense of the way of the world in broad historical visions in which the particulars themselves in their multiplicity and variegation form the image his mind is philological in the fullest sense of the word but by that alone he would not have conquered and captivated the world his mind was at the same time of a deeply ethical and rather strong aesthetic trend and those three together have made him great the foundation of erasmus's mind in his fervent desire of freedom clearness purity simplicity and rest it is an old idea of life to which he gave new substance by the wealth of his mind without liberty life is no life and there is no liberty without repose the fact that he never took sides definitely resulted from an urgent need of perfect independence each engagement even a temporary one was felt as a fetter by erasmus an interlocutor in the colloquies in which he so often spontaneously reveals his own ideals of life declares himself determined neither to marry nor to take holy orders nor to enter a monastery nor into any connection by which he will afterwards be unable to free himself at least not before he knows himself completely when will that be never perhaps on no other account do i congratulate myself more than on the fact that i have never attached myself to any party erasmus says towards the end of his life liberty should be spiritual liberty in the first place but he that is a spiritual judgeth all things yet he himself is judged of no man is the word of st paul to what purpose should he require prescriptions who of his own accord does better things than human loves require what arrogance it is to bind by institutions a man who is clearly laid by the inspirations of the divine spirit in erasmus we already find the beginning of that optimism which judges upright man good enough to dispense with fixed forms and rules as more in utopia and rebelle erasmus relies already on the dictates of nature which produces man as inclined to good and which we may follow provided we are imbued with faith and piety in this line of confidence in what is natural and desire of the simple and reasonable erasmus's educational and social ideas lie here he is far ahead of his times it would be an attractive undertaking to discuss erasmus's educational ideals more fully they foreshadow exactly those of the eighteenth century the child should learn in playing by means of things that are agreeable to its mind from pictures its faults should be gently corrected the flogging and abuse of its schoolmaster is erasmus's abomination the office itself is holy and venerable to him education should begin from the moment of birth probably erasmus attached too much value to classicism here as elsewhere his friend peter gilles should implant the rudiments of the ancient languages in his two-year-old son that he may greet his father with endearing stammerings in greek and latin but what gentleness and clear good sense shines from all erasmus says about instruction and education the same holds good of his views about marriage and woman in the problem of sexual relations he distinctly sides with the woman from the conviction there is a great deal of tenderness and delicate feeling in his conception of the positions of the girl and the woman few characters of the colloquies have been drawn with so much sympathy as the girl with the lover and the cultured woman in the witty conversation with the abbot erasmus's ideal of marriage is truly social and hygienic let us beget children for the state and for christ says the lover children endowed by their upright parents with a good disposition children who see the good example at home which is to guide them again and again he reverts to the mother's duty to suckle the child herself he indicates how the house should be arranged in a simple and cleanly manner he occupies himself with the problem of useful children's dress who stood up at that time as he did for the fallen girl and for the prostitute compelled by necessity who saw so clearly the social danger of marriages of persons infected with the new scourge of europe so violently abhorred by erasmus he would wish that such a marriage should at once be declared null and void by the pope erasmus does not hold with the easy social theory is still quite current in the literature of his time which casts upon women all the blame of adultery and lewdness with the savages who live in a state of nature he says the adultery of men is punished but that of women is forgiven here it appears at the same time that erasmus knew be it half in jest 
the conception of natural virtue and happiness of naked islanders in a savage state it soon crops up again in montaigne and the following centuries develop it into a literary dogma end of chapter twelve Chapter 13 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huschinger. Translated by Frederick John Hoppan. Chapter 13. Erasmus's Mind Continued. Erasmus's Mind Intellectual Tendencies the world encumbered by beliefs and forms truth must be simple back to the pure sources holy scripture in the original languages biblical humanism critical work on the text of scripture practice better than dogma erasmus's talent and wit delight in words and things prolixity observation of details a build realism ambiguousness the nuance inscrutability of the ultimate ground of all things simplicity naturalness purity and reasonableness those are to erasmus the dominant requirements also when we pass from his ethical and aesthetic concepts to his intellectual point of view indeed the two can hardly be kept apart the world says erasmus is overloaded with human constitutions and opinions and scholastic dogmas and overburdened with the tyrannical authority of orders and because of all this the strength of gospel doctrine is flagging faith requires simplification he argued what would the turks say of our scholasticism colette wrote to him one day there is no end to books and science let us therefore leave all roundabout roads and go by a shortcut to the truth truth must be simple the language of truth is simple says seneca well then nothing is simpler nor truer than christ i should wish erasmus says elsewhere that this simple and pure christ may be deeply impressed upon the mind of man and that i deem best attainable in this way that we supported by our knowledge and the original languages should philosophize at the sources themselves here a new watchword comes to the fore back to the sources it is not merely an intellectual philological requirement it is equally an ethical and aesthetic necessity of life the original and pure all that is not yet overground or has not passed through many hands has such a potent charm erasmus compared it to an apple which we ourselves pick off the tree to recall the world to the ancient simplicity of science to lead it back from the now turbid pools to those living and most pure fountain heads those more limpid sources of gospel doctrine those he saw the task of divinity the metaphor of the limpid water is not without meaning here it reveals the psychological quality of erasmus's fervent principle how is it he exclaims that people give themselves so much trouble about the details of all sorts of remote philosophical systems and neglect to go to the sources of christianity itself although this wisdom which is so excellent that once for all it put the wisdom of all the world to shame may be drawn from these few books as from a crystalline source with far less trouble than is the wisdom of aristotle from so many thorny books and with much more fruit the equipment for that journey is simple and at everyone's immediate disposal this philosophy is accessible to everybody christ desires that his mysteries shall be spread as widely as possible i should wish that all good wives read the gospel and paul's epistles that they were translated into all languages that out of these the husbandman sang while ploughing the weaver at his loom that with such stories the traveller should beguile his wayfaring this sort of philosophy is rather a matter of disposition than of syllogisms rather of life than of disputation rather of inspiration than of erudition rather of transformation than of logic what is the philosophy of christ which he himself calls renascentia but the insaturation of nature created good moreover though no one has taught us this so absolutely and effectively as christ yet also in pagan books much may be found that is in accordance with it such was the view of life in this biblical humanist as often as erasmus reverts to these matters his voice sounds clearest let no one he says in the preface to the notes to the new testament take up this work as he takes up julius's noctes Atticae or politiano's miscellanies we are in the presence of holy things here it is no question of eloquence these matters are best recommended to the world by simplicity and purity 
it would be ridiculous to display human erudition here impious to pride oneself on human eloquence but erasmus never was so eloquent himself as just then what here raises him above his usual level of force and fervor is the fact that he fights a battle the battle for the right of biblical criticism it repulses him that people should study holy scripture and the vulgate when they know that the texts show differences that are not corrupt although we have the greek text by which to go back to the original form and primary meaning he is now reproached because he dares as a mere grammarian to assail the text of holy scripture on the score of futile mistakes or irregularities details they are yes but because of these details we sometimes see even great divines stumble and brave philological trifling is necessary why are we so precise as to our food our clothes our money matters and why does this accuracy displease us in divine literature alone he crawls along the ground they say he wearies himself out about words and syllables why do we slight any word of him whom we venerate and worship under the name of the word but be it so let whoever wishes imagine that i have not been able to achieve anything better and out of sluggishness of mind and coldness of heart or lack of erudition have taken this lowest task upon myself it is a still a christian idea to think all work good that is done with pious zeal we bring along the bricks but to build the temple of god he does not want to be intractable let the vulgate be kept for use in the liturgy for sermons in schools but he who at home reads our edition will understand his own the better in consequence he erasmus is prepared to render account and acknowledge himself to have been wrong when convicted of error erasmus perhaps never quite realized how much his philological critical method must shake the foundations of the church he was surprised at his adversaries who could not but believe that all their authority would perish at once when the sacred books might be read in a purified form and when people tried to understand them in the original he did not feel what the unassailable authority of a sacred book meant he rejoices because holy scripture is approached so much more closely because all sorts of shadings are brought to light by considering not only what is said but also by whom for whom at what time on what occasion what precedes and what follows in short by the method of historical philological criticism to him it seems so especially pious when reading the scripture and coming across a place which seemed contrary to the doctrine of christ of the divinity of his nature to believe rather than one did not understand the phrase or that the text may be corrupt unperceived he passed from emendation of the different versions to the correction of the contents the epistles were not all written by the apostles to whom they are attributed the apostles themselves made mistakes at times the foundation of his spiritual life was no longer a unity to erasmus it was on the one hand a strong desire for an upright simple pure and humbly belief the earnest wish to be a good christian but it was also the irresistible intellectual and aesthetic need of the good taste the harmony the clear and exact expression of the ancients the dislike of what was cumbrous and involved erasmus thought that good learning may render good service for the necessary purification of the faith and its forms the measure of church hymns should be corrected that christian expression and classicism were incompatible he never believed the man who in the sphere of sacred studies asked every offer for his credentials remained unconscious of the fact that he acknowledged the authority of the ancients without any evidence how naively he appeals to antiquity again and again to justify some bold feat he is critical they say were not the ancients critical he permits himself to insert digressions so did the ancients etc erasmus is in profound sympathy with that revered antiquity by his fundamental conviction that it is the practice of life which matters not he is the great philosopher who knows the tenets of the stoics or peripatetics by rote but he who expresses the meaning of philosophy by his life and his morals for that is its purpose he is truly divine who teaches not by artful syllogisms but by his disposition by his face and his eyes by his life itself that wealth should be despised to live up to that standard is what christ himself calls renaissantia erasmus uses the word in the christian sense only but in that sense it is closely allied to the idea of the renaissance as a historical phenomenon the worldly and pagan sides of the renaissance have nearly always been overrated erasmus is much more than aretino or castiglione the representative of the spirit of his age and one over whose christian sentiment the sweet gale of antiquity had passed 
and that very union of a strong christian endeavor and the spirit of antiquity is the explanation of erasmus's wonderful success the mere intention and the contents of the mind do not influence the world if the form of expression does not cooperate in erasmus the quality of his talent is a very important factor his perfect clearness and ease of expression his liveliness wit imagination gusto and humor have lent a charm to all he wrote which to his contemporaries was irresistible and captivates even us as soon as we read him in all that constitutes his talent erasmus is perfectly and altogether a representative of the renaissance there is in the first place his eternal apropos but he writes is never vague never dark it is always plausible everything seemingly flows of itself like a fountain it always rings through us to tone turn of phrase and accent it has almost the light harmony of ariosto and it is like ariosto never tragic never truly heroic it carries us away indeed but it is never itself truly enraptured the more artistic aspects of erasmus's talent come out most clearly though they are everywhere in evidence in those two recreations after more serious labor the moria and commune and the colloquia but just those two have been of enormous importance for his influence upon his times for while Jerome reached tens of readers and the New Testament hundreds, the Moria and Colloquies went out to thousands. And their importance is heightened in that Erasmus has nowhere else expressed himself so spontaneously. In each of the Colloquies, even in the first purely formulary ones, there is a sketch for a comedy, a novelette, or a satire. There is hardly a sentence without its point, an expression without a vivid fancy. There are unrivaled niceties. The abbot of the abbatis et eruditae colloquium is a Molière character. Be sure we notice how well Erasmus always sustains his characters and his scenes because he sees them. In The Woman in Childbed, he never forgets for a moment that Euphrapelus is an artist. At the end of the game of knuckle bonds, when the interlocutors, after having elucidated the whole nomenclature of the Latin game of knuckle bonds, are going to play themselves, Carolus says, but shut the door first, lest the cook should see us playing like two boys. As Holbein illustrated in Moria, we should wish to possess the colloquia worth illustrations by Bruegel, so closely allied is Erasmus with the clear vision of incidents to that of this great master. The procession of drunkards on Palm Sunday, the saving of the shipwrecked crew, the old men waiting for the traveling cart while the drivers are still drinking, all these are Dutch genre pieces of the best sort. We like to speak of the realism of the Renaissance. Erasmus is certainly a realist in the sense of having an insatiable hunger for knowledge of the tangible world. He wants to know things and their names, the particulars of each thing, be it never so remote, such as those terms of games and rules of games of the Romans. Read carefully the description of the decorative painting on the garden house of the Convivium Religiosum. It is nothing but an object lesson, a graphic representation of the forms of reality. In its joy over the material universe and the supple, pliant word, the Renaissance rebels in a profusion of imagery and expressions. The resounding enumerations of names and things, which Rabelais always gives, are not unknown to Erasmus, but he uses them for intellectual and useful purposes. In De Copia Verborum Ac Rerum, one feat of varied power of expression succeeds another. He gives fifty ways of saying, Your letter has given me much pleasure, or I think that it is going to rain. The aesthetic impulse is here that of a theme and variations, to display or the wealth imitations of the logic of language. Elsewhere, too, Erasmus indulges his proclivity for accumulating the treasures of his genius. He and his contemporaries can never restrain themselves from giving all the instances instead of one, in Regio Vera Theologiae, in De Pronunciatione, in Lingua, in Ecclesiastes, the collections of Adeja, Parabole and above the Mata are altogether based on this eagerness of the Renaissance, which, by the way, was an inheritance of the Middle Ages themselves, to luxuriate in the wealth of the tangible world, to rebel in words and things. The senses are open for the nice observation of the curious. Though Erasmus does not know that need of proving the secrets of nature which inspired a Leonardo da Vinci, a Paracelsus, a Vesalius, he is also, by his keen observation, a child of his time. For peculiarities in the habits of customs of nations he has an open eye. He notices the gait of Swiss soldiers, how dandies sit, how Picards pronounce French. He notices that in all pictures the sitters are always represented with half-closed eyes and tightly shut lips, as signs of modesty, 
and how some Spaniards still honor this expression in life, while German art prefers lips purring as for a kiss. His lively sense of anecdote, to which he gives the rhyme in all his writings, belongs here. And, in spite of all his realism, the world which Erasmus sees and renders is not altogether that of the sixteenth century. Everything is veiled by Latin. Between the author's mind and reality intervenes his antique diction. At bottom the world of his mind is imaginary. It is a subdued and limited sixteenth-century reality which he reflects. Together with his coarseness, he lacks all that is violent and direct in his times. Compared with the artists, with Luther and Calvin, with the statesmen, the navigators, the soldiers, and the scientists, Erasmus confronts the world as a recluse. It is only the influence of Latin. In spite of all his receptiveness and sensitiveness, Erasmus is never fully in contact with life. All through his work, not a bird sings, not a wind rustles. But that reserve of fear of directness is not merely a negative quality. It also results from a consciousness of the indefiniteness of the ground of all things, from the awe of the ambiguity of all that is. If Erasmus often hovers over the borderline between earnestness and mockery, if he hardly ever gives an incisive conclusion, it is not only due to consciousness and fear to commit himself. Everywhere he sees the shadings, the blending of the meaning of words. The terms of things are no longer to him, as to the man of the Middle Ages, as crystals mounted in gold, or as stars in the firmament. I like assertions so little that I would easily take sides with the sceptics wherever it is allowed by the inviolable authority of Holy Scripture and the decrees of the Church. What is exempt from error? All subtle contentions of theological speculation arise from a dangerous curiosity and lead to impious authority. What have all the great controversies about the Trinity and the Virgin Mary profited? We have defined so much that without danger to our salvation might have remained unknown or undecided. The essentials of our religion are peace and unanimity. This can hardly exist unless we make definitions about as few points as possible and leave many questions to individual judgment. Numerous problems are now postponed till the Eugenomenical Council. It would be much better to put off such questions till the time when the glass shall be removed and the darkness cleared away, and we shall see God face to face. There are sanctuaries in the sacred studies which God has not willed that we should probe, and if we try to penetrate there, we grope in ever deeper darkness the farther we proceed, so that we recognize in this manner, too, the inscrutable majesty of divine wisdom and the imbecility of human understanding. End of chapter 13《ラスト14》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、《エラスマス》、Delicacy, dislike of contention, need of concord and friendship, aversion to disturbance of any kind, too much concerned about other men's opinions, need of self justification, himself never in the wrong, correlation between inclinations and convictions, ideal image of himself, dissatisfaction with himself, self centeredness. A solitary at heart, fastidiousness, suspiciousness, morbid mistrust, unhappiness, restlessness, unsolved contradictions of his being, horror of lies, reserve and insinuation. Erasmus's powerful mind met with a great response in the heart of his contemporaries and had a lasting influence on the march of civilization, but one of the heroes of history he cannot be called. Was not his failure to attain the still loftier heights partly due to the fact that his character was not on a level with the elevation of his mind? And yet that character, a very complicated one, though he took himself to be the simplest man in the world, was determined by the same factors which determined the structure of his mind. Again and again we find in his inclinations the correlates of his convictions. At the root of his moral being we find, a key to the understanding of his character, 
that same profound need of purity which drove him to the sources of sacred science. Purity in the material and the moral sense is what he desires for himself and others, always and in all things. Few things revolt him so much as the practices of vintners who doctor wine and dealers who adulterate food. If he continually chastens his language and style, or exculpates himself from mistakes, it is the same impulse which prompts his passionate desire for cleanliness and brightness of the home and of the body. He has a violent dislike of stuffy air and smelly substances. He regularly takes a roundabout way to avoid a malodorous lane. He loathes shambles and fishmonger shops. Fetters spread infection, he thinks. Erasmus had, earlier than most people, antiseptic ideas about the danger of infection in the foul air of crowded inns, in the breath of confessants, in baptismal water. Throw aside common cups, he pleaded. Let everybody shave himself. Let us be cleanly as to bedsheets. Let us not kiss each other by way of greeting. The fear of the horrible venereal disease, imported into Europe during his lifetime, and of which Erasmus watched the unbridled propagation with solicitude, increases his desire for purity. Too little is being done to stop it, he thinks. He cautions against suspected inns. He wants to have measures taken against the marriages of syphilitic persons. In his undignified attitude toward Hutton, his physical and moral aversion to the man's evil plays an unmistakable part. Erasmus is a delicate soul in all his fibers. His body forces him to be that. He is highly sensitive, among other things, very susceptible to cold, the scholar's disorder, as he calls it. Early in life, already the painful malady of the stone begins to torment him, which he resisted so bravely when his work was at stake. He always speaks in a coddling tone about his little body, which cannot stand fasting, which must be kept fit by some exercise, namely riding, and for which he carefully tries to find a suitable climate. He is at times circumstantial in the description of his ailments. He has to be very careful in the matter of his sleep. If once he wakes up, he finds it difficult to go to sleep again, and because of that has often to lose the morning, the best time to work, and which is so dear to him. He cannot stand cold, wind, and fog, but still less overheated rooms. How he has execrated the German stoves, which are burned nearly all the year through, and made Germany almost unbearable to him. It is not only the plague which he flees. For fear of catching cold, he gives up a journey from Levant to Antwerp, where his friend Peter Giles is in mourning. Although he realizes quite well that, quote, often a great deal of the disease is in the imagination, Unquote. Yet his own imagination leaves him no peace. Nevertheless, when he is seriously ill, he does not fear death. His hygienics amount to temperance, cleanliness, and fresh air. This last item in moderation. He takes the vicinity of the sea to be unwholesome and is afraid of draughts. His friend Giles, who is ill, he advises, Do not take too much medicine. Keep quiet and do not get angry. Though there is a, quote, praise of medicine, unquote, among his works, he does not think highly of physicians and satirizes them more than once in the colloquies. Also in his outward appearance there were certain features betraying his delicacy. He was of medium height, well made, of a fair complexion with blonde hair and blue eyes, a cheerful face, and a very articulate mode of speech, but a thin voice. In the moral sphere, Erasmus's delicacy is represented by his great need of friendship and concord, his dislike of contention. With him, peace and harmony rank above all other considerations, and he confesses them to be the guiding principles of his actions. He would, if it might be, have all the world as a friend. Quote, Wittingly I discharge no one for my friendship, unquote, he says. And though he was sometimes capricious and exacting towards his friend, yet a truly great friend he was. Witness the many who never forsook him, or whom he, after a temporary estrangement, always won back. Moore, Peter Giles, Fisher, Ammonius, Budadeus, and others too numerous to mention.
He was most constant in keeping up friendships, says Beatus Rianus, whose own attachment to Erasmus is proof of the strong affection he could inspire. At the root of this desire of friendship lies a great and sincere need of affection. Remember the effusions of almost feminine affections towards Servatius during his monastic period. But at the same time it is a sort of moral serenity that makes him so, an aversion to disturbance, to whatever is harsh and inharmonious. He calls it a certain occult natural sense, which makes him abhor strife. He cannot abide being at loggerheads with anyone. He always hoped and wanted, he says, to keep his pen unbloody, to attack no one, to provoke no one, even if he were attacked. But his enemies had not willed it, and in later years he became well accustomed to bitter polemics with Le Feu de Etaples, with Lee, with Egomondanus, with Hutton, with Luther, with Beta, with the Spaniards and the Italians. At first it is still noticeable how he suffers by it, how contention wounds him, so that he cannot bear the pain in silence. Quote, Do let us be friends again, unquote, he begs. Lefebvre, who does not reply. The time which he had to devote to his polemics he regards as lost. I feel myself getting more heavy every day, he writes in 1520 not so much on the account of my age, but because of the restless labor of my studies. Nay, more even by the weariness of disputes than by the work, which in itself is agreeable. And how much strife was still in store for him then? If only Erasmus had been less concerned about public opinion. But that seemed impossible. He had a fear of men, or may we call it a fervent need of justification, he would always see beforehand, and usually in exaggerated colors, the effect his word or deed would have upon men. Of himself it certainly was true, as he once wrote, that the craving for fame has less sharp spurs than the fear of ignominy. Erasmus is with Rousseau among those who cannot bear the consciousness of guilt out of a sort of mental cleanliness. Not to be able to repay a benefit with interest makes him ashamed and sad. He cannot abide dunning creditors, unperformed duty, neglect of the need of a friend. If he cannot discharge the obligation, he explains it away. The Dutch historian Froon has correctly observed, quote, Whatever Erasmus did contrary to his duty and his rightly understood interest was the fault of circumstances or wrong advice. He is never to blame himself, unquote. And what he has thus justified for himself becomes with him universal law. Quote, God relieves people of pernicious vows if only they repent of them, unquote, says the man who himself had broken a vow. There is in Erasmus a dangerous fusion between inclination and conviction. The correlations between his idiosyncrasies and his precepts are undeniable. This has special reference to his point of view in the matter of fasting and abstinence from meat. He, too, frequently vents his own aversion to fish, or talks of his inability to postpone meals, not to make this connection clear to everybody. In the same way, his personal experience in the monastery passes into his disapproval on principle of monastic life. The distortion of the image of his youth in his memory, to which we have referred, is based on that need of self-justification. It is all unconscious interpretation of the undeniable facts to suit the ideal which Erasmus has made of himself and to which he honestly thinks he answers. The chief features of that self-conceived picture are a remarkable, simple sincerity and frankness which make it impossible to him to dissemble. Inexperience and carelessness in the ordinary concerns of life and a total lack of ambition. All this is true in the first instance. There is a superficial Erasmus who answers to that image, but is not the whole Erasmus. There is a deeper one who is almost the opposite and whom he himself does not know because he will not know him. Possibly behind this there is still a deeper being which is truly good. Does he not ascribe weaknesses to himself? Certainly. He is, in spite of his self-coddling, ever dissatisfied with himself and his work. Putidulus, he calls himself, meaning the quality of never being content with himself. 
It is that peculiarity which makes him dissatisfied with any work of his directly after it has appeared, so that he always keeps revising and supplementing. Pusillanimous, he calls himself in writing to Colette, but again he cannot help giving himself credit for acknowledging that quality, nay, converting that quality itself into a virtue. It is modesty, the opposite of boasting and self-love. This bashfulness about himself is the reason that he does not love his own physiognomy, and is only persuaded with difficulty by his friends to sit for a portrait. His own appearance is not heroic or dignified enough for him, and he is not duped by an artist who flatters him. Hi-ho! he exclaims on seeing Holbein's thumbnail sketch illustrating the Moria. Quote, if Erasmus still looked like that, he would take a wife at once. Unquote. It is that deep trait of dissatisfaction that suggests the inscription on his portraits. Quote, his writings will show you a better image. Erasmus's modesty and the contempt which he displays of the fame that fell to his lot are of a somewhat rhetorical character. But in this we should not so much see a personal trait of Erasmus as a general form common to all humanists. On the other hand, this mood cannot be called altogether artificial. His books, which he calls his children, have not turned out well. He does not think they will live. He does not set store by his letters. He publishes them because his friends insist upon it. He writes his poems to try a new pen. He hopes that geniuses will soon appear who will eclipse him, so that Erasmus will pass for a stammerer. What is fame? A pagan survival. He is fed up with it to repletion, and would do nothing more gladly than to cast it off. Sometimes another note escapes him. If Lee would help him in his endeavors, Erasmus would make him immortal, he has told the former in their first conversation, and he threatens an unknown adversary. If you go on so imprudently to assail my good name, then take care that my gentleness does not give way, and I cause you to be ranked, after a thousand years, among the venomous sycophants, among the idle boasters, among the incompetent physicians. The self-centered element in Erasmus must needs increase accordingly, as he, in truth, became a center, an objective point of ideas and culture. There really was a time when it must seem to him that the world hinged upon him, and that it awaited the redeeming word from him. What a widespread enthusiastic following he had! How many warm friends and venerators! There is something naive in the way in which he thinks it requisite to treat all his friends in an open letter to a detailed, rather repellent account of an illness that attacked him on the way back from Basel to Louvain. His part, his position, his name, this more and more becomes the aspect under which he sees world events. Years will come in which his whole enormous correspondence is little more than one protracted self-defense. Yet this man who has so many friends is nevertheless solitary at heart, and in the depth of that heart he desires to be alone. He is of a most retiring disposition. He is a recluse. Quote, I have always wished to be alone, and there is nothing I hate so much as sworn partisans. Unquote. Erasmus is one of those whom contact with others weakens. The less he has to address and to consider others, friends or enemies, the more truly he utters his deepest soul. Intercourse with particular people always causes little scruples in him, intentional amenities, coquetry, reticences, reserves, spiteful hits, evasions. Therefore it should not be thought that we get to know him to the core from his letters. Natures like his, which all contact with men unsettles, give their best and deepest when they speak impersonally and to all. After the early effusions of sentimental affections, he no longer opens his heart unreservedly to others. At bottom he feels separated from all and on the alert towards all. There is a great fear in him that others will touch his soul or disturb the image he has made of himself. The attitude of warding off reveals itself as fastidiousness and as bashfulness. Budaneus hit the mark when he exclaimed jocularly, Fastidiosule, you little fastidious person! 
Erasmus himself interprets the dominating trait of his being as maidenly coyness. The excessive sensitiveness to the stain attaching to his birth results from it. But his friend Ammonius speaks of his subrustica veracundia, his somewhat rustic gauchery. There is indeed something of the small man about Erasmus, who is hampered by greatness and therefore shuns the great, because at bottom they obsess him and he feels them to be inimical to his being. It seems a hard thing to say that genuine loyalty and fervent gratefulness were strange to Erasmus, and yet such was his nature. In characters like his a kind of mental cramp keeps back the effusions of the heart. He subscribes to the adage, quote, Love so, as if you may hate one day, and hate so, as if you may love one day." Unquote. He cannot bear benefits. In his most inmost soul he continually retires before everybody. He who considers himself the pattern of simple unsuspicion is indeed in the highest degree suspicious toward all his friends. The dead Ammonius, who had helped him so zealously in the most delicate concerns, is not secure from it. You are always so unfairly distrustful to me, Budaeus complains. What? exclaims Erasmus. You will find few people who are so little distrustful in friendship as myself. When at the height of his fame the attention of the world was indeed fixed on all he spoke or did, there was some ground for a certain feeling on his part of being always watched and threatened. But when he was as yet an unknown man of letters, in his Parisian years, we continually find traces in him of a mistrust of the people about him that can only be regarded as a morbid feeling. During the last period of his life, this feeling attaches especially to two enemies, Eppendorf and Aleander. Eppendorf employs spies everywhere who watch Erasmus's correspondence with his friend. Aleander continuously sets people to combat him and lies in wait for him wherever he can. His interpretation of the intentions of his assailants has the ingenious self-centered element which passes the borderline of sanity. He sees the whole world full of calumny and ambuscades threatening his peace. Nearly all those who once were his best friends have become his bitterest enemies. They wag their venomous tongues at banquets, in conversation, in the confessional, in sermons, in lectures, at court in vehicles and ships. The minor enemies, like troublesome vermin, drive him to weariness of life or to death by insomnia. He compares his tortures to the martyrdom of St. Sebastian, pierced by arrows. But his is worse, because there is no end to it. For years he has daily been dying a thousand deaths, and that alone. For his friends, if such there are, are deterred by envy. He mercilessly pillories his patrons in a row for their stinginess. Now and again there suddenly comes to light an undercurrent of aversion and hatred which we did not suspect. But where had more good things fallen to his lot than in England? Which country had he always praised more? But suddenly a bitter and unfounded reproach escapes him. England is responsible for his having become faithless to his monastic vows. For no other reason do I hate Britain more than for this, though it has always been pestilent for me. He seldom allows himself to go so far. His expressions of hatred or spite are, as a rule, restricted to the feline. They are aimed at friends and enemies, Bidaeus, Lippius, as well as Hutton and Beda. Occasionally we are struck by the expression of coarse pleasure at another's misfortune. But in all this, as regards malice, we should not measure Erasmus by our ideas of delicacy and gentleness. Compared with most of his contemporaries, he remains moderate and refined. Erasmus never felt happy, was never content. This may perhaps surprise us for a moment when we think of his cheerful, never-failing energy, of his gay jests and his humor. But upon reflection, this unhappy feeling tallies very well with his character. It also proceeds from his general attitude of warding off. Even when in high spirits, he considers himself in all respects an unhappy man. The most miserable of all men, the thrice-wretched Erasmus, he calls himself in fine Greek terms. 
His life is, quote, an Iliad of calamities, a chain of misfortunes. How can anyone envy me? Unquote. To no one has fortune been so constantly hostile as to him. She has sworn his destruction. Thus he sang in his youth in a poetical complaint addressed to Gauguin. From earliest infancy the same sad and hard fate has been constantly pursuing him. Pandora's whole box seems to have been poured out over him. This unhappy feeling takes the special form of his having been charged by unlucky stars with Herculean labor, without profit or pleasure to himself. Troubles and vexations without end. His life might have been so much easier if he had taken his chances. He should have never left Italy, or he ought to have stayed in England. But an immoderate love of liberty caused me to wrestle long with faithless friends and inveterate poverty. Elsewhere, he says more resignedly, but we are driven by fate. That immoderate love of liberty had indeed been as fate to him. He had always been the great seeker of quiet and liberty, who found liberty late and quiet never, by no means ever to bind himself, to incur no obligations which might become fetters, again that fear of the entanglements of life. Thus he remained the great restless one, he was never truly satisfied with anything, least of all with what he produced himself. Quote, Why then do you overwhelm us with so many books? Unquote. Someone at Louvain objected. If you do not really approve of any of them. And Erasmus answers with Horace's words. In the first place, because I cannot sleep. A sleepless energy, it was that indeed, he cannot rest, still half seasick and occupied with his trunks, he is already thinking about an answer to Dorp's letter, just received, censuring the Moria. We should fully realize what it means that time after time Erasmus, who by nature loved, quiet and was fearful, and fond of comfort, cleanliness, and good fare, undertakes troublesome and dangerous journeys, even voyages, which he detests for the sake of his work, and of that alone. He is not only restless, but also precipitate. Helped by an incomparably retentive and capacious memory, he writes at haphazard. He never becomes anacoluthic. His talent is far too refined and sure for that, but he does repeat himself, and is unnecessarily circumstantial. Quote, I'd rather pour out than write everything, Unquote, he says. He compares his publications with parturitions, nay, to abortions. He does not select his subjects, he tumbles into them, and having once taken up a subject, he finishes without intermission. For years he has read only tumultare, up and down all literature. He no longer finds time really to refresh his mind by reading, and to work so as to please himself. On that account he envied Bidaius. Quote, do not publish too hastily, Moore warns him. Quote, you are watched to be caught in inexactitudes. Unquote. Erasmus knows it. He will correct all later. He will ever have to revise and to polish everything. He hates the labor of revising and correcting, but he submits to it and works passionately. Quote, in the treadmill of Basel. Unquote. And he says finishes the works of six years in eight months. In that reckless and precipitation with which Erasmus labors, there is again one of the unsolved contradictions of his being. He is precipitate and careless. He wants to be careful and cautious. His mind drives him to be the first. His nature restrains him, but usually only after the word has been written and published. The result is a continual intermingling of explosion and reserve. The way in which Erasmus always tries to shirk definite statements irritates us. How carefully he always tries to represent the colloquies, in which he had spontaneously revealed so much of his inner convictions, as mere trifling committed to paper to please his friends. They are only meant to teach correct Latin, and if anything is said in them touching matters of faith, it is not I who say it, is it? As often as he censures classes or offices in the Adagia, princes above all, he warns the readers not to regard his words as aimed at particular persons. Erasmus was a master of reserve. He knew, even when he held definite views, how to avoid direct decisions, not only from caution, but also because he saw the eternal ambiguity of human issues. Erasmus ascribes to himself an unusual horror of lies, 
On seeing a liar, he says, he was corporally affected. As a boy, he already violently disliked mendacious boys, such as the little braggart of whom he tells in the colloquies. That this reaction of aversion is genuine is not contradicted by the fact that we catch Erasmus himself in untruths. Inconsistencies, flattery, pieces of cunning, white lies, serious oppression of facts, simulated sentiments of respect or sorrow, they may all be pointed out in his letters. He once disavowed his deepest conviction for a gratuity from Anne of Borsalin by flattering her bigotry. He requested his best friend Bot to tell lies in his behalf. He most sedulously denied his authorship of the Julius Dialogue, for fear of the consequences, even to Moore, and always in such a way as to avoid saying outright, quote, I did not write it, unquote. Those who know other humanists and know how frequently and imprudently they lied will perhaps think more lightly of Erasmus's sins. For the rest, even during his lifetime, he did not escape punishment for his eternal reserve. His proficiency in semi-conclusions and veiled truths, insinuations and slanderous allusions. The accusation of perfidy was often cast in his teeth, sometimes in serious indignation. You are always engaged in bringing suspicion upon others, Edward Lee exclaims. How dare you usurp the office of a general censor and condemn what you hardly have ever tasted? How dare you despise all but yourself? Falsely and insultingly do you expose your antagonist in the colloquia. Lee quotes the spiteful passage referring to himself and then exclaims, Now from these words the world may come to know its divine, its censor, its modest and sincere author, that Erasmian diffidence, earnest, decency, and honesty. Erasmian modesty has long been proverbial. You are always using the words false accusations. You say, if I was consciously guilty of the smallest of his, Lee's, false accusations, I should not dare to approach the Lord's table. O oh man, who are you to judge another, a servant who stands or falls before his Lord? This was the first violent attack from the conservative side in the beginning of 1520, when the mighty struggle which Luther's actions had unchained kept the world in ever greater suspense. Six months later followed the first serious reproaches on the part of radical reformers. Ulrich von Hutten, the impetuous, somewhat foggy-headed knight who wanted to see Luther's cause triumph as the national cause of Germany, turns to Erasmus, whom, at one time, he had enthusiastically acclaimed as the man of the new wheel, with the urgent appeal not to forsake the cause of the Reformation or to compromise it. Quote, you have shown yourself fearful in the affair of Ruchlin. Now, in that of Lufer, you do your utmost to convince his adversaries that you are altogether averse from it, though we know better. Do not disown us. You know how triumphantly certain letters of yours are circulated, in which, to protect yourself from suspicion, you rather meanly fasten it on others. If you are now afraid to incur a little hostility for my sake, Concede me at least that you will not allow yourself, out of fear for another, to be tempted to renounce me. Rather, be silent about me." Unquote. Those were bitter reproaches. In the man who had to swallow them, there was a puny Erasmus who deserved those reproaches, who took offense at them, but did not take them to heart, who continued to act with prudent reserve till Hutton's friendship was turned to hatred. In him was also a great Erasmus, who knew how, under the passion and infatuation with which the parties combated each other, the truth he sought and the love he had hoped would subdue the world were obscured. Who knew the God whom he professed too high to take sides? Let us try ever to see of that great Erasmus as much as the petty one permits. End of chapter 14. Recording by Trenton. Chapter 15 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
erasmus and the age of reformation by johann huizinga translated by frederick jan hopman chapter fifteen at louvain fifteen seventeen to eighteen erasmus at louvain fifteen seventeen he expects the renovation of the church as the fruit of good learning controversy with lefebvre des tables second journey to basel fifteen eighteen he revises the edition of the new testament controversies with latimus briard and lee erasmus regards the opposition of conservative theology merely as a conspiracy against good learning when erasmus established himself at louvain in the summer of fifteen seventeen he had a vague presentiment that great changes were at hand i fear he writes in september that a great subversion of affairs is being brought about here if god's favour and the piety and wisdom of princes do not concern themselves about human matters but the forms which that great change would assume he did not in the least realize he regarded his removal as merely temporary it was only to last till we shall have seen which place of residence is best fit for old age which is already knocking there is something pathetic in the man who desires nothing but quiet and liberty and who through his own restlessness and his inability not to concern himself about other people never found a really fixed abode or true independence erasmus is one of those people who always seem to say to-morrow to-morrow i must first deal with this and then as soon as he shall be ready with the new edition of the new testament and shall have extricated himself from troublesome and disagreeable theological controversies in which he finds himself entangled against his wish he will sleep hide himself sing for himself and the muses but that time never came where to live when he shall be free spain to which cardinal ximenes called him did not appeal to him from germany he says the stoves and the insecurity deter him in england the servitude which was required of him there revolted him but in the netherlands themselves he did not feel at his ease either here i embarked at a great deal and there is no remuneration though i desired it ever so much i could not bear to stay there long yet he remained for four years erasmus had good friends in the university of louvain at first he put up with his old host johannes Paludanus, rector of the university whose house he exchanged that summer for quarters in the college of the lily martin dorf a dutchman like himself had not been estranged from him by their polemics about the moriah his good will was of great importance to erasmus because of the important place dorp occupied in the theological faculty and lastly though his old patron adrian of utrecht afterwards pope had by that time been called away from louvain to higher dignities his influence had not diminished in consequence but rather increased for just about that time he had been made a cardinal erasmus was received with great complaisance by the louvain divines their leader the vice-chancellor of the university jean briard of Havre, repeatedly expressed his approval of the addition of the new testament to erasmus's great satisfaction soon erasmus found himself a member of the theological faculty yet he did not feel at his ease among the louvain theologians the atmosphere was a great deal less congenial to him than that of the world 
of the english scholars here he felt a spirit which he did not understand and distrusted in consequence in the years in which the reformation began erasmus was the victim of a great misunderstanding the result of the fact that his delicate aesthetic hovering spirit understood neither the profoundest depths of the faith nor the hard necessities of human society he was neither mystic nor realist luther was both to erasmus the great problem of church and state and society seemed simple nothing was required but restoration and purification by a return to the original unspoilt sources of christianity a number of accretions to the faith rather ridiculous than revolting had to be cleared away all should be reduced to the nucleus of faith christ and the gospel forms ceremonies speculations should make room for the practice of true piety the gospel was easily intelligible to everybody and within everybody's reach and the means to reach all this was good learning bona literae had he not himself by his editions of the new testament and of jerome and even earlier by the now famous enchiridion done most of what had to be done i hope that what now pleases the upright will soon please all as early as the beginning of fifteen seventeen erasmus had written to wolfgang fabricius capito in the tone of one who has accomplished the great task well then take you the torch from us the work will henceforth be a great deal easier and cause far less hatred and envy we have lived through the first shock budius writes to tunstall in may fifteen seventeen was any one born under such inauspicious graces that the dull and obscure discipline scholasticism does not revolt him since sacred literature too cleansed by erasmus's diligence has regained its ancient purity and brightness but it is still much greater that he should have effected by the same labour the emergence of sacred truth itself out of that chimerian darkness even though divinity is not yet quite free from the dirt of the sophist school if that should occur one day it will be owing to the beginnings made in our times the philologist spudius believed even more firmly that erasmus that faith was a matter of erudition it could not but vex erasmus that not every one accepted the cleansed truth at once how could people continue to oppose themselves to what to him seemed as clear as daylight and so simple he who so sincerely would have liked to live in peace with all the world found himself involved in a series of polemics to let the opposition of opponents pass unnoticed was forbidden not only by his character forever striving to justify himself in the eyes of the world but also by the custom of his time so eager for dispute there were first of all his polemics with jacques lefebvre de table or in latinized form faber stapulensis the parisian theologian who as a preparer of the reformation may more than any one else be ranked with erasmus at the moment when erasmus got into the travelling cart which was to take him to levin a friend drew his attention to a passage in the new edition of faber's commentary on st paul's epistles in which he controverted erasmus's note on the second epistle to the hebrews verse seven erasmus at once bought faber's book and soon published an apologia it concerned christ's relation to god and the angels but the dogmatic point at issue hinged after all on a philological interpretation of erasmus not yet accustomed to much direct wrangling erasmus was violently agitated by the matter the more as he esteemed faber highly and considered him a congenial spirit what on earth has occurred to the man 
have others set him on against me all theologians agree that i am right he asserts it makes him nervous that faber does not reply again at once Bodius has told peter gillis that faber is sorry about it erasmus in a dignified letter appeals to their friendship he will suffer himself to be taught and censured then again he growls let him be careful and he thinks that his controversy with faber keeps the world in suspense there is not a meal at which the guests do not side with one or the other of them but finally the combat abated and the friendship was preserved towards easter fifteen eighteen erasmus contemplated a new journey to basel there to pass through the press during a few months of hard labour the corrected edition of the new testament he did not fail to request the chiefs of conservative divinity at louvain beforehand to state their objections to his work briard of off declared he had found nothing offensive in it after he had first been told all sorts of bad things about it then the new edition will please you much better erasmus had said his friend dorp and james latimus also one of the chief divines had expressed themselves in the same sense and the carmelite nicholas of egmond had said that he had never read erasmus's work only a young englishman edward lee who was studying greek at louvain had summarized a number of criticisms into ten conclusions erasmus had got rid of the matter by writing to lee that he had not been able to get hold of his conclusions and therefore could not make use of them but his youthful critic had not put up with being slighted so and worked out his objections in a more circumstantial treatise thus erasmus set out for basel once more in may fifteen eighteen he had been obliged to ask all his english friends of whom ammonius had been taken from him by death in fifteen seventeen for support to defray the expenses of the journey he kept holding out to them the prospect that after his work was finished he would return to england in a letter to martin lipsius as he was going up the rhine he answered lee's criticism which had irritated him extremely in revising his edition he not only took it but little into account but ventured moreover this time to print his own translation of the new testament of fifteen o six without any alterations at the same time he obtained for the new edition a letter of approval from the pope a redoubtable weapon against his cavillers at basel erasmus worked again like a horse in a treadmill but he was really in his element even before the second edition of the new testament the enchiridion and the institutio principis christiani were printed by froben on his return journey erasmus whose work had been hampered all through the summer by indisposition and who had on that account been unable to finish it fell seriously ill he reached louvain with difficulty twenty one september fifteen eighteen it might be the pestilence and erasmus ever much afraid of contagion himself now took all precautions to safeguard his friends against it he avoided his quarters in the college of the lily and found shelter with his most trusted friend dirk mightens the printer but in spite of rumours of the plague and his warnings first dorp and afterwards also off came at once to visit him evidently the louvain professors did not mean so badly by him after all but the differences between erasmus and the louvain faculty were deeply rooted lee hurt by the little attention paid by erasmus to his objections prepared a new critique but kept it from erasmus for the present which irritated the latter and made him nervous in the meantime a new opponent arose directly after his return to louvain erasmus had taken much trouble to promote the establishment of the collegium trilingua projected and endowed by jerome Busleiden in his testament to be founded in the university the three biblical languages hebrew greek and latin were to be taught there now when james latimus a member of the theological faculty and a man whom he esteemed in a dialogue about the study of those three languages and of theology doubted the utility of the former erasmus judged himself concerned and answered latimus in an apologia 
about the same time spring fifteen nineteen he got into trouble with the vice-chancellor himself erasmus thought that off had publicly censured him with regard to his praise of marriage which had recently appeared though off withdrew at once erasmus could not abstain from writing an apologia however moderate meanwhile the smouldering quarrel with lee assumed ever more hateful forms in vain did erasmus's english friends attempt to restrain their young ambitious compatriot erasmus on his part irritated him furtively he reveals in this whole dispute a lack of self-control and dignity which shows his weakest side usually so anxious as to decorum he now lapses into invectives the british adder satan even the old taunt ascribing a tale to englishmen has to serve once more the points at issue disappear altogether behind the bitter mutual reproaches in his unrestrained anger erasmus avails himself of the most unworthy weapons he eggs his german friends on to write against lee and to ridicule him in all his folly and brag and then he assures all his english friends all germany is literally furious with lee i have the greatest trouble in keeping them back alack germany had other causes of disturbance it is fifteen twenty and the three great polemics of luther were setting the world on fire but one may excuse the violence and the petty spitefulness of erasmus in this matter as resulting from an over-sensitive heart falling somewhat short in really manly qualities yet it is difficult to deny that he failed completely to understand both the arguments of his adversaries and the great movements of his time it was very easy for erasmus to mock the narrow-mindedness of conservative divines who thought that there would be an end to faith in holy scripture as soon as the emendation of the text was attempted they correct the holy gospel nay the potter noster itself the preacher exclaims indignantly in the sermon before his surprised congregation as if i cavilled at matthew and luke and not at those who out of ignorance and carelessness have corrupted them what do people wish that the church should possess holy scripture as correct as possible or not this reasoning seemed to erasmus with his passionate need of purity a conclusive refutation but instinct did not deceive his adversaries when it told them that doctrine itself was at stake if the linguistic judgment of a single individual might decide as to the correct version of a text and erasmus wished to avoid the inferences which assailed doctrine he was not aware of the fact that his conceptions of the church the sacraments and the dogmas were no longer purely catholic because they had become subordinated to his philological insight he could not be aware of it because in spite of all his natural piety and his fervent ethical sentiments he lacked the mystic insight which is the foundation of every creed it was this personal lack in erasmus which made him unable to understand the real grounds of the resistance of catholic orthodoxy how was it possible that so many and among them men of high consideration refused to accept what to him seemed so clear and irrefutable he interpreted the fact in a highly personal way he the man who would so gladly have lived in peace with all the world who so yearned for sympathy and recognition and bore enmity with difficulty saw the ranks of haters and opponents increase about him he did not understand how they feared his mocking acrimony how many wore the scar of a wound that the moriah had made that real and supposed hatred troubled erasmus he sees his enemies as a sect it is especially the dominicans and the carmelites who are ill affected towards the new scientific theology just then a new adversary had arisen at louvain in the person of, of his compatriot nicholas of egmond prior to the carmelites henceforth an object of particular abhorrence to him it is remarkable that at louvain erasmus found his fiercest opponents in some compatriots in the narrower sense of the word vincent dirks of harlem william of vianen ruard tapper the persecution increases the venom of slander spreads more and more every day and becomes more deadly the greatest untruths are impudently preached about him he calls in the help of oth 
the vice-chancellor against them but it is no use the hidden enemies laugh let him write for the erudite who are few we shall bark to stir up the people after fifteen twenty he writes again and again i am stoned every day but erasmus however much he might see himself not without reason at the centre could in fifteen nineteen and fifteen twenty no longer be blind to the fact that the great struggle did not concern him alone on all sides the battle was being fought what is it that great commotion about matters of spirit and of faith the answer which erasmus gave himself was this it is a great and wilful conspiracy on the part of the conservatives to suffocate good learning and make the old ignorance triumph this idea recurs innumerable times in his letters after the middle of fifteen eighteen i know quite certainly he writes on twenty one march fifteen nineteen to one of his german friends that the barbarians on all sides have conspired to leave no stone unturned till they have suppressed bona literae here we are still fighting with the protectors of the old ignorance cannot wolsey persuade the pope to stop it here all that appertains to ancient and cultured literature is called poetry by those narrow-minded fellows by that word they indicate everything that savours of a more elegant doctrine that is to say all that they have not learned themselves all the tumult the whole tragedy under these terms he usually refers to the great theological struggle originates in the hatred of bona literae this is the source and hotbed of all this tragedy incurable hatred of linguistic study and the bona literae luther provokes those enemies whom it, it is impossible to conquer though their cause is a bad one and meanwhile envy harasses the bona literae which are attacked at his luther's instigation by these gadflies they are already nearly insufferable when things do not go well with them but who can stand them when they triumph either i am blind or they aim at something else than luther they are preparing to conquer the phalanx of the muses this was written by erasmus to a member of the university of leipzig in december fifteen twenty this one-sided and academic conception of the great events a conception which arose in the study of a recluse bending over his books did more than anything else to prevent erasmus from understanding the true nature and purport of the reformation End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of erasmus and the age of reformation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org erasmus and the age of reformation by john uzinga translated by frederick john hopman chapter sixteen first years of the reformation beginning of the relations between erasmus and luther archbishop albert of mainz 1517 progress of the reformation luther tries to bring about a rapprochement with erasmus march 1519 erasmus keeps aloof fancies he may yet act as a conciliator his attitude becomes ambiguous he denies ever more emphatically all relations with luther and resolves to remain a spectator he is pressed by either camp to take sides alexander in the netherlands the diet of worms fifteen twenty one erasmus leaves louvain to safeguard his freedom october fifteen twenty one about the close of 1516, Erasmus received a letter from the librarian and secretary of Frederick, Elector of Saxony, George Spalatinus, written in the respectful and reverential tone in which the great man was now approached. We all esteem you here most highly. The Elector has all your books in his library and intends to buy everything you may publish in future but the object of Spalatinus's letter was the execution of a friend's commission 
an augustinian ecclesiastic a great admirer of erasmus had requested him to direct his attention to the fact that in his interpretation of st paul especially in that of the epistle to the romans erasmus had failed to conceive the idea of justitia correctly had paid too little attention to original sin he might profit by reading augustine the nameless austin friar was luther then still unknown outside the circle of the wittenberg university in which he was a professor and the criticism regarded the cardinal point of his hardly acquired conviction justification by faith erasmus paid little attention to this letter he received so many of that sort containing still more praise and no criticism if he answered it the reply did not reach Palatinus, and later erasmus completely forgot the whole letter nine months afterwards in september fifteen seventeen when erasmus had been at louvain for a short time he received an honourable invitation written by the first prelate of the empire the young archbishop of mainz albert of brandenburg the archbishop would be pleased to see him on an occasion he greatly admired his work he knew it so little as to speak of erasmus's emendation of the old testament instead of the new and hoped that he would one day write some lives of saints in elegant style the young hohenzoller advocate of the new light of classical studies whose attention had probably been drawn to Erasmus by Houghton and Capito, who sojourned at his court, had recently become engaged in one of the boldest political and financial transactions of his life. His elevation to the see of Mainz at the age of twenty-four had necessitated a papal dispensation, as he also wished to keep the archbishopric of Magdeburg and the see of Halberstadt this accumulation of ecclesiastical offices had to be made subservient to the brandenburg policy which opposed the rival house of saxony the pope granted the dispensation in return for a great sum of money but to facilitate its payment he accorded to the archbishop a liberal indulgence for the whole archbishopric of mainz magdeburg and the brandenburg territories albert to whom half the proceeds were tacitly left raised a loan with the house of fugger and this charged itself with the indulgence traffic when in december fifteen seventeen erasmus answered the archbishop luther's propositions against indulgences provoked by the archbishop of mainz's instructions regarding their colportage had already been posted up thirty one october fifteen seventeen and were circulated throughout germany rousing the whole church they were levelled at the same abuses which erasmus combated the mechanical atomistical and juridical conception of religion but how different was their practical effect as compared with erasmus's pacific endeavour to purify the church by lenient means lives of saints erasmus asked replying the archbishop i have tried in my poor way to add a little light to the prince of saints himself for the rest your endeavour in addition to so many difficult matters of government and at such an early age to get the lives of the saints purged of old women's tales and disgusting style is extremely laudable for nothing should be suffered in the church which is not perfectly pure or refined and he concludes with a magnificent eulogy of the excellent prelate during the greater part of fifteen eighteen erasmus was too much occupied by his own affairs the journey to basel and his red-hot labours there and afterwards his serious illness to concern himself much with luther's business in march he sends luther's thesis to more without comment and in passing complains to collet about the impudence with which rome disseminates indulgences luther now declared a heretic and summoned to appear at augsburg stands before the legate cajetanus and refuses to recount 
seething enthusiasm surrounds him just about that time erasmus writes to one of luther's partisans john lang in very favorable terms about his work the thesis have pleased everybody i see that the monarchy of the pope at rome as it is now is a pestilence to christendom and i do not know if it is expedient to touch that sore openly that would be a matter for princes but i fear that these will act in concert with the pope to secure the part of the spoils i do not understand what possessed eck to take up arms against luther the letter did not find its way into any of the collections on twenty eighth march fifteen nineteen luther addressed himself personally to erasmus for the first time i speak with you so often and you with me erasmus our ornament and our hope and we do not know each other as yet he rejoices to find that erasmus displeases many for this he regards as a sign that god has blessed him now that his luther's name begins to get known too a longer silence between them might be wrongly interpreted therefore my erasmus amiable man if you think fit acknowledge also this little brother in christ who really admires you and feels friendly disposed towards you and for the rest would deserve no better because of his ignorance than to lie unknown buried in a corner there was a very definite purpose in this somewhat rustically cunning and half ironical letter luther wanted if possible to make erasmus show his colors to win him the powerful authority touchstone of science and culture for the cause which he advocated in his heart luther had long been aware of the deep gulf separating him from erasmus as early as march fifteen seventeen six months before his public appearance he wrote about erasmus to john lang human matters weigh heavier with him than divine in an opinion that so many have pronounced about erasmus obvious and yet unfair an attempt on the part of luther to effect a reproachment was a reason for erasmus to retire at once now began that extremely ambiguous policy of erasmus to preserve peace by his authority as a light of the world and to steer a middle course between committing himself in that attitude the great and the petty side of his personality were inextricably intertwined the air because of which most historians have seen erasmus's attitude towards the reformation either in far too unfavorable a light or as for instance the german historian karloff much too heroic and far-seeing is that they erroneously regard him as psychologically homogeneous just that he is not his double-sidedness roots in the depths of his being many of his utterances during the struggle proceed directly from his fear and lack of character also from his inveterate dislike of siding with a person or a cause but behind that is always his deep and fervent conviction that neither of the conflicting opinions can completely express the truth that human hatred and purblindness infatuate men's minds and with that conviction is allied the noble illusion that it might yet be possible to preserve the peace by moderation insight and kindliness in april fifteen nineteen erasmus addressed himself by letter to the elector frederick of saxony luther's patron he begins by alluding to his dedication to suetonius two years before but his real purpose is to say something about luther luther's writings he said have given the louvain obscurance plenty of reason to inveigh against the bonae literae to decry all scholars he himself does not know luther and has glanced through his writings only cursorily as yet but every one praises his life a little in accordance with theological gentleness it is to condemn him off-hand and that before the indiscreet vulgar 
for has he not proposed a dispute and submitted himself to everybody's judgment no one has so far admonished taught convinced him every error is not at once heresy the best of christianity is a life worthy of christ where we find that we should not rashly suspect people of heresy why do we so uncharitably persecute the lapses of others though none of us is free from error why do we rather want to conquer than cure suppress than instruct but he concludes with a word that could not but please luther's friends who so hoped for his support may the duke prevent an innocent man from being surrendered under the cloak of piety to the impiety of a few this is also the wish of pope leo who has nothing more at heart than that innocence be safe at this time erasmus does his best to keep froben back from publishing luther's writings that they may not fan the hatred of the bona litere still more and he keeps repeating i do not know luther i have not read his writings he makes this declaration to luther himself in his reply to the latter's epistle of twenty eight march this letter of erasmus dated thirty may fifteen nineteen should be regarded as a newspaper leader to acquaint the public with his attitude towards the luther question luther does not know the tragedies which his writings have caused at louvain people here think that erasmus has helped him in composing them and call him the standard bearer of the party that seems to them a fitting pretext to suppress the bona litare i have declared that you are perfectly unknown to me and that i have not yet read your books and therefore neither approve nor disapprove anything i reserve myself so far as i may to the use of the reviving studies discreet moderation seems likely to bring better progress than impetuosity it was by this that christ subjugated the world on the same day he writes to john lang one of luther's friends and followers a short note not meant for publication i hope that the endeavors of yourself and your party will be successful here the papists rave violently all the best minds are rejoiced at luther's boldness i do not doubt he will be careful that things do not end in a quarrel of parties we shall never triumph over feigned christians unless we first abolish the tyranny of the roman sea and of its satellites the dominicans the franciscans and the carmelites but no one could attempt that without a serious tumult as the gulf widens erasmus's protestations that he has nothing to do with luther become much more frequent relations at louvain grow ever more disagreeable and the general sentiment about him ever more unkind in august fifteen nineteen he turns to the pope himself for protection against his opponents he still fails to see how wide the breach is he still takes it all to be quarrels of scholars king henry of england and king francis of france in their own countries have imposed silence upon the quarrelers and slanderers if only the pope would do the same in october he was once more reconciled with the louvain faculty it was just at this time that collet died in london the man who had better perhaps than any one else understood erasmus's standpoint kindred spirits in germany still looked up to erasmus as a great man who was on the alert to impose at the right moment and who had made moderation the watchword until the time should come to give his friends the signal but in the increasing noise of the battle his voice already sounded less powerfully than before a letter to cardinal albert of mainz nineteen october fifteen nineteen of about the same content as that of frederick of saxony written in the preceding spring was at once circulated by luther's friends and by the advocates of conservatism in spite of the usual protestation i do not know luther 
it was made to serve against Erasmus. It became more and more clear that the mediating and conciliatory position which Erasmus wished to take up would soon be altogether untenable. The inquisitor, Jacob Uckstraten, had come from Cologne, where he was a member of the University of Louvain, to work against Luther there, as he had worked against Rocklin. On 7 November 1519, the Louvain faculty, following the example of that of Cologne, proceeded to take the decisive step, the solemn condemnation of a number of Luther's opinions. In future, no place could be less suitable to Erasmus than Louvain, the citadel of action against reformers. It is surprising that he remained there another two years. The expectation that he would be able to speak the conciliating word was paling. For the rest, he failed to see the true proportions. During the first months of 1520, his attention was almost entirely taken up by his own polemics with Lee, a paltry incident in the Great Revolution. The desire to keep aloof got more and more the upper hand of him. In June, he writes to Melanchthon, I see that matters begin to look like sedition. It is perhaps necessary that scandals occur, but I should prefer not to be the author. He has, he thinks, by his influence with Wolsey, prevented the burning of Luther's writings in England, which had been ordered. But he was mistaken. The burning takes place in London as early as 12 May. The best proof that Erasmus had practically given up his hope to play a conciliatory part may be found in what follows. In the summer of 1520, the famous meeting between the three monarchs, Henry VIII, Francis I, and Charles V, took place at Calais. Erasmus was to go there in the train of his prince. How would such a congress of princes where in peaceful conclave the interests of France, England, Spain, and the German Empire, and a considerable part of Italy, were represented together, have affected Erasmus's imagination, if his ideal had remained unshaken. But there are no traces of this. Erasmus was at Calais in July 1520, had some conversation with Henry VIII there, and greeted more but it does not appear that he attached any other importance to the journey than that of an opportunity for the last time to greet his English friends. It was awkward for Erasmus that just at this time, when the cause of faith took so much harsher forms, his duties as counselor of the youthful Charles, now back from Spain to be crowned as emperor, circumscribed his liberty more than before in the summer of 1520 appeared based on the incriminating material furnished by the louvain faculty the papal bull declaring luther to be a heretic and unless he should speedily recant excommunicating him i fear the worst for the unfortunate luther erasmus writes 9 september 1520 so does conspiracy rage everywhere so are princes incensed with him on all sides, and, most of all, Pope Leo. Would Luther have followed my advice and abstained from those hostile and seditious actions? They will not rest until they have quite subverted the study of languages and the good learning. Out of the hatred against these and the stupidity of monks did this tragedy first arise. I do not meddle with it, for the rest... The bishopric is waiting for me if I choose to write against Luther. Indeed, Erasmus had become, by virtue of his enormous celebrity, as circumstances would have it, more and more a valuable asset in the great policy of emperor and pope. People wanted to use his name and to make him choose sides, and that he would not do for any consideration. He wrote evasively to the Pope about his relations with Luther, without altogether disavowing him. How zealously he defends himself from the suspicion of being on Luther's side, as noisy monks make out their sermons. 
who summarily link the two in their scoffing disparagement but on the other side also he is pressed to choose sides and to speak out towards the end of october fifteen twenty the coronation of the emperor took place at Arc la chapelle erasmus was perhaps present in any case he accompanied the emperor of cologne there on five november he had an interview about luther with the elector of saxony he was persuaded to write down the result of that discussion in the form of twenty-two axiomata concerning luther's cause against his intention they were printed at once erasmus's hesitation in those days between the repudiation and the approbation of luther is not discreditable to him it is the tragic defect running through his whole personality his refusal or inability ever to draw ultimate conclusions had he only been a calculating and selfish nature afraid of losing his life he would long since have altogether forsaken luther's cause it is his misfortune affecting his fame that he continually shows his weaknesses whereas what is great in him lies deep at cologne erasmus also met the man with whom as a promising young humanist fourteen years younger than himself he had for some months shared a room in the house of aldus's father-in-law at venice herominus aleander now sent to the emperor as a papal nuncio to persuade him to conform his imperial policy to that of the pope in the matter of the great ecclesiastical question and give effect to the papal excommunication by the imperial ban it must have been somewhat painful for erasmus that his friend had so far surpassed him in power and position and was now called to bring by diplomatic means the solution which he himself would have liked to see achieved by ideal harmony goodwill and toleration he had never trusted oleander and was more than ever on his guard against him as a humanist in spite of brilliant gifts oleander was by far erasmus's inferior and had never like him risen from literature to serious theological studies he had simply prospered in the service of church magnates whom erasmus had given up early this man was now invested with the highest mediating powers to what degree of exasperation erasmus's most violent antagonist at louvain had now been reduced is seen from the witty and slightly malicious account he gives thomas more of his meeting with egmondimus before the rector of the university who wanted to reconcile them still things did not look so black as ulrich von huden thought when he wrote to erasmus do you think that you are still safe now that luther's books are burned fly and save yourself for us even more emphatic do erasmus's protestations become that he has nothing to do with luther long ago he had already requested him not to mention his name and luther promised it very well then i shall not again refer to you neither will other good friends since it troubles you even louder too are erasmus's complaints about the raving of the monks at him and his demands that the mendicant orders be deprived of the right to preach in april fifteen twenty one comes the moment in the world's history to which christendom has been looking forward luther at the diet of worms holding fast to his opinions confronted by the highest authority in the empire so great is the rejoicing in germany that for a moment it may seem that the emperor's power is in danger rather than luther and his adherents if i had been present writes erasmus i should have endeavored that this tragedy would have been so tempered by moderate arguments that it could not afterwards break out again to the still greater detriment of the world the imperial sentence was pronounced within the empire as in the burgundian netherlands before that time luther's books were to be burned his adherents arrested and their goods confiscated and luther was to be given up to the authorities erasmus hopes that now relief will follow the luther tragedy is at an end with us here 
would it had never appeared on the stage in these days helprick durer on hearing the false news of luther's death wrote in the diary of his journey with passionate exclamation o oh, erasmus of rotterdam where will you be here you knight of christ ride forth beside the lord christ protect the truth obtain the martyr's crown for you are but an old mannequin i have heard that you say that you have allowed yourself two more years in which you are still fit to do some work spend them well in behalf of the gospel and the true christian faith o oh, erasmus be on this side that god may be proud of you it expresses confidence in erasmus's power but at bottom is the expectation that he will not do all this durer had rightly understood erasmus the struggle abated no wise least of all at louvain lotimus the most dignified and able of louvain divines had now become one of the most serious opponents of luther and in so doing touched erasmus too indirectly to nicholas of egmond the carmelite another of erasmus's compatriots had been added as a violent antagonist vincent dirks of harlem a dominican erasmus addresses himself to the faculty to defend himself against the new attacks and to explain why he has never written against luther he will read him he will soon take up something to quiet the tumult he succeeds in getting a leander who arrived at louvain in june to prohibit preaching against him the pope still hopes that aleander will succeed in bringing back erasmus with whom he is again on friendly terms to the right track but erasmus began to consider the only exit which was now left to him to leave louvain and the netherlands to regain his menaced independence the occasion to depart had long ago presented itself the third edition of his new testament called him to basel once more it would not be a permanent departure and he proposed to return to louvain on twenty eighth october his birthday he left the town where he had spent four difficult years his chambers in the college of the lily were preserved for him and he left his books behind on fifteen november he reached basel soon the rumor spread that out of fear of oleander he had saved himself by flight but the idea revived again in our days in spite of erasmus's own painstaking denial that oleander should have cunningly and expressly driven him from the netherlands is inherently improbable so far as the church was concerned erasmus would at almost any point be more dangerous than at louvain in the headquarters of conservatism under immediate control of the strict burgundian government where it seemed he could sooner or later be pressed into the service of the anti-lutheran policy it was this contingency as dr allen has correctly pointed out which he feared and evaded not for his bodily safety did he emigrate erasmus would not have been touched he was far too valuable an asset for such measures it was his mental independence so dear to him above all else that he felt to be threatened and to safeguard that he did not return to louvain end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of erasmus and the age of reformation this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huizinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 17. Erasmus at Basel, 1521 to 1529. It is only towards the evening of life that the picture of Erasmus acquires the features with which it was to go down to posterity. 
only at basel delivered from the troublesome pressure of parties wanting to enlist him transplanted from an environment of haters and opponents at louvain to a circle of friends kindred spirits helpers and admirers emancipated from the courts of princes independent of the patronage of the great unremittingly devoting his tremendous energy to the work that was dear to him did he become holbein's erasmus in those late years he approaches most closely to the ideal of his personal life he did not think that there were still fifteen years in store for him long before in fact since he became forty years old in fifteen o six erasmus had been in an old age mood the last act of the play has begun he keeps saying after fifteen seventeen he now felt practically independent as to money matters many years had passed before he could say that but peace of mind did not come with competence it never came he never became truly placid and serene as holbein's picture seems to represent him he was always too much concerned about what people said or thought of him even at basel he did not feel thoroughly at home he still speaks repeatedly of a removal in the near future to rome to france to england or back to the netherlands physical rest at any rate which was not in him was granted him by circumstances for nearly eight years he now remained at basel and then he lived at freiburg for six erasmus at basel is a man whose ideals of the world and society have failed him what remains of that happy expectation of a golden age of peace and light in which he had believed as late as fifteen seventeen what of his trust in good will and rational insight in which he wrote the institutio principis christiani for the youthful charles v to erasmus all the wheel of state and society had always been merely a matter of personal morality and intellectual enlightenment by recommending and spreading those two he at one time thought he had introduced the great renovation himself from the moment when he saw that the conflict would lead to an exasperated struggle he refused any longer to be anything but a spectator as an actor in the great ecclesiastical combat erasmus had voluntarily left the stage but he does not give up his ideal let us resist he concludes an epistle about gospel philosophy not by taunts and threats not by force of arms and injustice but by simple discretion by benefits by gentleness and tolerance towards the close of his life he prays if thou o god deign'st to renew that holy spirit in the hearts of all then also will those external disasters cease bring order to this chaos lord jesus let thy spirit spread over these waters of sadly troubled dogmas concord peace sense of duty and kindliness were all valued highly by erasmus yet he rarely saw them realized in practical life he becomes disillusioned after the short spell of political optimism he never speaks of the times any more but in bitter terms a most criminal age he says and again the most unhappy and most depraved age imaginable in vain had he always written in the cause of peace querula passis the complaint of peace the adage dulce bellum in expertise war is sweet to those who have not known it oratio de passe et discordia and more still erasmus thought rather highly of his pacifistic labors that polygraph who never leaves off persecuting war by means of his pen thus he makes a character of the colloquies designate himself according to a tradition noted by melanchthon pope julius is said to have called him before him in connection with his advice about the war with venice 
and to have remarked to him angrily that he should stop writing on the concerns of princes, you do not understand those things. Erasmus had, in spite of a certain innate moderation, a wholly non-political mind. He lived too much outside of practical reality, and thought too naively of the corrigibility of mankind, to realize the difficulties and necessities of government. His ideas about a good administration were extremely primitive, and, as is often the case with scholars of a strong ethical bias, very revolutionary at bottom, though he never dreamed of drawing the practical inferences. His friendship with political and juridical thinkers, as Moore, Budaeus, and Zassius had not changed him. Questions of forms of government, law, or right did not exist for him. Economic problems he saw in idyllic simplicity. The prince should reign gratuitously, and impose as few taxes as possible. The good prince has all that loving citizens possess the unemployed should be simply driven away. We feel in closer contact with the world of facts when he enumerates the works of peace for the prince, the cleaning of towns, building of bridges, halls and streets, draining of pools, shifting of riverbeds, the diking and reclamation of moors, it is the Netherlander who speaks here, and at the same time the man in whom the need of cleansing and clearing away is a fundamental trait of character. Vague politicians like Erasmus are prone to judge princes very severely, since they take them to be responsible for all wrongs. Erasmus praises them personally, but condemns them in general. From the kings of his time he had for a long time expected peace in church and state. They had disappointed him. But his severe judgment of princes he derived rather from classical reading than from political experience of his own times. In the later editions of the Adagia he often reverts to princes, their task and their neglect of duty, without ever mentioning special princes. There are those who sow the seeds of dissension between their townships in order to fleece the poor unhindered and to satisfy their gluttony by the hunger of innocent citizens. In the adage Scarabius Aquilum Quarit, he represents the prince under the image of the eagle as the great cruel robber and persecutor. In another, Aut regim aut fatuum nasi apportere, and in Dulce Bellum in Expertise he utters his frequently quoted dictum, The people found and develop towns, the folly of princes devastates them. The princes conspire with the Pope, and perhaps with the Turk, against the happiness of the people, he writes to Colette in 1518. He was an academic critic writing from his study. A revolutionary purpose was as foreign to Erasmus as it was to Moore when writing the Utopia. Bad monarchs should perhaps be suffered now and then, the remedy should not be tried. It may be doubted whether Erasmus exercised much real influence on his contemporaries by means of his diatribes against princes. One would fain believe that his ardent love of peace and bitter arraignment of the madness of war had some effect. They have undoubtedly spread pacific sentiments in the broad circles of intellectuals who read Erasmus, but unfortunately the history of the sixteenth century shows little evidence that such sentiments bore fruit in actual practice. However this may be, Erasmus's strength was not in these political declamations. He could never be a leader of men with their passions and their harsh interests. His life-work lay elsewhere. 
now at basil though tormented more and more frequently by his painful complaint which he had already carried for so many years he could devote himself more fully than ever before to the great task he had set himself the opening up of the pure sources of christianity the exposition of the truth of the gospel in all the simple comprehensibility in which he saw it in a broad stream flowed the editions of the fathers of classic authors the new editions of the new testament of the adagia of his own letters together with paraphrases of the new testament commentaries on psalms and a number of new theological moral and philological treatises in fifteen twenty two he was ill for months on end yet in that year arnobius and the third edition of the new testament succeeded cyprian whom he had already annotated at louvain and edited in fifteen twenty closely followed by hilary in fifteen twenty three and next by a new edition of jerome in fifteen twenty four later appeared irenaeus fifteen twenty six ambrose fifteen twenty seven augustine fifteen twenty eight to fifteen twenty nine and a latin translation of chrysostom in fifteen thirty the rapid succession of these comprehensive works proves that the work was done as erasmus always worked hastily with an extraordinary power of concentration and a surprising command of his mnemonic faculty but without severe criticism and the painful accuracy that modern philology requires in such editions neither the polemical erasmus nor the witty humorist had been lost in the erudite divine and the disillusioned reformer the paper warrior we would further gladly have dispensed with but not the humorist for many treasures of literature but the two are linked inseparably as the colloquies prove what was said about the moria may be repeated here if in the literature of the world only the colloquies and the moria have remained alive that choice of history is right not in the sense that in literature only Erasmus's pleasantest, lightest, and most readable works were preserved, whereas the ponderous theological erudition was silently relegated to the shelves of libraries. It was indeed Erasmus's best work that was kept alive in the Moria and the Colloquies. With these his sparkling wit has charmed the world if only we had space here to assign to the erasmus of the colloquies his just and lofty place in that brilliant constellation of sixteenth-century followers of democritus rabelais ariosto montaigne cervantes and ben jonson when Erasmus gave the colloquies their definite form at Basel, they had already had a long and curious genesis at first they had been no more than familiarium colloquiorium formulae models of colloquial latin conversation written at paris before fifteen hundred for the use of his pupils augustine caminade the shabby friend who was fond of living on young erasmus's genius had collected them and had turned them to advantage within a limited compass he had long been dead when one Lambert Helonius of Liege sold the manuscript that he had got from Caminat to Froben at Basel. Beatus Renanus, although then already Erasmus's trusted friend, had it printed at once without the latter's knowledge. That was in 1518. Erasmus was justly offended at it, the more so as the book was full of slovenly blunders and solecisms. So he at once prepared a better edition himself, published by Martens at Louvain in 1519. At that time the work really contained but one true dialogue, the nucleus of the latter Convivium Profanum. The rest were formulae of etiquette and short talks. 
but already in this form it was apart from its usefulness to latinus so full of happy wit and humorous invention that it became very popular even before fifteen twenty two it had appeared in twenty-five editions mostly reprints at antwerp paris strasbourg cologne krakow deventer leipzig london vienna mayence at basel erasmus himself revised an edition which was published in march fifteen twenty two by froben dedicated to the latter's six-year-old son the author's godchild johannes erasmus froben soon after he did more than revise in fifteen twenty three and fifteen twenty four first ten new dialogues afterwards four and again six were added to the formulae and at last in fifteen twenty six the title was changed to familiarum colloquiorum opus it remained dedicated to the boy froben and went on growing with each new edition a rich and motley collection of dialogues each a masterpiece of literary form well knit spontaneous convincing unsurpassed in lightness vivacity and fluent latin each one a finished one-act play from that year on the stream of editions and translations flowed almost uninterruptedly for two centuries erasmus's mind had lost nothing of its acuteness and freshness when so many years after the moria he again set foot in the field of satire as to form the colloquies are less confessedly satirical than the moria with its telling subject the praise of folly the latter at once introduces itself as a satire whereas at first sight the colloquies might seem to be mere innocent genre pieces but as to the contents they are more satirical at least more directly so the moria as a satire is philosophical and general the colloquia are up to date and special at the same time they combine more the positive and negative elements in the moria erasmus's own ideal dwells unexpressed behind the representation in the colloquia he continually and clearly puts it in the foreground on this account they form notwithstanding all the jests and mockery a profoundly serious moral treatise and are closely akin to the enchiridion militis christiani what erasmus really demanded of the world and of mankind how he pictured to himself that passionately desired purified christian society of good morals fervent faith simplicity and moderation kindliness toleration and peace this we can nowhere else find so clearly and well expressed as in the colloquia in these last fifteen years of his life erasmus resumes by means of a series of moral dogmatic disquisitions the topics he broached in the enchiridion the exposition of simple general christian conduct untrammeled and natural ethics that is his message of redemption it came to many out of exomologesis deesu carnium lingua institutio christiani matrimoniae vidua christiana ecclesiastes but to far larger numbers the message was contained in the colloquies the colloquia give rise to much more hatred and contest than the moria and not without reason for in them erasmus attacked persons he allowed himself the pleasure of ridiculing his louvain antagonists lee had already been introduced as a sycophant and braggart into the edition of fifteen nineteen and when the quarrel was assuaged in fifteen twenty two the reference was expunged vincent dirks was caricatured in the funeral fifteen twenty six as a covetous friar who extorts from the dying testaments in favor of his order he remained later sarcastic observations were added about beda and numbers of others 
the adherents of Ocio Lampadius took a figure with a long nose in the colloquies for their leader. Oh, no, replied Erasmus, it is meant for quite another person. Henceforth, all those who were at loggerheads with Erasmus, and they were many, ran the risk of being pilloried in the colloquia. It was no wonder that this work, especially with its scourging mockery of the monastic orders, became the object of controversy. Erasmus never emerged from his polemics. He was no doubt serious when he said that, in his heart, he abhorred and had never desired them. But his caustic mind often got the better of his heart and having once begun to quarrel he undoubtedly enjoyed giving his mockery the rein and wielding his facile dialectic pen for understanding his personality it is unnecessary here to deal at large with all those fights on paper only the most important ones need be mentioned since fifteen sixteen a pot had been boiling for erasmus in spain a theologian of the university at Alcala, Diego López Zuniga, or in Latin, Stunica, had been preparing annotations to the edition of the New Testament, a second Lee, said Erasmus. At first Cardinal Ximenes had prohibited the publication, but in 1520, after his death, the storm broke. For some years Stunica kept persecuting Erasmus with his criticism, to the latter's great vexation. At last there followed a rapprochement, probably as Erasmus became more conservative, and a kindly attitude on the part of Stunica. No less long and violent was the quarrel with the syndic of the Sorbonne, Noel Bedier, or Beda, which began in 1522. The Sorbonne was prevailed upon to condemn several of Erasmus's dicta as heretical in 1526. The effort of Beda to implicate Erasmus in the trial of Louis de Berquin, who had translated the condemned writings, and who was eventually burned at the stake for faith's sake in 1529, made the matter still more disagreeable for Erasmus. It is clear enough that both at Paris and at Louvain, in the circles of the theological faculties, the chief cause of exasperation was in the colloquia. Egmondanus and Vincent Dirks did not forgive Erasmus for having acridly censured their station and their personalities. More courteous than the aforementioned polemics was the fight with a high-born Italian, Alberto Pio, Prince of Carpi. Acrid and bitter was one with a group of Spanish monks, who brought the Inquisition to bear upon him. In Spain, Erasmistas was the name of those who inclined to more liberal conceptions of the creed. In this way, the matter accumulated for the volume of Erasmus's works, which contains, according to his own arrangement, all his apologiae, not excuses, but vindications. Miserable man that I am, they just fill a volume, exclaimed Erasmus. Two of his polemics merit a somewhat closer examination, that with Ulrich von Hutten and that with Luther. Hutton, knight and humanist, the enthusiastic herald of a national German uplift, the ardent hater of papacy and supporter of Luther, was certainly a hothead, and perhaps somewhat of a muddlehead. He had applauded Erasmus when the latter still seemed to be the coming man, and had afterwards besought him to take Luther's side. Erasmus had soon discovered that this noisy partisan might compromise him. Had not one of Hutton's rash satires been ascribed to him, Erasmus? There came a time when Hutton could no longer abide Erasmus. His knightly instinct reacted on the very weaknesses of Erasmus's character. The fear of committing himself, and the inclination to repudiate a supporter in time of danger, Erasmus knew that weakness himself. Not all have strength enough for martyrdom, he writes to Richard Pace in 1521, 
i fear that i shall in case it results in a tumult follow st peter's example but this acknowledgment does not discharge him from the burden of hutton's reproaches which he flung at him in fiery language in fifteen twenty three in this quarrel erasmus's own fame pays the penalty of his fault for nowhere does he show himself so undignified and puny as in that sponge against hutton's mire which the latter did not live to read hutton disillusioned and forsaken died at an early age in fifteen twenty three and erasmus did not scruple to publish the venomous pamphlet against his former friend after his demise hutton however was avenged upon erasmus living one of his adherents henry of eppendorf inherited hutton's bitter disgust with erasmus and persecuted him for years getting hold of one of erasmus's letters in which he was denounced he continually threatened him with an action for defamation of character eppendorf's hostility so thoroughly exasperated erasmus that he fancied he could detect his machinations and spies everywhere even after the actual persecution had long ceased End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huizinger. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 18 Controversy with Luther and Growing Conservatism. 1524 to 26. Erasmus persuaded to write against Luther, De Libero Arbitrio, 1524. Luther's answer, De Servo Arbitrio. Erasmus's indefiniteness contrasted with Luther's extreme rigor. Erasmus henceforth on the side of conservatism. The Bishop of Basel and Ecolampideus, Erasmus half-hearted dogmatics, confession, ceremonies, worship of the saints, Eucharist, Institutio Christiani Matrimoni, 1526. He feels surrounded by enemies. At length Erasmus was led, in spite of all, to do what he had always tried to avoid. He wrote against Luther. But it did not in the least resemble the gesta Erasmus at one time contemplated, in the cause of peace and Christendom and uniformity of faith, to call a halt to the impetuous Luther, and thereby to recall the world to its senses. In the great act of the Reformation their polemics were merely an afterplay not erasmus alone was disillusioned and tired luther too was past his heroic prime circumscribed by conditions forced into a world of affairs a disappointed man erasmus had wished to persevere in his resolution to remain a spectator of the great tragedy if as appears from the wonderful success of luther's cause god wills all this thus did erasmus reason and he has perhaps judged such a drastic surgeon as luther necessary for the corruption of these times then it is not my business to withstand him but he was not left in peace while he went on protesting that he had nothing to do with luther and had differed widely from him the defenders of the old church adhered to the standpoint urged as early as fifteen twenty by nicholas of egmund before the rector of louvain so long as he refuses to write against luther we take him to be a lutheran so matters stood that you are looked upon as a lutheran here is certain vives wrote to him from the netherlands in fifteen twenty two ever stronger became the pressure to write against luther from henry the eighth came a call communicated by erasmus old friend turnstall from george of saxony from rome itself whence pope adrian the sixth his old patron had urged him shortly before his death erasmus thought he could refuse no longer he tried some dialogues in the style of the colloquies but did not get on with them, and probably they would not have pleased those who were desirous of enlisting his services. Between Luther and Erasmus himself there had been no personal correspondence, since the former had promised him, in 1520, Well then, Erasmus, I shall not mention your name again. Now that Erasmus had prepared to attack Luther, however, there came an epistle from the latter, written on the 15th of April, 1524, in which the reformer, in his turn, requested Erasmus in his own words, 
please remain now what you have always professed yourself desirous of being a mere spectator of our tragedy there is a ring of ironical contempt in luther's words but erasmus called the letter rather humane i had not the courage to reply with equal humanity because of the sycophants in order to be able to combat luther with a clear conscience erasmus had naturally to choose a point on which he differed from luther in his heart it was not one of the more superficial parts of the church structure for these he either with luther cordially rejected such as ceremonies observances fasting etc or though more moderately than luther he had his doubts about them as the sacraments or the primacy of st peter so he naturally came to the point where the deepest gulf yawned between their natures between their conceptions of the essence of faith and thus to the central and eternal problem of good and evil guilt and compulsion liberty and bondage god and man luther confessed in his reply that here indeed the vital point had been touched de libero arbitrio diatribe a disquisition upon free will appeared in september fifteen twenty four was erasmus qualified to write about such a subject in conformity with his method and with his evident purpose to vindicate authority and tradition this time erasmus developed the argument that scripture teaches doctors affirm philosophers prove and human reason testifies man's will to be free without acknowledgment of free will the terms of god's justice and god's mercy remain without meaning what would be the sense of the teachings reproofs admonitions of scripture if all happened according to mere and inevitable necessity to what purpose is obedience praised if for good and evil works we are equally but tools to god as the hatchet to the carpenter and if this were so it would be dangerous to reveal such a doctrine to the multitude for morality is dependent upon the consciousness of freedom luther received the treaties of his antagonist with disgust and contempt in writing his reply however he suppressed these feelings outwardly and observed the rules of courtesy but his inward anger is revealed in the contents itself of de servio arbitrio on the will not free for here he really did what erasmus had just reproached him with trying to heal a dislocated member by tugging at it in the opposite direction more fiercely than ever before his formidable boorish mind drew the startling inferences of his burning faith without any reserve he now accepted all the extremes of absolute determinism in order to confute indeterminism in explicit terms he was now forced to have recourse to those primitive metaphors of exalted faith striving to express the inexpressible god's two wills which do not coincide god's eternal hatred of mankind a hatred not only on account of demerits and the works of free will but a hatred that existed even before the world was created and that metaphor of the human will which as a riding beast stands in the middle between god and the devil and which is mounted by one or the other without being able to move towards either of the two contending riders if anywhere luther's doctrine in de servio arbitrio means a recrudescence of faith and a straining of religious conceptions but it was luther who here stood on the rock bed of a profound and mystic faith in which the absolute conscience of the eternal pervades all in him all conceptions like dry straw were consumed in the glow of god's majesty for him each human cooperation to attain to salvation was a profanation of god's glory erasmus's mind after all did not truly live in the ideas which were here disputed of sin and grace of redemption and the glory of god as the final cause of all that is was then erasmus's cause in all respects inferior was luther right at the core perhaps dr murray rightly reminds us of hegel's saying that tragedy is not the conflict between right and wrong but the conflict between right and right the combat of luther and erasmus proceeded beyond the point at which our judgment is forced to halt and has to accept an equivalence nay a compatibility of affirmation and negation and this fact that they here were fighting with words and metaphors in a sphere beyond that which may be known and expressed was understood by erasmus erasmus the man of fine shades for whom ideas eternally blended into each other and interchanged called a proteus by luther luther the man of over emphatic expression about all matters the dutchman who sees the sea was opposed by the german who looks out on mountain tops this is quite true that we cannot speak of god but with inadequate words many problems should be deferred 
not to the ecumenical council, but till the time when, the glass and darkness having been taken away, we shall see God face to face. What is free of error? There are, in sacred literature, certain sanctuaries into which God has not willed that we should penetrate further. The Catholic Church had on the point of free will reserved itself some slight proviso, left a little elbow-room to the consciousness of human liberty under grace. Erasmus conceived that liberty in a considerably broader spirit. Luther absolutely denied it. The opinion of contemporaries was at first too much dominated by their participation in the great struggle as such. They applauded Erasmus, because he struck boldly at Luther, or the other way about, according to their sympathies. Not only Vivus applauded Erasmus, but also more orthodox Catholics, such as Sadolet. The German humanists, unwilling for the most part to break with the ancient church, were moved by Erasmus's attack to turn their backs still more upon Luther. Mutianus, Zazus, and Perkheimer, even Melanchthon, inclined to Erasmus' standpoint, Others, like Capito, once a zealous supporter, now washed their hands of him. Soon Calvin, with the iron cogency of his argument, was completely to take Luther's side. It is worth while to quote the opinion of a contemporary Catholic scholar about the relations of Erasmus and Luther. Erasmus, says F. X. Keifel, with his concept of free, unspoiled human nature, was intrinsically much more foreign to the Church than Luther. He only combated it, however, with haughty skepticism, for which reason Luther, with a subtle psychology, upbraided him for liking to speak of the shortcomings and the misery of the Church of Christ in such a way that his readers could not help laughing, instead of bringing his charges with deep sighs, as beseemed before God. The Hyperaspides, a voluminous treatise in which Erasmus again addressed Luther, was nothing but an epilogue, which need not be discussed here at length. Erasmus had thus, at last, openly taken sides, for apart from the dogmatical point at issue itself, the most important part about De Libero Arbitrio was that in it he had expressly turned against the individual religious conceptions and had spoken in favor of the authority and tradition of the Church. He had always regarded himself as a Catholic. Neither death nor life shall draw me from the communion of the Catholic Church, he writes in 1522 and in the Hyperaspides in 1526, quote, I have never been an apostate from the Catholic Church. I know that in this church, which you call the Papist Church, there are many who displease me, but such I also see in your church. One bears more easily the evils to which one is accustomed. Therefore I bear with this church, until I shall see a better, and it cannot help bearing with me, until I shall myself be better." and he does not sail badly, who steers a middle course between two several evils." End quote. But was it possible to keep to that course? On either side people turned away from him. I, who formerly in countless letters was addressed as thrice great hero, prince of letters, son of studies, maintainer of true theology, am now ignored or represented in quite different colors," he writes how many of his old friends and congenial spirits had already gone. A sufficient number remained, however, who thought and hoped as Erasmus did. His untiring pen still continued to propagate, especially by means of his letters, the moderating and purifying influence of his mind throughout all the countries of Europe. Scholars, high church dignitaries, nobles, students, and civil magistrates were his correspondents. The Bishop of Basel himself, Christopher of Untenheim, was a man after Erasmus' heart. A zealous advocate of humanism, he had attempted, as early as 1503, to reform the clergy of his bishopric by means of synodal statutes, without much success. Afterwards he had called scholars like Ecolampideus, Capito, and Wilmfeling to Basel. That was before the great struggle began, which was soon to carry away Ecolampideus and Capito much further than the bishop of Basel or Erasmus approved. In 1522, Erasmus addressed the bishop in a treatise, De Interdictio Isu Carnium, on the prohibition of eating meat. This was one of the last occasions on which he directly opposed the established order. The bishop, however, could no longer control the movement. A considerable number of the commonality of Basel and the majority of the council were already on the side of radical reformation. About a year after Erasmus, Johannes Ecolampideus, whose first residence at Basel had also coincided with his, 
at that time he had helped erasmus with hebrew for the edition of the new testament returned to the town with the intention of organizing the resistance to the old order there in fifteen twenty three the council appointed him professor of holy scripture in the university at the same time four catholic professors lost their places he succeeded in obtaining general permission for unlicensed preaching soon a far more hot-headed agitator the impetuous guillaume ferrell also arrived for active work at basel and in the environs he is the man who will afterwards reform geneva and persuade calvin to stay there though at first Ecolampadeus began to introduce novelties into the church service with caution erasmus saw these innovations with alarm especially the fanaticism of ferrell whom he hated bitterly it was these men who retarded what he still desired and thought possible a compromise his lambent spirit which never fully decided in favor of a definite opinion had with regard to most of the disputed points gradually fixed on a half conservative midway standpoint by means of which without denying his deepest conviction he tried to remain faithful to the church in fifteen twenty four he had expressed his sentiments about confession in the treatise exomologesis on the way to confess he accepts it halfway if not instituted by christ or the apostles it was in any case by the fathers it should be piously preserved confession is of excellent use though at times a great evil in this way he tries to admonish either party neither to agree with nor to assail the deniers though inclining to the side of the believers in the long list of his polemics he gradually finds opportunities to define his views somewhat circumstantially for instance in the answers to alberto pio of fifteen twenty five and fifteen twenty nine subsequently it is always done in the form of an apologia whether he is attacked for the colloquia for the moria jerome the paraphrases or anything else at last he recapitulates his views to some extent in de amabili ecclesia concordia on the amiable concord of the church of fifteen thirty three which however ranks hardly any more among his reformatory endeavors on most points erasmus succeeds in finding moderate and conservative formula even with regard to ceremonies he no longer merely rejects he finds a kind word to say even for fasting which he had always abhorred for the veneration of relics and for church festivals he does not want to abolish the worship of the saints it no longer entails danger of idolatry he is even willing to admit the images Quote, he who takes the imagery out of life deprives it of its highest pleasure we often discern more in images than we conceive from the written word End quote. regarding christ's substantial presence in the sacrament of the altar he holds fast to the catholic view but without fervor only on the ground of the church's consensus and because he cannot believe that christ who is truth and love would have suffered his bride to cling so long to so horrid an error as to worship a crust of bread instead of him but for these reasons he might at need accept ecolampadeus view from the period at basel dates one of the purest and most beneficial moral treatises of erasmus's the institutio christiani matrimoni on christian marriage of fifteen twenty six written for catherine of aragon queen of england quite in the spirit of the inchiridon save for a certain diffuseness betraying old age later follows dividua christiani the christian widow for mary of hungary which is as impeccable but less interesting all this did not disarm the defenders of the old church they held fast to the clear picture of erasmus creed that arose from the colloquies and that could not be called purely catholic there it appeared only too clearly that however much erasmus might desire to leave the letter intact his heart was not in the convictions which were vital to the catholic church Consequently, the colloquies were later, when Erasmus's works were expurgated, placed on the index in the lump with the Moria and a few other works. The rest is caute legenda, to be read with caution. Much was rejected of the annotations to the New Testament, of the paraphrases, and the apologia, very little of the incuradion, of the ratio veri theologia, and even of the exmologesis. But this was after the fight against the living Erasmus, had long been over so long as he remained at basel or elsewhere as the center of a large intellectual group whose force could not be estimated just because it did not stand out as a party it was not known what turn he might yet take what influence his mind might yet have on the church he remained a king of minds in his quiet study 
The hatred that was felt for him, the watching of all his words and actions, were of a nature as only falls to the lot of the acknowledged great. The chorus of enemies who laid the fault of the whole Reformation on Erasmus was not silenced. Quote, he laid the eggs which Luther and Zwingli have hatched. End quote. With vexation, Erasmus quoted ever new specimens of narrow minded, malicious, and stupid controversy. At Constance, there lived a doctor who hung his portrait on the wall merely to spit at it as often as he passed it. Erasmus jestingly compares his fate to that of St. Cassianus, who was stabbed to death by his pupils with pencils. Had he not been pierced to the quick for many years by the pens and tongues of countless people, and did he not live in that torment without death bringing the end? The keen sensitiveness to opposition was seated very deeply with Erasmus and he could never forbear irritating others into opposing him. End of chapter 18. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 19 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Hausinger Translated by Frederick Jan Hauptmann Chapter 19 At War with Humanists and Reformers, 1528-9 Erasmus turns against the excesses of humanism, its paganism and pedantic classicism. Ciceronianus, 1528 It brings him new enemies. The Reformation carried through at Basel. He emigrates to Freiburg, 1529. His view concerning the results of the Reformation. Nothing is more characteristic of the independence which Erasmus reserved for himself regarding all movements of his time than the fact that he also joined issue in the camp of the humanists. In 1528 there were published by Froben the chief of the firm of Johannes Froben had just died, two dialogues in one volume from Erasmus's hand, one about the correct pronunciation of Latin and Greek, and one entitled Ciceronianus or On the Best Diction, i.e. in writing and speaking Latin. Both were proofs that Erasmus had lost nothing of his liveliness and wit. The former treatise was purely philological, and as such has had great influence. The other was satirical as well. It had a long history. Erasmus had always regarded classical studies as the panacea of civilization, provided they were made serviceable to pure Christianity. His sincere ethical feeling made him recoil from the obscenity of a poggio and the immorality of the early Italian humanists. At the same time, his delicate and natural taste told him that a pedantic and servile imitation of antique models could never produce the desired result. Erasmus knew Latin too well to be strictly classical. His Latin was alive and required freedom. In his early works we find taunts about the over-precise Latin purists. One had declared a newly found fragment of Cicero to be thoroughly barbaric, Quote, among all sorts of authors, none are so insufferable to me as those apes of Cicero. End quote. In spite of the great expectations he cherished of classical studies for pure Christianity, he saw one danger quote, that under the cloak of reviving ancient literature, paganism tries to rear its head, as there are those among Christians who acknowledge Christ only in name but inwardly breathe heathenism." End quote. This he writes in 1517 to Capito. In Italy scholars devote themselves too exclusively and into pagan guise to bonae literae. He considered it his special task to assist in bringing it about that those bonae literae, quote, with which the Italians have thus far been almost pagan, shall get used to speaking of Christ." End quote. How it must have vexed Erasmus that in Italy, of all countries, he was at the same time and in one breath charged with heresy 
and questioned in respect to his knowledge and integrity as a scholar. Italians accused him of plagiarism and trickery. He complained of it to Aleander, who he thought had a hand in it. In a letter of 13, 1527, to a professor at Toledo, we find the eboche of the Ciceronianus. In addition to the haters of classic studies for the sake of orthodox belief, writes Erasmus, lately another and new sort of enemies has broken from their ambush. These are troubled that the bonae literae speak of Christ, as though nothing can be elegant but what is pagan. To their ears, Jupiter Optimus Maximus sounds more pleasant than Jesus Christus Redemptor Mundi, and Patres Conscripti more agreeable than Sancti Apostoli. They accounted a greater dishonor to be no Ciceronian than no Christian, as if Cicero, if he should now come to life again, would not speak of Christian things, in other words than in his time he spoke of his own religion. What is the sense of this hateful swaggering with the name Ciceronian? I will tell you briefly, in your ear. With that pearl powder they cover the paganism that is dearer to them than the glory of Christ. End quote. To Erasmus, Cicero's style is by no means the ideal one. He prefers something more solid, succinct, vigorous, less polished, more manly. He who sometimes has to write a book in a day has no time to polish his style, often not even to read it over. Quote, what do I care for an empty dish of words, ten words here and there mumped from Cicero? I want all Cicero's spirit. End quote. These are apes at whom one may laugh, for far more serious than these things are the tumults of the so-called new gospel, to which he next proceeds in this letter. And so, in the midst of all his polemics and bitter vindication, he allowed himself once more the pleasure of giving the reins to his love of scoffing, but as in the Moria and Colloquia, ennobled by an almost passionate sincerity of Christian disposition and a natural sense of measure. The Ciceronianus is a masterpiece of ready, many-sided knowledge, of convincing eloquence, and of easy handling of a wealth of arguments. With splendid, quiet, and yet lively breadth flows the long conversation between Buliforus, representing Erasmus's opinions, Hippologus, the interested inquirer, and Nazaponus, the zealous Ciceronian, who, to preserve a perfect purity of mind, breakfasts of ten currents. Erasmus, in drawing Nazaponus, has, evidently, in the main, alluded to one who could no longer reply, Christopher Longolius, who had died in 1522. The core of the Ciceronianus is where Erasmus points out the danger to Christian faith of a too zealous classicism. He exclaims urgently, It is paganism, believe me, Nazaponus, it is paganism that charms our ear and our soul in such things. We are Christians in name alone. End quote. Why does a classic proverb sound better to us than a quotation from the Bible? Corcorum inter olera, chiquit among the vegetables, better than soul among the prophets. As a sample of the absurdity of Ciceronianism, he gives a translation of a dogmatic sentence in classical language. Optimi maximique Jovis interpres ac filius, servator rex juxtavatum responsa, ex olimpo devolabit in terras. For Jesus Christ, the Word and the Son of the Eternal Father, came into the world according to the prophets. Most humanists wrote indeed in that style. Was Erasmus aware that he here attacked his own past? After all, was it not exactly the same thing which he had done to the indignation of his opponents when translating Logos by Sermo instead of Verbum? 
had he not himself desired that in the church hymns the meter should be corrected, not to mention his own classical odes and paeans to Mary and the saints? And was his warning against the partiality for classic proverbs and turns applicable to anything more than to the adagia? We here see the aged Erasmus on the path of reaction, which might eventually have led him far from humanism. In his combat with humanistic purism, he foreshadows a Christian Puritanism. As always, his mockery procured him a new flood of invectives. Bembo and Sadolet, the masters of pure Latin, could afford to smile at it, but the impetuous Julius Caesar Scaliger violently inveighed against him, especially to avenge Longolius's memory. Erasmus's perpetual feeling of being persecuted got fresh food. He again thought that Aleander was at the bottom of it. The Italians set the imperial court against me, he writes in 1530. A year later, all is quiet again. He writes jestingly, Upon my word, I am going to change my style after Budeus's model and to become a Ciceronian according to the example of Sadolet and Bembo. End quote. But even near the close of his life, he was engaged in a new contest with Italians because he had hurt their national pride. Quote, they rage at me on all sides with slanderous libels, as at the enemy of Italy and Cicero. End quote. There were, as he had said himself, other difficulties touching him more closely. Conditions at Basel had for years been developing in a direction which distressed and alarmed him. When he established himself there in 1521, it might still have seemed to him as if the bishop, old Christopher of Uttenheim, a great admirer of Erasmus and a man after his heart, would succeed in effecting a reformation at Basel as he desired it, abolishing acknowledged abuses but remaining within the fold of the Church. In that very year, 1521, however, the emancipation of the municipality from the bishop's power, it had been in progress since Basel in 1501 had joined the Swiss Confederacy, was consummated. Henceforth the council was number one, no longer exclusively made up of aristocratic elements. In vain did the bishop ally himself with his colleagues of Constance and Lausanne to maintain Catholicism. In the town, the new creed got more and more the upper hand. When, however, in 1525, it had come to open tumults against the Catholic service, the council became more cautious and tried to reform more heedfully. Oikolampadius desired this too. Relations between him and Erasmus were precarious. Erasmus himself had at one time directed the religious thought of the impulsive, sensitive, restless young man. When he had, in 1520, suddenly sought refuge in a convent, he had expressly justified that step towards Erasmus, the condemner of binding vows. And now they saw each other again at Basel in 1522. Oikolampadius, having left the monastery, a convinced adherent and apostle of the new doctrine, Erasmus the great spectator which he wished to be. Erasmus treated his old coadjutor coolly, and as the latter progressed, retreated more and more. Yet he kept steering a middle course, and in 1525 gave some moderate advice to the council, which meanwhile had turned more Catholic again. The old bishop, who for some years had no longer resided in his town, in 1527 requested the chapter to relieve him of his office, and died shortly afterwards. Then events moved very quickly. After Bern had meanwhile reformed itself in 1528, Oikolampadius demanded a decision also for Basel. Since the close of 1528, the town had been on the verge of civil war. A popular rising put an end to the resistance of the council and cleared it of Catholic members. And in February 1529, 
The old service was prohibited. The images were removed from the churches, the convents abolished, and the universities suspended. Oikolampadius became the first minister in the Münster and leader of the Basel Church, for which he soon drew up a reformatory ordinance. The new bishop remained at Parentruy, and the chapter removed to Freiburg. The moment of departure had now come for Erasmus. His position at Basel in 1529 somewhat resembled, but in a reversed sense, the one at Louvain in 1521. Then the Catholics wanted to avail themselves of his services against Luther. Now the Evangelicals would fain have kept him at Basel. For his name was still a banner. His presence would strengthen the position of reformed Basel. On the one hand, because, as people reasoned, if he were not of the same mind as the reformers, he would have left the town long ago. On the other hand, because his figure seemed to guarantee moderation and might attract many hesitating minds. It was therefore again to safeguard his independence that Rasmus changed his residence. It was a great wrench this time. Old age and invalidism had made the restless man a stay at home. As he foresaw trouble from the side of the municipality, he asked Archduke Ferdinand, who, for his brother Charles V, governed the German Empire, and just then presided over the Diet of Speyer, to send him a safe conduct for the whole empire, and an invitation, moreover, to come to court, which he did not dream of accepting. As a place of refuge he had selected the not far distant town of Freiburg im Breisgau, which was directly under the strict government of the Austrian house, and where he, therefore, need not be afraid of such a turn of affairs as that at Basel. It was, moreover, a juncture at which the imperial authority and the Catholic cause in Germany seemed again to be gaining ground rapidly. Erasmus would not or could not keep his departure a secret. He sent the most precious of his possessions in advance, and when this had drawn attention to his plan, he purposely invited Oiko Lampadius to a farewell talk. The reformer declared his sincere friendship for Erasmus, which the latter did not decline, provided he granted him to differ on certain points of dogma. Ocalampadius tried to keep him from leaving the town, and when it proved too late for that, to persuade him to return later. They took leave with a handshake. Erasmus had desired to join his boat at a distant landing stage, but the council would not allow this. He had to start from the usual place near the Rhine Bridge. A numerous crowd witnessed his embarkation, 13 April 1529. Some friends were there to see him off. No unfavorable demonstration occurred. His reception at Freiburg convinced him that, in spite of all, he was still the celebrated and admired Prince of Letters. The council placed at his disposal the large, though unfinished, house built for the Emperor Maximilian himself. A professor of theology offered him his garden. Anthony Fugger had tried to draw him to Augsburg by means of a yearly allowance. For the rest he considered Freiburg by no means a permanent place of abode. Quote, I have resolved to remain here this winter, and then to fly with the swallows to the place whither God shall call me. End quote. But he soon recognized the great advantage which Freiburg offered. The climate, to which he was so sensitive, turned out better than he expected, and the position of the town was extremely favorable for emigrating to France, should circumstances require this, or for dropping down the Rhine back to the Netherlands, whither many always called him. In 1531 he bought a house at Freiburg. The old Erasmus at Freiburg, even more tormented by his painful malady, much more disillusioned than when he left Louvain in 1521, of more confirmed views as to the great ecclesiastical strife, will only be fully revealed to us when his correspondence with Boniface Amebach, 
a friend whom he left behind at Basel, a correspondence not found complete in the older collections, has been edited by Dr. Alan Scare. From no period of Erasmus's life, it seems, may so much be gleaned in point of knowledge of his daily habits and thoughts as from these very years. Work went on without a break in that great scholar's workshop, where he directs his family, who hunt manuscripts for him, and then copy and examine them, and whence he sends forth his letters all over Europe. In the series of editions of the Fathers, followed Basil and the new editions of Chrysostom and Cyprian. His editions of classic authors were augmented by the works of Aristotle. He revised and republished the Colloquies three more times, the Adages and the New Testament once more. Occasional writings of a moral or politico-theological nature kept flowing from his pen. From the cause of the Reformation he was now quite estranged. pseudo evangelici he contumeliously calls the Reformed. I might have been a Corypheus in Luther's church, he writes in 1528, but I preferred to incur the hatred of all Germany to being separate from the community of the church. End quote. The authorities should have paid a little less attention at first to Luther's proceedings, and the fire would never have spread so violently. He had always urged theologians to let minor concerns which only contain an appearance of piety rest and to turn to the sources of scripture. Now it was too late. Towns and countries united ever more closely for or against the Reformation. If what I pray may never happen, he writes to Sadolet in 1530, you should see horrible commotions of the world arise not so fatal for Germany as for the Church, and remember Erasmus prophesied it. End quote. To Beatus Renanus he frequently said that, had he known that an age like theirs was coming, he would never have written many things, or would not have written them as he had. Just look, he exclaims, at the evangelical people. Have they become any better? Do they yield less to luxury, lust, and greed? Show me a man whom that gospel has changed from a toper to a temperate man, from a brute to a gentle creature, from a miser to a liberal person, from a shameless to a chaste being. I will show you many who have become even worse than they were. End quote. Now they have thrown the images out of the churches and abolished mass, he is thinking of Basel especially. Has anything better come instead? Quote, I have never entered their churches, but I have seen them return from hearing the sermon, as if inspired by an evil spirit, the faces of all showing a curious wrath and ferocity, and there was no one except one old man who saluted me properly when I passed in the company of some distinguished persons. End quote. He hated that spirit of absolute assuredness so inseparably bound up with the reformers. Quote, Zwingli and Butzer may be inspired by the spirit. Erasmus from himself is nothing but a man and cannot comprehend what is of the spirit. End quote. There was a group among the reformed to whom Erasmus in his heart of hearts was more nearly akin than to the Lutherans or Zwinglians with their rigid dogmatism, the Anabaptists. He rejected the doctrine from which they derived their name and abhorred the anarchic element in them. He remained far too much the man of spiritual decorum to identify himself with these irregular believers. But he was not blind to the sincerity of their moral aspirations and sympathized with their dislike of brute force and the patience with which they bore persecution. They are praised more than all others for the innocence of their life, he writes in 1529. Just in the last part of his life came the episode of the violent revolutionary proceedings of the fanatic Anabaptists. It goes without saying that Erasmus speaks of it only with horror. One of the best historians of the Reformation, 
Walter Köhler, calls Erasmus one of the spiritual fathers of Anabaptism, and it is certain that in its later peaceful development it has important traits in common with Erasmus, a tendency to acknowledge free will, a certain rationalistic trend, a dislike of an exclusive conception of a church. It seems possible to prove that the South German Anabaptist Hans Denk derived opinions directly from Erasmus. For a considerable part, however, this community of ideas must no doubt have been based on peculiarities of religious consciousness in the Netherlands whence Erasmus sprang, and where Anabaptism found such a receptive soil. Erasmus was certainly never aware of these connections. Some remarkable evidence regarding Erasmus's altered attitude towards the Old and the New Church is shown by what follows. The reproach he had formerly so often flung at the advocates of conservatism that they hated the bonae literae so dear to him and wanted to stifle them, he now uses against the evangelical party. Quote, Wherever Lutherism is dominant, the study of literature is extinguished. Why else, he continues, using a remarkable sophism, are Luther and Melanchthon compelled to call back the people so urgently to the love of letters? Just compare the University of Wittenberg to that of Louvain or Paris. Printers say that before this gospel came, they used to dispose of 3,000 volumes more quickly than now of 600. A sure proof that studies flourish. End, quote. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Hausinger. Translated by Frederick Jan Hauptmann. Chapter 20 Last Years. Religious and political contrasts grow sharper. The coming strife in Germany is still suspended. Erasmus finishes his Ecclesiastes. Death of Fisher and Moore. Erasmus back at Basel, 1535. Pope Paul III wants to make him right in favor of the cause of the council. Favors declined by Erasmus. De Puritate Ecclesiae. The End, 12th July, 1536. During the last years of Erasmus's life, all the great issues which kept the world in suspense were rapidly taking threatening forms. Wherever compromise or reunion had before still seemed possible, sharp conflicts, clearly outlined party groupings, binding formulas were now barring the way to peace. While in the spring of 1529 Erasmus prepared for his departure from Basel, a strong Catholic majority at the Diet at Speyer got the recess of 1526, favorable for the evangelicals, revoked, only the Lutherans among them keeping what they had obtained, and secured a prohibition of any further changes or novelties. The Zwinglians and Anabaptists were not allowed to enjoy the least tolerance. This was immediately followed by the protest of the chief evangelical princes and towns, which henceforth was to give the name to all anti-Catholics together, 19 April 1529. And not only between Catholics and Protestants in the empire did the rupture become complete. Even before the end of that year, the question of the Lord's Supper proved an insuperable stumbling block in the way of a real union of Zwinglians and Lutherans. Luther parted from Zwingli at the colloquy of Marburg with the words, Your spirit differs from ours. In Switzerland, civil war had openly broken out between the Catholic and the Evangelical cantons, only calmed for a short time by the first peace of Kappel. The treaties of Cambrai and Barcelona, which in 1529 restored at least political peace in Christendom for the time being, could no longer draw from old Erasmus jubilations about a coming golden age 
like those with which the Concord of 1516 had inspired him. A month later the Turks appeared before Vienna. All these occurrences could not but distress and alarm Erasmus. But he was outside them. When reading his letters of that period, we are more than ever impressed by the fact that, for all the width and liveliness of his mind, he is remote from the great happenings of his time. Beyond a certain circle of interests, touching his own ideas or his person, his perceptions are vague and weak. If he still meddles occasionally with questions of the day, he does so in the moralizing manner, by means of generalities without emphasis. His advice about declaring war on the Turks, March 1530, is written in the form of an interpretation of Psalm 28, and so vague that at the close he himself anticipates that the reader may exclaim, But now say clearly, do you think that war should be declared or not? In the summer of 1530, the Diet met again at Augsburg under the auspices of the Emperor himself, to try once more to, quote, attain to a good peace and Christian truth, end quote. The Augsburg Confession, defended all too weakly by Melanchthon, was read here, disputed, and declared refuted by the Emperor. Erasmus had no share in all this. Many had exhorted him in letters to come to Augsburg, but he had in vain expected a summons from the Emperor. At the instance of the Emperor's counselors, he had postponed his proposed removal to Brabant in that autumn till after the decision of the Diet. But his services were not needed for the drastic resolution of repression with which the Emperor closed the session in November. The great struggle in Germany seemed to be approaching. The resolutions of Augsburg were followed by the formation of the League of Schmalkalden, uniting all Protestant territories and towns of Germany in their opposition to the Emperor. In the same year, 1531, Zwingli was killed in the Battle of Kappel against the Catholic cantons, soon to be followed by Oiko Lampadius, who died at Basel. It is right, writes Erasmus, that those two leaders have perished. If Mars had been favorable to them, we should now have been done for. In Switzerland a sort of equilibrium had set in. At any rate, matters had come to a standstill. In Germany the inevitable struggle was postponed for many years. The Emperor had understood that to combat the German Protestants effectively, he should first get the Pope to hold the Council which would abolish the acknowledged abuses of the Church. The religious peace of Nuremberg, 1532, put the seal upon this turn of imperial policy. It might seem as if before long the advocates of moderate reform and of a compromise might, after all, get a chance of being heard. But Erasmus had become too old to actively participate in the decisions, if he had ever seriously considered such participation. He does write a treatise, though, in 1533, on the sweet concord of the Church, like his advice on the Turks in the form of an interpretation of a psalm. 83. But it would seem as if the old vivacity of his style and his power of expression, so long unimpaired, now began to flag. The same remark applies to an essay on the preparation for death, published the same year. His voice was growing weaker. During these years he turned his attention chiefly to the completion of the great work which more than any other represented for him the summing up and complete exposition of his moral theological ideas, Ecclesiastes, or On the Way to Preach. Erasmus had always regarded preaching as the most dignified part of an ecclesiastic's duties. As preachers he had most highly valued Collet and Vitrarius. As early as 1519, his friend John Becker of Borsalen urged him to follow up the Enchiridion of the Christian Soldier and the Institutio of the Christian Prince by the true instruction of the Christian Preacher. Later, later, Erasmus had promised him, at present I have too much work, but I hope to undertake it soon. In 1523 he had already made a sketch and some notes for it. 
It was meant for John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, Erasmus's great friend and brother spirit, who eagerly looked forward to it and urged the author to finish it. The work gradually grew into the most voluminous of Erasmus's original writings, a forest of a work, Operis Silvam, as he calls it himself. In four books he treated his subject, the art of preaching well and decorously, with an inexhaustible abundance of examples, illustrations, schemes, etc. But was it possible that a work, conceived already by the Erasmus of 1519, and upon which he had been so long engaged, while he himself had gradually given up the boldness of his earlier years, could still be a revelation in 1533, as the Anchoridion had been in its day. Ecclesiastes is the work of a mind fatigued, which no longer sharply reacts upon the needs of his time. As the result of a correct, intellectual, tasteful instruction in a suitable manner of preaching, in accordance with the purity of the gospel, Erasmus expects to see society improve. Quote, the people become more obedient to the authorities, more respectful towards the law, more peaceable. Between husband and wife comes greater concord, more perfect faithfulness, greater dislike of adultery. Servants obey more willingly, artisans work better, merchants cheat no more. End quote. At the same time that Erasmus took this work to Fauban at Basel to print, a book of a young Frenchman who had recently fled from France to Basel passed through the press of another Basel printer, Thomas Platter. It too was to be a manual of the life of faith, the institution of the Christian religion by Calvin. Even before Erasmus had quite completed the Ecclesiastes, the man for whom the work had been meant was no more. Instead of to the Bishop of Rochester, Erasmus dedicated his voluminous work to the Bishop of Augsburg, Christopher of Stadion. John Fisher, to set a seal on his spiritual endeavors, resembling those of Erasmus in so many respects, had left behind as a testimony to the world, for which Erasmus knew himself too weak, that of martyrdom. On 22nd June 1535, he was beheaded by command of Henry VIII. He died for being faithful to the old church. Together with more, he had steadfastly refused to take the oath to the statute of supremacy. Not two weeks after Fisher, Thomas More mounted the scaffold. The fate of those two noblest of his friends grieved Erasmus. It moved him to do what for years he had no longer done, to write a poem. But rather than in the fine Latin measure of that Carmen Heroicum, one would have liked to hear his emotion in language of sincere dismay and indignation in his letters. They are hardly there. In the words devoted to Fisher's death in the preface to the Ecclesiastes, there is no heartfelt emotion. Also in his letters of those days, he speaks with reserve. Quote, Woodmore had never meddled with that dangerous business and left the theological cause to the theologians, end quote. as if Moore had died for aught but simply for his conscience. When Erasmus wrote these words, he was no longer at Freiburg. He had, in June 1535, gone to Basel to work in Froben's printing office as of old. The Ecclesiastes was at last going to press and still required careful supervision and the final touches during the process. The Adagia had to be reprinted, and a Latin edition of Origines was in preparation. The old sick man was cordially received by the many friends who still lived at Basel. Hieronymus Fruben, Johannes' son, who, after his father's death, managed the business with two relatives, sheltered him in his house zum Luft. In the hope of his return, a room had been built expressly for him, and fitted up as was convenient for him. Erasmus found that at Basel the ecclesiastical storms which had formerly driven him away had subsided. Quiet and order had returned. He did feel a spirit of distrust in the air, it is true. Quote, 
but I think that on account of my age, of habits, and of what little erudition I possess, I have now got so far that I may live in safety anywhere. Quote. At first he had regarded the removal as an experiment. He did not mean to stay at Basel. If his health could not stand the change of air, he would return to his fine, well-appointed, comfortable house at Freiburg. If he should prove able to bear it, then the choice was between the Netherlands, probably Brussels, Malines, or Antwerp, perhaps Louvain, or Burgundy, in particular Besançon. Towards the end of his life he clung to the illusion, which he had been cherishing for a long time, that Burgundy wine alone was good for him and kept his malady in check. There is something pathetic in the proportions which this wine question gradually assumes. That it is so dear at Basel might be overlooked, but the thievish wagoners drink up or spoil what is imported. In August he doubted greatly whether he will return to Freiburg. In October he sold his house and part of his furniture, and had the rest transported to Basel. After the summer he hardly left his room, and was mostly bedridden. Though the formidable worker in him still yearned for more years and time to labor, his soul was ready for death. Happy he had never felt. Only during the last years he utters his longing for the end. He was still, curiously enough, subject to the delusion of being in the thick of the struggle. In this arena I shall have to fall, he writes in 1533. Only this consoles me, that near at hand already the general haven comes in sight, which, if Christ be favorable, will bring the end of all labor and trouble. Two years later his voice sounds more urgent. That the Lord might deign to call me out of this raving world to his rest. Most of his old friends were gone. Warham and Mountjoy had passed away before Moore and Fisher. Peter Gillis, so many years younger than he, had departed in 1533. Also, Pirkheimer had been dead for years. Beatus Renanus shows him to us during the last months of his life, re-perusing his friend's letters of the last few years, and repeating, This one, too, is dead. As he grew more solitary, his suspiciousness and his feeling of being persecuted became stronger. My friends decrease, my enemies increase, he writes in 1532, when Warham had died and Aleander has risen still higher. In the autumn of 1535 he thinks that all his former servant pupils betray him, even the best beloved ones, like Quirin Telesius and Charles Utenhof. They do not write to him, he complains. In October 1534, Pope Clement VII was succeeded by Paul III, who at once zealously took up the council question. The meeting of a council was, in the eyes of many, the only means by which union could be restored to the Church, and now a chance of realizing this seemed nigh. At once the most learned theologians were invited to help in preparing the great work. Erasmus did not omit, in January 1535, to address to the new Pope a letter of congratulation, in which he professed his willingness to cooperate in bringing about the pacification of the Church, and warned the Pope to steer a cautious middle course. On 31st May followed a reply full of kindliness and acknowledgment. The Pope exhorted Erasmus, that you too, graced by God with so much laudable talent and learning, may help us in this pious work, which is so agreeable to your mind, to defend with us the Catholic religion, by the spoken and the written word, before and during the Council. And in this manner, by this last work of piety, as by the best act to close a life of religion and so many writings, to refute your accusers and rouse your admirers to fresh efforts. End quote. Would Erasmus, in years of greater strength, have seen his way to cooperate actively in the Council of the Great? Undoubtedly, the Pope's exhortation correctly represented his inclination. 
but once faced by the necessity of hard, clear resolutions, what would he have effected? Would the spirit of peace and toleration, of reserve and compromise, have brought alleviation and warded off the coming struggle? He was spared the experiment. He knew himself too weak to be able to think of strenuous church political propaganda any more. Soon there came proofs that the kindly feelings at Rome were sincere. There had been some question also of numbering Erasmus among the cardinals who were to be nominated with a view to the council. A considerable benefice connected with the Church of Deventer was already offered him. But Erasmus urged the Roman friends who were thus active in his behalf to seize their kind offices. He would accept nothing. He, a man who lived from day to day in expectation of death and often hoping for it, who could hardly ever leave his room, would people instigate him to a hunt for deaneries and cardinal's hats? He had subsistence enough to last him. He wanted to die independent. Yet his pen did not rest. The Ecclesiastes had been printed and published, and Origenes was still to follow. Instead of the important and brilliant task to which Rome called him, he devoted his last strength to a simple deed of friendly cordiality. The friend to whose share the honor fell to receive from the old death-sick author a last composition prepared expressly for him amidst the most terrible pains, was the most modest of the number who had not lost their faith in him. No prelate or prince, no great wit or admired divine, but Christopher Eschenfelde, customs officer at Bopart on the Rhine. On his passage in 1518, Erasmus had, with glad surprise, found him to be a reader of his work and a man of culture. That friendship had been a lasting one. Eschenfelde had asked Erasmus to dedicate the interpretation of some psalm to him, a form of composition often preferred by Erasmus of late. About the close of 1535, he remembered that request. He had forgotten whether Eschenfelder had indicated a particular psalm and chose one at haphazard, Psalm 14, calling the treatise on the purity of the Christian Church. He expressly dedicated it to the publican in January 1536. It is not remarkable among his writings as to contents and form, but it was to be his last. On 12th February 1536, Erasmus made his final preparations. In 1527 he had already made a will with detailed clauses for the printing of his complete works by Froben. In 1534 he drew up an accurate inventory of his belongings. He sold his library to the Polish nobleman Johannes Alasko. The arrangements of 1536 testify to two things which had played an important part in his life, his relations with the house of Froben and his need of friendship. Boniface Amabach is his heir, Hieronymus Froben and Nicholas Episcopius, the managers of the business, are his executors. To each of the good friends left to him he bequeathed one of the trinkets which spoke of his fame with princes and the great ones of the earth in the first place to Louis Bear and Beatus Renanus. The poor and the sick were not forgotten, and he remembered especially girls about to marry and youths of promise. The details of this charity he left to Amerbach. In March 1536 he still thinks of leaving for Burgundy. Money matters occupy him, and he speaks of the necessity of making new friends for the old ones leave him, the Bishop of Krakow, Zasius at Freiburg. According to Beatus Renanus, the Brabant plan stood foremost at the end of Erasmus's life. The regent, Mary of Hungary, did not cease to urge him to return to the Netherlands. Erasmus's own last utterance leaves us in doubt whether he had made up his mind. Quote, Though I am living here with the most sincere friends, such as I did not possess at Freiburg, I should yet, on account of the differences of doctrine, prefer to end my life elsewhere, 
if only Brabant were nearer, end quote. This he writes on 28th June, 1536. He had felt so poorly for some days that he had not even been able to read. In the letter we again trace the delusion that Aleander persecutes him, sets on opponents against him, and even lays snares for his friends. Did his mind at last give way too? On 12th July the end came. The friends around his couch heard him groan incessantly, O Jesu misericordia, Domine libera me, Domine miserere me, and at last in Dutch, Liebe Gott. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Erasmus and the Age of Reformation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Erasmus and the Age of Reformation by Johann Huizinga. Translated by Frederick Jan Hopman. Chapter 21. Conclusion. Looking back on the life of Erasmus, the question still arises, why has he remained so great? For ostensibly his endeavors ended in failure. He withdraws in alarm from the tremendous struggle which he rightly calls a tragedy. The sixteenth century, bold and vehement, thunders past him, disdaining his ideal of moderation and tolerance. Latin literary erudition, which to him was the epitome of all true culture, has gone out as such. Erasmus, so far as regards the greater part of his writings, is among the great ones who are no longer read. He has become a name. But why does that name still sound so clear and articulate? Why does he keep regarding us, as if he still knew a little more than he has ever been willing to utter? What has he been to his age, and what was he to be for later generations? Has he been rightly called the precursor of the modern spirit? Regarded as a child of the sixteenth century, he does seem to differ from the general tenor of his times. Among those vehemently passionate, drastically energetic, and violent natures of the great ones of his day, Erasmus stands as the man of too few prejudices, with a little too much delicacy of taste, with a deficiency, though not indeed in every department, of that stultitia which he had praised as a necessary constituent of life. Erasmus is the man who is too sensible and moderate for the heroic. What a surprising difference there is between the accent of Erasmus and that of Luther, Calvin, and St. Teresa. What a difference also between his accent, that is, the accent of humanism, and that of Albrecht Dürer, of Michelangelo, or of Shakespeare. Erasmus seems at times the man who was not strong enough for his age. In that robust sixteenth century it seems as if the oaken strength of Luther was necessary, the steely edge of Calvin, the white heat of Loyola, not the velvet softness of Erasmus. Not only were their force and their fervor necessary, but also their depth, their unsparing, undaunted consistency, sincerity, and outspokenness. They cannot bear that smile which makes Luther speak of the guileful being looking out of Erasmus's features. His piety is too even for them, too limp. Loyola has testified that the reading of the Encridian Miletus Christiani relaxed his fervor and made his devotion grow cold. He saw that warrior of Christ differently, and the glowing colors of the Spanish Christian, medieval ideal of chivalry. Erasmus had never passed through those depths of self-reprobation and that consciousness of sin which Luther had transversed with toil. He saw no devil to fight with, and tears were not familiar to him. Was he altogether unaware of the deepest mystery, or did it rest in him 
too deep for utterance. Let us not suppose too quickly that we are more nearly allied to Luther or to Loyola because their figures appeal to us more. If at present our admiration goes out again to the ardently pious and to spiritual extremes, it is partly because our unstable time requires strong stimuli. To appreciate Erasmus, we should begin by giving up our admiration of the extravagant, and for many this requires a certain effort at present. It is extremely easy to break the staff over Erasmus. His faults lie on the surface, and though he wished to hide many things, he never hid his weaknesses. He was much too concerned about what people thought, and he could not hold his tongue. His mind was too rich and facile, always suggesting a superfluity of arguments, cases, examples, and quotations. He could never let things slide. All his life, he grudged himself leisure to rest and collect himself, to see how unimportant, after all, was the commotion round about him, if only he went his own way courageously. Rest and independence he desired more ardently of all things. There was no more restless and dependent creature. Judge him as one of the too delicate constitution who ventures out in a storm. His willpower was great enough, he worked night and day amidst the most violent bodily suffering with a great ideal steadfastly before him, never satisfied with its own achievements. He was not self-sufficient. As an intellectual type, Erasmus was one of a rather small group, the absolute idealists who, at the same time, are thoroughly moderate. They cannot bear the world's imperfections, they feel constrained to oppose. But extremes are uncongenial to them. They shrink back from action because they know it pulls down as much as it erects, and so they withdraw themselves and keep calling that everything should be different. But when the crisis comes, they reluctantly side with tradition and conservatism. Here, too, is a fragment of Erasmus's life tragedy. He was the man who saw the new and coming things more clearly than anyone else, who must needs quarrel with the old, and yet could not accept the new. He tried to remain in the fold of the old church, after having damaged it seriously, and renounced the Reformation, and to a certain extent even humanism, after having furthered both with all his strength. Our final opinion about Erasmus has been concerned with negative qualities so far. What was his positive importance? Two facts make it difficult for the modern mind to understand Erasmus's positive importance. First, that his influence was extensive rather than intensive, and therefore less historically discernible at definite points. And second, that his influence has ceased. He has done his work and will speak to the world no more. Like St. Jerome, his revered model, and Voltaire, with whom he has been occasionally compared, he has his reward. But like them, he has been the enlightener of an age from whom a broad stream of culture emanated. As historic investigation of the French Revolution is becoming more and more aware that the true history of France during that period should be looked for in those groups which, as Centre or Marius, seem for a long time but a drove of supernumeraries, and understands that it should occasionally protect its eyes a little from the lightning flashes of the Gironde and mountain thunderstorm. So the history of the Reformation period should pay attention, and it has done so for a long time to the broad central sphere permeated by the Rasmian spirit. One of his opponents said, quote, Luther has drawn a large part of the church to himself, Zwingli and Oecolampadius also some part, but Erasmus the largest. End quote. Erasmus's public was numerous and of high culture. He was the only one of the humanists who really wrote for all the world, that is to say, for all educated people. 
he accustomed a whole world to another and more fluent mode of expression he shifted the interest he influenced by his perfect clarity of exposition even through the medium of latin the style of the vernacular languages apart from the numberless translations of his works for his contemporaries erasmus put on many new stops one might say of the great organ of human expression as rousseau was to do two centuries later he might well think with some complacency of the influence he had exerted on the world Quote, from all parts of the world he writes towards the close of his life i am daily thanked by many because they have been kindled by my works whatever may be their merit into a zeal for a good disposition and sacred literature and they who have never seen erasmus yet know and love him from his books End quote. he was glad that his translations from the greek had become superfluous he had everywhere led many to take up greek and holy scriptures quote, which otherwise they would have never read End quote. he had been an introducer and an initiator he might leave the stage after having said his say his word signified something beyond a classical sense and biblical disposition it was at the same time the first enunciation of the creed of education and perfectibility of warm social feeling and of faith in human nature of peaceful kindness and toleration Quote, christ dwells everywhere piety is practiced under every garment if only a kindly disposition is not wanting End quote. in all these ideas and convictions erasmus really heralds a later age in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries those thoughts remained an undercurrent in the eighteenth erasmus's message of deliverance bore fruit in this respect he has most certainly been a precursor and a preparer of the modern mind of rousseau herder pestalozzi and of the english and american thinkers it is only part of the modern mind which is represented by all this to a number of its developments erasmus was wholly a stranger to the evolution of natural science of the newer philosophy of political economy but in so far as people still believe in the ideal that moral education and general tolerance may make humanity happier humanity owes much to erasmus this does not imply that erasmus's mind did not directly and fruitfully influence his own times although catholics regarded him in the heat of the struggle as the corrupter of the church and protestants as the betrayer of the gospel yet his word of moderation and kindliness did not pass by unheard or unheeded on either side eventually neither camp finally rejected erasmus rome did not brand him as an archeretic but only warned the faithful to read him with caution protestant history has been studious to reckon him as one of the reformers both obeyed in this the pronouncement of a public opinion which was above parties and which continued to admire and revere erasmus to the reconstruction of the catholic church and the erection of the evangelical churches not only the names of luther and loyola are linked the moderate the intellectual the conciliating have also had their share of the work figures like melanchthon here satellite there both nearly allied to erasmus and sympathetically disposed towards him the frequently repeated attempts to arrive at some compromise in the great religious conflict though they might be doomed to end in failure emanated from the erasmian spirit nowhere did that spirit take root so easily as in the country that gave erasmus birth a curious detail shows us that it was not the exclusive privilege of either great party of his two most favored pupils of later years both netherlanders whom as the actors of the colloquy astragalismus the game of knucklebones he has immortalized together the one quirintelius died for his attachment to the spanish cause and the catholic faith he was hanged in fifteen seventy two by the citizens of harlem where he was the burgomaster the other charles udenhove was sedulous on the side of the revolt and the reformed religion 
at ghent in concert with the prince of orange he turned against the narrow-minded protestant terrorism of the zealots a dutch historian recently tried to trace back the opposition of the dutch against the king of spain to the influence of erasmus's political thought in his arraignment of bad princes wrongly i think erasmus's political diatribes were far too academic and too general for that the desire of resistance and revolt arose from quite other causes the gear were not erasmus's progeny but there is much that is erasmian in the spirit of their great leader william of orange whose vision ranged so widely beyond the limitations of religious hatred thoroughly permeated by the erasmian spirit too was that class of municipal magistrates who were soon to take the lead and to set the fashion in the established republic history is wont as always with an aristocracy to take their faults very seriously after all perhaps no other aristocracy unless it be that of venice had ruled a state so long so well and with so little violence if in the seventeenth century the institutions of holland in the eyes of foreigners were the admired models of prosperity charity and social discipline and patterns of gentleness and wisdom however defective they may seem to us then the honor of all this is due to the municipal aristocracy if in the dutch patriciate of that time those aspirations lived and were translated into action it was erasmus's spirit of social responsibility which inspired them the history of holland is far less bloody and cruel than that of any of the surrounding countries not for naught did erasmus praise as truly dutch those qualities which we may also call truly erasmian gentleness kindness moderation a generally diffused moderate erudition not romantic virtues if you like but are they less salutary one more instance in the republic of the seven provinces the atrocious executions of witches and wizards ceased more than a century before they did in all 